I'm inspired by this global room that has many sectors represented, researchers, practitioners, policymakers, funders, pediatricians, and students. We may all see these panels and discussions through our own lens, but we are all united in our common denominator that a bright future is ahead for all our kids. So with this backdrop in mind, it is my pleasure to introduce pioneering neuroscientist Mark Tessier Levine. Mark became the first president of Stanford University in 2017, but he was no stranger to the farm, as we call it here. Mark was previously a professor in biological sciences at Stanford. When he was here, he held the Susan B. Ford Professorship in Humanities and Sciences. He returned to us here at the farm after serving as president of the Rockefeller University, which is a graduate biomedical research university in New York City. Please join me in welcoming Stanford's 11th president, Mark Tessier Levine. Great, well thank you so much Lisa and good morning to all of you. I'm really delighted that you could all join us today. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Stanford and to the Stanford Accelerator for Learning Summit with the Edan Prize Foundation, our partners in this endeavor. This summit um, was designed to bring together thought leaders in education from around the world for forward-looking conversations about the latest scholarship and developments in learning. Learning, as we all know, is one of the most important levers for improving the human condition. Education holds the potential to make individual lives more fulfilling and entire communities healthier and more productive. So investing time and resources to advance the science of learning can have ramifications across society and around the globe. We just started the new academic year uh, at Stanford here two days ago um, on Monday. And one of the messages I always share with Stanford students at the start of the year is that one of the most, perhaps the most important thing they will learn during their time here is how to learn, how to adapt, and how to prepare for lives in a world that is changing rapidly and where they will need to continually take in new information. Learning how to learn is a skill that we all need throughout the course of our lives, and never more so than today when technology and knowledge advance at the speed of light. We're on the cusp of discoveries that have the potential to improve how we design and organize educational opportunities across a person's lifespan, but the science and design of learning must continue to evolve to match the needs of learners at all stages, and especially those who are most vulnerable to falling through the cracks. The pandemic, as we all know, laid bare inequities in quality and access at the heart of educational systems around the world, and it underlined the importance of the work underway to make education more accessible, more equitable, and more effective. This work um, requires true partnership among many organizations, from K-12 public schools, to philanthropic organizations, policy leaders, educational startups, community colleges, and yes, universities. To be effective, it must be a cross-sector discussion because true change will require the contribution of all these stakeholders. It also requires work across diverse fields. At Stanford, the Graduate School of Education is taking a distinct interdisciplinary approach as it works to combine the science of learning with data and technology. Indeed, the school has engaged the entire university um, in this project from neuroscientists who are unlocking the mysteries of how we learn, to technologists working to bring innovation to scale, to social scientists focusing on optimizing systems and policy, to pediatricians with expertise in childhood development. This interdisciplinary approach can lead to transformative new solutions, and that's where Stanford's Accelerator for Learning comes in. The Stanford Accelerator for Learning is designed to be a student-centered effort that leverages the science and design of learning to develop solutions for the challenges facing learners today. Through the Accelerator, our researchers are working with partners to understand the needs of learners and meet students where they are. The potential for solutions, as we all know, is enormous. I see this in my own field of neuroscience, where researchers are uncovering new knowledge of the brain, 
leading to new tools and interventions that improve teaching, understanding, and the acquisition of skills and knowledge. Researchers are also exploring questions like how humans learn to read, how AI uh, and new forms of data are opening new fields of discovery, and many others. I'm really proud of the work that the Graduate School of Education is um, leading to bring ingenuity, talent, and collaboration to such an important part of human life. We have found a wonderful partner in this work in Charles Chen Yidan and the Yidan Prize Foundation, which is co-organizing today's conference. Charles is a remarkable businessman and philanthropist who has dedicated himself to improving learning and education around the world. He is shining a bright light on the importance of education as a force for good and on what can be done to reduce barriers to learning. The Yidan Prize Foundation not only honors innovate, innovators in education for their important contributions, but is also calling attention to progress being made in improving educational systems and practices. And the foundation's approach aligns with the optimism that we feel here at Stanford. While there are still great challenges before us, we all know there are also great ideas out there, and we have great hope that innovations in education can help more individuals and more communities thrive around the world. So thank you, Charles, and my thanks to the entire team at the Yidan Prize Foundation who have worked with us on today's summit. Now, before I close, I also want to thank the Hoover Institution for this space, uh, this beautiful space, uh, for this conference. Uh, the institution is also doing important work in education, and we have a number of Hoover scholars here as part of our agenda today. Uh, in fact, I want to thank all of today's presenters from across many different fields. Um, I really appreciate all of you being here today, and the summit will present some truly exciting work and some wonderful opportunities for knowledge sharing. So thank you all once again for being here today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dan Schwartz. Dan is Dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Education and Professor of Educational Technology. He's been a member of the GSE faculty since 2000 and studies student understanding and representation. He's a leading expert in the ways that technology can facilitate learning, and he was among the first scholars to take findings from neuroscience research and use them uh, to change classroom practices. His scholarly work is extensively cited, and his focus on creating meaningful learning experiences is grounded in practice from his career as a teacher. Dan is also a key member of uh, the university leadership of my executive team. He's been instrumental in our efforts to advance the Graduate School of Education, uh, Stanford's long-range vision for the university as a whole, uh, and indeed the university as a whole. And he's led the effort to bring together disciplines across campus in new and innovative ways and is driving our broad efforts at Stanford to develop new models of learning. So please join me in welcoming Dan Schwartz. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so Mark just gave my talk, except, except I'm gonna take about 20 minutes. Uh, so it'd take a while. But thank you very much. Really appreciate you being here. Appreciate all of you coming, traveling. You're what are going to make this a great event. So thank you. So uh, for this crowd, it seems silly, but I thought I'd briefly remind you why learning is so important. Uh, first, I want you to take a look at this image. It shows the sheer joy of learning and teaching. You can see the kids are very eager to participate. And of course, learning is one of the single most important levers available for improving the human condition. Uh, it's correlated with nearly every positive outcome you might care for. It is an investment by society for society. So I was given the task of talking about a theory of change. There are many interpretations of theory of change. And for that matter, there are many interpretations of the word theory and many interpretations of the word change. So I decided to talk about the conditions of change instead. And so I believe they are in place for transforming learning. Uh, and then after I do that, I will describe a theory for the acceleration of positive impact from research so it can improve learning. And I'll briefly describe how Stanford is instantiating this theory. So as a starting case study, we can consider a profound change that occurred over 150 years, the scientific revolution. 
So the revolution started with Ptolemy, who described a perfectly organized heaven rotating around an imperfect Earth. Then came Copernicus, who also argued for a perfectly organized heaven, the theory of perfect geometric solids, except in his case, the sun was at the center. From there, Kepler proposed that the planetary orbits were not perfect geometric shapes, but rather they followed an elliptical path defined by the sweep law. And then finally, Newton described the causal mechanisms that regulated both the heavens and the Earth. So what were the conditions that enabled this revolution? While there were many, one key was data. So this is an image of Tycho Brahe's meticulous recording of the positions of the stars and the planets. Brahe does not get the headlines he deserves. He recorded the data that enabled Kepler to create a fundamentally new theory. A second advancement was the creation of new technologies. This is an image of an uh, early telescope, which advanced our abilities to see the heavens. And of course, there were many other new technologies during this period, like the steam turbine blood transfusion and the pendulum clock. This image shows the trial of Galileo, a very famous moment where a scientific explanation of the world based on empirical evidence was set against a religious one based on the Bible. And then finally, ships navigated by the stars. And with the expansion of sailing around the world, there was a strong need to improve navigation. So what does the scientific revolution of the 1600s have to do with why we are here today? These same conditions for change are appearing in education, improved data, new technologies, the rise of evidence-based decisions, and new practical needs. And so now I'm going to share a few of my favorite examples. So the first is data. It's finally flowing in education. It's always been very sparse, and it's been very hard to tell if you're actually improving things without data. Now it supports continual improvement, and they can, it can reveal what even the trained eye cannot see. So the distracting moving circles you see, these are half a million students around the world solving the same computer problem, the programming problem. Each node is a different line of code that students might write. And you can see clusters of students moving between lines of code. When they reach the green circle, they've solved the problem. With this precision data, at this scale, we can figure out why some students get stuck and when to help or not. And this is occurring across the board. A second game changer is technology. Technology offers the prospect of universal access to A plus learning experiences, and it creates fundamentally new ways of teaching. This is an image of a computer simulation. It's part of the freely available FET Library of Science Simulations spearheaded by Yi Dan Laureate Carl Lyman, who unfortunately can't join us today. Learning through digital simulations barely existed 20 years ago. It's something that's fundamentally new. If used well, students learn science through inquiry. Also, it is a treasure trove of data about seeing how students learn and listen. FET simulations have gone to scale with roughly 250 million simulation runs a year. For many schools teaching science during COVID, FET was a gift. I understand, in particular, that Columbia was one of the hugest adopters, the nation of Columbia. So I want to spend some time on this one, the rise of empiricism in education. It's very important. Currently, education is dominated by homemade remedies and historical accidents handed down from generation to generation. I've been dean for a while now, and I can just hear the common refrain. I was taught that way, and I turned out OK. Uh, I never say it, but there's a lot of people for whom it did not work so well. And if I dare say, you, you might have turned out even better. But I don't say that. So the new, the new empiricism emphasizes the mechanisms of learning, which make it possible to address problems that were previously tolerated because it is the way we always did it. And so I chose one of my favorite examples because it involves sleep. In the United States, school days start very early for young adolescents, middle school, junior high, 12-year-olds. This was largely driven by the need to optimize bus schedules so the buses could be used for elementary and high school students going to different schools later on. It was very hard to, wait to break away from this historical accident, even though there were many complaints by parents and students. Ultimately, Stanford faculty, including Rafael Paleo, demonstrated that adolescents were not sleeping enough. At the same time, the neuroscience was revealing the, the utter significance of sleep for learning. 
Sleep is when we consolidate memories so that the learning sticks. And so learning is a 24-hour affair. And the adolescents were not getting enough sleep. The evidence finally drove change. Starting this year in California, schools are starting later for adolescents. Finally, navigation needs. No, we don't. This is not a driving force for education. But there is an analog for better navigation in the 1600s. It's the need for new kinds of learning. So uh, let me grab this prop. Uh, if you can see what I'm holding, I don't know how many of you recognize what this is. Very good. Pull it out. Uh, so this is, it's a slide rule. Uh, my students used to say they vaguely remember their parents had one. Now they, think, they say they think their grandparents have one. So that hurts. So the slide rule was invented during the scientific revolution based on the development of logarithms. Uh, I spent many weeks in school learning how to use it. It is an amazing tool, but my hard-earned knowledge is completely obsolete unless there's a shortage of silicon. This change in what the educated student needs to know took about 400 years past the 1600s. The rate of change is accelerating. Alexa, which could understand a limited set of words and requests, was launched about eight years ago. Now, Stanford student Mina Lee helped to develop co-author. So the black text was written by a person, and the green text was written by the computer. I'll do it a little slowly here so translators can keep up. So this is written by a person. Now, this green part was written by the computer. Person. Computer. Given, given a moving target of skills and ability, mastery is not the right paradigm anymore. We simply cannot predict what people will need to know except for narrow, repetitive situations. We need to emphasize preparing people to continually learn as times and knowledge changes. So here, this blue circle comes from a local school district describing what their graduates will learn and know when they graduate. Notice how the school is focusing on things that prepare people to learn, collaborate, and participate in society. There is no mention of math or science or even reading achievement. Mastery, which once dominated our theorizing, is dead. The need for a scientific revolution is upon us. So a key question is how can universities accelerate the societal benefits of learning research? Universities were not the seed of the scientific revolution. They were largely protecting the previous dogma. So how do we use universities and their phenomenal capacity for research and convening to accelerate change? As Mark pointed out, Stanford is already designed to support interdisciplinary work, for example, across neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and education. But how do we ensure that the good work gets into practice? After the development of germ theory, it took about 50 years before universities taught doctors to wash their hands. Our proposal is to build in three features from the start. These are a learner-centered approach, the combination of science and design, and partnerships with stakeholders. So a learner-centered approach begins with uh, the needs and experiences of identifiable groups of learners. Rather than one size fits all, new sources of evidence are enabling instruction tuned to the needs of learners. Here's a great example. Professor Naila Nasir partnered with a school teacher to create a high school course called African American Male Sexuality. Only boys took the course. It was very targeted. Afterwards, Professor Tom D. evaluated the impact of the course and found that it increased the boys, grade, the boys' grades in their other classes, and it reduced dropout. This strong learner-centered approach is quite different from a more common curriculum-centered approach, which might instead start with the question of, should we include AI or climate change in the curriculum? So a learner-centered approach starts with the needs of the learner and their particular circumstances. Second is science and design. The model of bench to bedside, where there is a Pipeline from basic research to applied outcomes has not succeeded very well in education. An alternative approach is to infuse efforts with both science and design from the start. So educational products often have very appealing designs. For instance, take a look at this screenshot. Uh, it has a nice color. 
It draws on popular culture. It also uses an appealing play pattern and a strong reward system. But it is disappointing. So I, I want you to think, what is the interpretation of four fish times two fish? If it were four fish plus two fish, I think I could understand it. But four fish times two fish? Do the four fish breed with two fish and make eight fish? Right? So this design inadvertently teaches children to ignore the meaning of mathematics. Design is better when it includes knowledge from science. And of course, science also needs design to be usable. If there were time, I would share some unhappy examples of science being applied without design. We need these two forms of expertise to work together from the outset of a project, and we hope to accelerate impact. So here's a nice example where science and design come together. This is from Professor Susanna Loeb. She bridged research on early reading, behavior change, and behavioral economics with the design expertise that could build applications that are easy to use, easy to adopt, and easy to appreciate. The result was a texting program that delivered tips to parents for helping their preschool children become school ready for reading. The parents liked it, the children liked it, and subsequent research showed it helped. At this time, it's been used by nearly one million families with expansions into other domains besides early reading. We've seen this combination of science and design work many, many times. The third feature is partnerships. Partnerships bring important strengths that keep the work of the university relevant. Partners bring lived expertise to help identify needs and opportunities. Partner sites, such as schools and the pediatric clinic, provide the needed context for design work. You don't design in the abstract. And partners offer a test bed for evaluating the impact of a potential solution. As a school, we've had great success with school research practice partnerships. Uh, not only have they advanced the science, the partnerships have had a tremendous success rate in producing scalable products and policies. It is a rate of success at an overall price that I imagine venture capitalists would find compelling. So Stanford has taken a uh, specific approach to creating conditions at the university for accelerating change. First, we're organized around specific classes of learners. Each of these were chosen because there's both a manifest need and there's a belief that we can make rapid progress. You will hear about two of them today. Second, we provide expertise where faculty may not have it. While the combination of science and design can accelerate the development of useful solutions, there are very few faculty who have expertise in both. We provide support where it can round out a team, whether in the science, the design, the data, or the partnerships. Third, we create partnerships that inform and enable research. As mentioned, we've been very successful partnering with school districts using a very specific model of partnership. We need to expand this portfolio of partnerships, for example, to include industries, nations, NGOs. I do invite people's suggestions for the best way to do this. This is new terrain for us. And this leads to the fourth component, which is to build in pathways for scaling. So pathways are going to differ depending on the nature of the discoveries and innovations. For instance, the implication of sleep's role in learning took a policy pathway, whereas the texting intervention, uh, in, intervention took a pathway through partnerships with local schools. Developing a theory of different scaling pathway needs to be an important focus of the effort. We need a theory of change that works. So Stanford and the Edan Foundation share a commitment to both research and practice. We believe that research can improve educational ex outcomes. Over the course of today, you're going to hear many phenomenal examples, and we're going to conclude with the announcement of the 2022 winners of the Yidan Prize. I'm very pleased the Yidan Foundation and the Graduate School of Edu Education are able to partner together. It's a very good, very good match. So I want to end by reminding you that we're in an inflection point in what a research university can do to improve all lives through learning and not just its own undergraduates. COVID has heightened attention and experimentation Game changers like data and technology and science are already making inroads in previously intractable problems. Global pressures are growing to improve learning, whether in poor countries will be the home to the majority of children by 2050, or for millions of people displaced by technology, natural disaster, or political upheaval. Stanford has prioritized learning as part of its long-range vision for producing benefits for humanity. There is no near equivalent at any other university. It reflects Stanford's optimism. It's rigorous, daring, and relevant, and I hope you are willing to join us. Thank you.
So that, so that was a lot. Uh, there will be a, a test of whether you've mastered the content afterwards. Uh, so now it is my great pleasure to introduce Charles Chen Yidan. Charles and the entire team at the Yidan Prize Foundation have been fantastic partners throughout this effort to convene us here today to learn, discuss, and make connections. I believe in China right now, it is morning and is the start of Confucius Day. And this is appropriate to my introduction of Charles because it is a day of celebrating teachers. So Charles is incredibly committed to education. He says his most important inspiration was his grandmother, who was illiterate. With great fortitude, she lived through war, famine, and poverty, and raised Charles' father to become the very first college graduate in his village. Charles recalls how her love and firm belief in the value of education encouraged him to pave the way for his own educational career and subsequent entre entrepreneurial success. And more, more recently, he has become an excellent author. I commend both of these to you. Charles earned a bachelor's degree in applied chemistry at Shenzhen University. He went on to obtain a master's degree in economic law at Nanjing University. And then he became one of the core founders of China's internet pioneer, Tencent, along with his high school friends. Charles launched the Yidan Prize in 2016 with a mission to create a better world through education. We are honored to share his grand vision. And I want to thank Charles, and I want to thank him for being here today. So Charles, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much, Dan. Dear President Mark Tessia Levini, Dean Daniel Schwartz, distinguished guests, partners, and friends, online and in person, welcome. We are delighted to be here today. This is the first time the Edan Price Foundation is partnering with Stanford University. Our goal is big and bold, to shine a light on important issues in education. In 2014, I was honored to be at Stanford as a visiting scholar. This time, I'm returning as a humble learner to explore how we can energize the potential of all learners. Big ideas inspire change. We see that very clearly in the work of our laureates. I'd like to share four of the key learnings we take from them. First, inclusive education is a must. From early childhood to adulthood in every country in the world, all learners must access quality education because education is the key to sustainable development. The UN estimates the global population will soon exceed 8 billion. More than half of that population growth by 2050 will come from countries of Saharan Africa. This poses immense challenges to the region. Our 2021 laureate, Professor Elu, uh, Eric Henrichek, is set to launch an African fellowship program, training young researchers to carry out robust research that can inform education policies in Africa. These local researchers will drive systemic change in education, unlocking the path to sustainable development and the potential of learners across region. Second, we must recognize education begins 
from birth. Research shows that 90% of brain development takes place in the first 1,000 days of children's lives, well before they start school. When we make early learning joyful, we set students up for lifelong learning. We see this in the work of Black, funded by our 2019 laureate, Sir Fasale Hansha Abad. Black brings quality, play-based learning to communities in low-resource settings, helping marginalized children reach their potential. Sir Fasley will always be fondly remembered. And his philanthropic and educational legacy will live on. Third, for children in school, we need to make sure no one is left behind. Our laureate put learners at the heart of education and meet them where they are. Our 2021 laureate, Dr. Luca Mini Banerjee, and her team, and Platham introduced the Teaching at the Right Level program. It helps teachers assess and group children by learning levels instead of grade or age. They are helping children flourishing at school by progressing through their learning at their own pace. Finally, as we gather today, we recognize that collaboration sparkles unlimited possibilities. Stanford University has long supported tech startups and innovators, creating the Silicon Valley we see today, supporting innovation that can power change. We believe this is also true in education. Eden Prize laureates achieve impactful results in their respective fields of education. We play our part in this too. The Eden Prize Foundation works with our global education community to help scale innovations that work and bring transformative changes in education. Equally important is working together. Over the past three years, the COVID-19 pandemic has presented many challenges. We applaud everyone who forgives, for forges ahead against all odds to promote education, making connections within schools, with communities, and between different groups and regions. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you can celebrate with us this evening the chairman of our independent judging committee, Dr. Mashura, will announce our 2022 Eden Prize laureates at the close of the conference and summit. We look forward to seeing the synergy of education research and development sparking real scalable change in education. Today, we have guests from all over the world, Bangladesh, India, Japan, China, Colombia, United States, Zimbabwe, Ghana, France, United Kingdom, and more. We hope everyone will actively take part in the discussions as we inject new energy into all aspects of education. Thank you.
Charles, we are so thrilled that you are able to be with us today. Your vision and leadership of the Yidan Prize has inspired and elevated educational research and innovations globally. We are so fortunate to be able to link arms and move this work together forward, which we know will benefit very greatly from this collaboration. President Tessier Levine, Dean Schwartz, and Dr. Charles Chen Yidan, thank you all for your commitment to improving the lives through learning. And it is now my great pleasure to be able to introduce the moderator of our first session, Liz Willen. A longtime educational journalist, Liz led the award-winning Hetchinger Report as editor since 2011, which has long covered inequality and innovation in education. Given how highly sought after Liz is as a moderator of educational conferences and events, I can't imagine a better way for us to dive into our first session and conversation on inclusive education. The panel ahead, whose bios are all in your information and packets, so I encourage you to check those out, will explore what accounts for differences in learning both within and between countries, as well as pathways to improve learning for marginalized students. Please join me in welcoming our first panel. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it is an absolute delight and pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to be in person again and with such distinguished company of researchers and academics. Um, the Heckinger Report, it is pronounced as a nonprofit journalism outlet, and we cover inequality and innovation all over the world, mostly in the United States. And we're mostly, uh, we, we're thinking about a lot of the same questions that you are only in much different ways. We tend to be in camp, on campuses and in classrooms and talking to teachers and people on the ground, but it's a pleasure to be with you all um, and hear more about your research. Four of, uh, five of you are from Stanford, um, so you may not always, ha may have more opportunity to talk about each other's work, um, but we're thrilled to hear it, and especially because um, we're looking at, uh, in a post-pandemic world, how we improve education. On many panels that I'm on, this is totally the focus, and we'd love to hear more about yours. Eric, when you, when you um, came here, you started out by handing out a slide about the global skills gap, and I was hoping that you would talk about that, but I'm gonna ask each of you to quickly um, introduce yourselves. The bios are, in, are long and are elsewhere, and just say a little bit about your work, and then I'd love to start with you. I'm Eric Hanischek. I'm a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University, and I'm an economist who has spent a long time trying to see uh, what makes for better education and what is the impact of having better education. And I'm Angie, Angeline Murimiwa. I'm one of the very first girls Comfort supported through school in Zimbabwe, and I'm now Comfort's executive director for Africa, leading our work of bringing children into the classroom to thrive and lead. And I really look forward to this conversation and hope to bring you to Africa, to the practice, to the covers. Thank you. I'm Carol Dweck. I'm professor of psychology here at Stanford. Um, much of my career has been devoted to studying students' beliefs, the psychology that predicts their trajectory, and the context that maximize uh, their learning trajectory. I'm Jonathan Rosa. I'm an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education. I'm a, a linguistic anthropologist, and my research focuses on how ideas about language and race produce and reproduce forms of vulnerability, and also our sites for the, the production of, of possibility as well. I'm Trisha Bromley. I'm an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education and the Doerr School of Sustainability and I study issues of sustainable development in civil society organizations and education systems and how and why these spread around the world. Great. Um, the one commonality I see, aside from four or five of you being at Stanford, is trying to really dig into some of these deep questions about inequality and how we deal with it. And looking at your um, skills map, um, professor, and seeing, I, I know you, I've heard you speak on many panels over the years, and one of the things that you most talk about is how 
the, the global skills deficit, how immense it is. Two thirds or more of the world's youth never even reach basic skills levels. So I'm curious as how um, you see these variations around the world and between countries, how are we gonna solve it? Now remember, these are very big lofty questions here and we have a very short period of time, so. Well, I, I think I'm going to just reiterate the importance of skills and education. I'm an economist, as mentioned, and one of the things that I have come to believe from research is that the, essentially the only thing that affects long-term economic growth is the skills of the people, period. And you can't, don't have to go beyond that. Um, and so what I did was put together a little map that you can think of as a cheat sheet. I'll tell, tell you what um, it talks about because it, um, we, this is, I'm, I'm can't see it from here, but. <laughs> in, in the accelerator version, I'll hold up my eight and a half by 11 <laughs> inch uh, sheet here um, and talk about quickly the work that I've been doing with Sarah Gust, who flew here from Germany to be at this conference with me, um, and Ludger Wussmann in Germany. What we try to do is estimate what proportion of the world's population is unprepared to participate in a modern society. They, they don't have the basic skills. And we define basic skills in a fairly simplistic way. It's that you can solve a single equation with one unknown at age 15. So that says that you have a price in terms of um, some foreign currency and you have the exchange rate to the dollar and somebody asks you what does that uh, thing that you just bought cost in dollars. That, it's solving that exchange rate problem. As Liz mentioned, uh, the punchline is two-thirds, at least two-thirds of the world's youth cannot reliably solve a problem like that. And in my mind, that means that they're not going to be able to participate in a modern society until that happens. Um, it, it turns out that in over 100 countries of the world, half of the youth cannot solve that problem. Um, sitting here in the U.S., you might note that a quarter of the U.S. 15-year-olds cannot solve that problem either. And so we have these problems around the world. Um, and we know if we look around the world that uh, roughly a third of the population of 15-year-olds is no longer in school. They're not in secondary schooling. Um, so you might think, well, the answer is just making sure everybody gets into school. But it turns out that 60% of the 15-year-olds in the world who are in school cannot solve that exchange rate problem. So you might ask, what have they been doing for their nine years in school if they can't solve that problem? Um, but then we come back to um, a topic that Dan introduced in his introduction, and that is we don't even have data on a lot of these uh, situations around the world. What I've given you is our best estimate, but half of the world's population uh, live in the 35 countries that do not, have never participated in any systematic international testing. Now that's a little bit of a cheat because it, two of them are India and China, and so they are big countries, but there are countries that haven't participated. If, by our estimates, if, um, all of the youth of the world could solve that exchange rate problem or the, the knowledge that's incorporated in that. Um, our estimate is the present value of added uh, income, gross domestic product, GDP, to the world would be $700 trillion, or five times the world GDP today if we could, in fact, get the populations of the world up there. Now, we'll get into it later, but obviously, even trying to get back to where we were in 2018 is very difficult, uh, given the pandemic. And this has particularly hit poor people everywhere, poor countries and poor people in the United States. Um, 
my estimates today, given the amount of learning loss that we can see that's recorded in our data, uh, suggest that any child in school during the pandemic is going to lose six to nine percent of their lifetime earnings. Six to nine percent is what the cost of the pandemic is. And that says, if we got back to where our schools were in 2020, we're not even there yet, uh, but the only way to solve this problem is to make the schools better. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> but in fact, when I was looking at... Um, look, look at your cheat sheet. Um, you'll <laughs> notice that the thing is that this is a little heat map of what proportion of the population uh, can't solve that exchange rate problem. And you'll notice that the global south is the dark place where 90% of the children in South Asia or in sub-Saharan Africa cannot solve that problem by age 15. That's tough. Um, Angela, what I loved about looking at some of your work and some of your research was you, you have a very succinct way of explaining one of your theories of change, and that is when you educate a girl, everything changes. So if you can tell us a little bit about um, the, the roadblocks you see now in helping under-resourced and marginalized experience, uh, marginalized students experience education post-pandemic and, and how that phrase of yours makes a difference. Thanks, thanks so much. Yes, we do believe that um, with education, everything changes. And, and we, I'm not sure we want to go back to the pre-pandemic era, because even then, the system was fraught with a lot of inequality. We still had millions of girls out of school. We need to build forward better. So um, in respect of time, I'm just going to focus on, on our work as an organization, and particularly the experience of the underserved, under-resourced, and therefore the most marginalized children within the education system at the moment. There are two key characteristics that I would want to flight that are very dominant for children that come from the most marginalized context. Number one, they are often excluded from the education system itself. I'm, I'm going to take you to the village, to the child. I'm not going to throw statistics here because I'm from the practitioner side. I'm from the ground. So I'm going to bring the child into this room for all of us, you know, the one that we are gathered for. So they're often excluded from the education system outright and put climate shocks into the mix, put COVID in there, that makes it just worse. They're out of school. They never make it to the school gate. And number two, when they get into the school system, this is something that you started touching on, they are actually excluded within the school system. And exclusion within the school system takes shape of poor participation, so you have a child in class sitting, but they're not hearing, they're not participating because they also bring challenges that they're facing home into the classroom. And half the time you don't even know what they are engaging with before they come to school. And issues around poor attendance, so this could be from flooded rivers, and this is no exaggeration. Rivers that used not to flood on my continent are flooding. All of a sudden, we are experiencing shocks that we've never experienced before, and communities are not prepared to engage with it. So who suffers the most? The most marginalized. So I just want to be able to say the most marginalized, there's a geography to it, there's an economic class to it, there's a social class to it, and at times we know where they are. The thing is exclusion within the school, within the education system, it's very hidden and almost invisible. I, I remember when I was participating in primary school myself, my teacher thought he knew everything that was going on in my life, but I knew what safe answers to provide him because some of the answers were very embarrassing, very private, and very intimate for me to be able to share with my teachers on what's happening. So when you talk about exclusion within the school system, it's talking about how do we ensure that we really know what's going on in a child's life to be able to allow them to participate. I'm not even going to touch on the curriculum that is often irrelevant and Alien. I didn't know how a three-pin plug looked like until I was 18, and I was so disappointed. That thing was so small for the significance it represented in school. But that's, that is the experience of the most marginalized, and there's a lot of fear and anxiety around my education could end at any time, at any point. And you work in some of the biggest classes, largest classes, 120 of you in a class 
with the teacher who is also very tired, underpaid, and exhausted, and is trying to lecture and get you all to follow him. And yes, I might have been out of school for a week or two because I had to attend to an issue that was at home, but the teacher can go back and catch up with me. So there is a lot of exclusion within the education system. To your point, they are in the school register, but are they really learning? Are they there? Let's not even talk about the language of instruction, that I'm not even just trying to understand what the teacher is saying. I'm also busy trying to translate. What does this English word mean? I'm not even just trying to capture maths and the calculations. I'm trying to understand, is friction a science word or an English word, and how does that set? Anyway, I don't want to leave it on all gloom and doom. As an organization, we work with the most marginalized girls. I was one of them. So I can tell you about all my stories, you know. But I just want to be able to say that what we've managed to do as an organization is to bring girls that have made it against all odds back to the schools to help others navigate the realities that are often hidden, that are often invisible, that are often not seen. What the statistics don't tell us about the local practice that excludes children from school, or within school. And I just want to say that as a result of our work in all the schools that we work in, our girls and our boys and the children that we support are three times less likely to drop out of school. And their performance in maths and in English and the enjoyment of school is through the roof. So we can do this. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'd love to hear that you're not all doom and gloom because there's actually quite a lot of hope in the work that Carol Dweck has done around growth mindsets. And I would love it if you would just walk us through a little bit about um, the concept that intelligence is not fixed and what, how that relates to some of these enormous questions yes. we're trying to solve today. Yes, thank you. For decades, my work has addressed the beliefs students have about their ability. In, in particular, whether they think their basic intelligence is something that's just a fixed trait, you have a certain amount, that's it, or is something that can be cultivated over time through effort, but not just effort, learning good strategies, and lots of support, mentoring, help from others. And in the last decade, we've really focused on issues of equity and inclusion. We were really excited to see the results from the 2018 PISA study that OECD released last year. In uh, many, of their 79 cultures or economies. A growth mindset in the students predicted their achievement and important aspects of their well-being. <clears throat> but we were, what we were most excited about was how it decreased the achievement disparities between girls and boys, low-income and higher-income kids, and children from immigrant versus non-immigrant families. And this was on um, kind of a worldwide basis, although we wanted to see more countries from the global south included. <coughs> I've, <coughs> excuse me, I've posted a paper, um, a report from OECD on this panel's website, and it, it was co-sponsored by the Edan Price Foundation. But we also said, can you teach a growth mindset to students at scale, at low cost? Could a two-session workshop given when students entered high school possibly have an impact on their grades at the end of the year, on their learning over time? So we worked for several years to create such a program. And what we found was that given to ninth graders entering high school, we raised the grades of the lower achievers by the end of the year. We increased the likelihood that students across achievement levels um, would take advanced math the next year. And now we've gotten our most exciting results that more students from underrepresented groups are graduating from high school with college-ready portfolios of courses. And 
Much of my EDAN prize money went to this project. I've posted on the website a paper describing the results of this study. But we've also learned the tremendous power of the context that students learn in. And it turned out that when students who took our program went back into classrooms with fixed mindset teachers, they did not benefit. Their new improved growth mindset did not take root and turn into higher grades. Not content with that, um, led by David Yeager, Mary Murphy, we've decided to go into classrooms and help teachers um, learn how to embody growth mindset beliefs and practices in their classroom to create a culture in which all students believe they can learn. We've recently gotten results from our pilot studies with several hundred teachers um, that were very encouraging. First of all, the teachers did adopt more growth mindset beliefs and practices, but the important thing was it reached the students. Many more students were saying their teachers believe that all of them can learn. Their teachers believe um, respected and valued even the struggling students. And students' anxiety in math went down. Finally, these results were strongest for students from underrepresented groups. So we're figuring out now how to scale this uh, program at low, at low cost. I also finally posted on the website a working paper of how uh, teacher practices can create a culture in the classroom. And, and the paper also has a vision for global scaling in the future. This working paper was also uh, sponsored by the EDAN Prize Foundation. So we're very grateful to you and uh, we're on the case. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, you're on a different case. You've been spending a, a great deal of time in Chicago and, and looking at your work. And I would love to hear an example of some of um, your work on Latino students um, where, and what you've been finding in terms of the post-COVID era and the in in inequities. But I think you've also um, come up with some real new thinking about what's at stake right now. And, and how we can think about it going forward. Yeah, in discussions about under-resourced, underserved, and, and marginalized learners, those kinds of framings often position people as though they just emerged into the world as under-resourced, as marginalized, or as underserved. And then the response often is deeply philanthropic. Serve them, resource them, you know, attend to their marginalization, rather than trying to figure out what systems produce marginalization, what systems underserve people, what systems under-resource people. And so much of my work has been focused on redirecting attention away from simply trying to modify the behaviors of the marginalized to really trying to draw attention to the systems that, that produce and reproduce marginalization. So as a linguistic anthropologist in the context of language learning, when I interact with educational administrators and policy advocates, and they encounter a linguist, they say, oh, you know, we really want to, to tap your knowledge about serving our English learners. You know, we're talking about, in the United States, five million kids, about 10% of all students in US schools are designated as English learners. And it's a very reasonable ask of them to, to sort of, uh, you know, for them to, to want strategies for, for how to respond to these students' needs. And however, my initial response is to say, well, as a linguistic anthropologist, it's, it's my duty to inform you that language learning has not been a problem for our species historically. <laughs> and to the extent that it comes to be experienced as a problem, that tells us something very particular about the society in which language learning is taking place and the institutions 
in that society rather than the learner themselves. In fact, we have a situation in the United States where self-identified monolingual policymakers, educators, and administrators understand themselves to be helping to address the purported linguistic deficiencies of multilingual children, families, and communities. That's an upside down reality, and yet it's the reality we face. So in <laughs> Yeah. So in many of my conversations, I kind of say, if you identify as a monolingual English user, we've got to figure out what happened to you. <laughs> you know, I, pro I you know. promised that we'd be asking very big questions, and we need, I feel like we need more time, but... Um, I, did, I did just want to say one sure. thing about COVID to, to respond to it directly. So this reframing in the context of COVID is intended to say we have to be careful about getting back to normal, because that normal produced this crisis in the first place. The United States is 4% of the world's population, 16% of COVID deaths. 4% of the world's yeah. population, 20% plus of the incarcerated population. 4% of the world's population, 28% of the world's energy usage. 4% of the world's population, 30% of carbon emissions. So how is the United States a reference point for development, for modernity, for progress? <laughs> And this attention to systems change is intended to expand our demand, uh, our vision of what education could look like to produce systems that protect collective well-being, that protect social and ecological sustainability, to think about how you redefine teacher education, how you redefine curriculum, how you redefine what count as skills and, and in terms of, of protecting well-being. So that's mm -hmm. the work that I've been up to in Chicago and elsewhere. It's, it's, it's a lot. And I, I've had the privilege of editing a, an op-ed that Patricia recently wrote for the Hackinger Report. So I have a sense of where she's coming from here in terms of what we're learning about how we talk about education policy and reform and what our strategies for scaling effective ideas might look like and how they would have to change. Sure. For those who haven't read it, you can read it on the heckinsreport.org, but can you explain a little bit more about your thinking on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Liz, thank you. Um, and for the opportunity to write the op-ed for you, that was really a wonderful process. So it summarizes some of the comments I'll make here, which I think integrates across many of our points. Where I'm coming from is thinking about the global diffusion of education policies and why this happens. Um, so I've been working with a team of researchers to put together a database of education policies worldwide. We've developed the most comprehensive database available, over 10,000 policy reforms from 183 countries going back to 1970. And we're using this to look at this question of, of why do things spread. So in researching this, we found four reasons education policies spread a couple of which you've heard implicitly in some of the comments today, and I'll, I'll introduce two more. So one implicit um, theme in, in, for example, Jonathan's comments is that a reason some policies exist in education is because they serve the interests of dominant elites. This has been embedded in education systems and reproduces inequalities. That is certainly one feature of education systems, and this power, self-interest, is one reason policies spread. It's not the only story. Another reason policies spread is because of what we might think of as sort of an engineering model or, or even economic model. And this is um, the kind of heart of science. We can do an experiment, we can find out what works, and then we can spread it around the world, maybe through proper design, maybe through market-like practices that help things spread. So Carol's work, there's lots of strong empirical evidence showing that a growth si mindset helps children, and this is part of what has helped it be so successful in spreading to multiple locations. This is another important pillar of education research and education practice, the evidence about what works. Both of these things are happening in education policies. But there are two more things. The other is that in the real world, decision makers operate, for the most part, under great uncertainty. We can never actually gather enough scientific evidence to know what decisions we should make in every setting on every dimension that we need to make a decision about. So as a policymaker, often what happens under conditions of uncertainty is you look around. We do this as individuals as well. Organizations do it, countries do it. I'm not sure how to proceed. What is everybody else doing? So the biggest predictor of why countries adopt policies is often 
how many other countries have already adopted it. There's a kind of snowball effect that happens. Um, so for example, in studying the environment and looking at why countries adopt sustainable development emphases into their curricula, the biggest predictor is whether their neighbors have already done it. It's not anything to do with what their potential risk of experiencing an environmental disaster or actual environmental damage that might have already happened to them. It's just about their neighbors, for the most part. So that's one other kind of social process. The last one is fundamental. I think of it as cultural beliefs. This has also come up in our panel today. Much work that goes on in education is happening because we believe it to be right. So not necessarily a direct reflection of self-interested, powerful people. It's many hardworking individuals who believe in what they are doing. So this is at the heart of, of almost every education policy or reform. There's some kind of belief about the system. Maybe it's economic growth, maybe it's reducing inequality, maybe it's protecting the planet from impending destruction. This is the sort of starting point, and there's no resolution through experimental methods of which one we should be doing. And there's now, on top of this, we're adding in a whole nother dimension, because I have some questions that, that are coming from the audience. Oh, okay, can I say one mind? point about Please scale? Finish up so that, that was the last point, these four things. <laughs> okay, got These have a board. really important, uh, and I want to emphasize it because I, I think I have a different view of scale that's come up so far. The implication between these four points is that we should not always equate scale with success. Mm -hmm. Things spread yeah. for many reasons other than because they work, and it doesn't tell us about the values that are embedded in them when we go right to scale. So all of these things together. All right, no, thanks okay. there, for your there patience. There's so much to think about, and then on top of it all, we have an audience question about one of my favorite topics only because we've been covering it like crazy, and it's everywhere in education right now, the culture wars. Um, and somebody would like to know what concrete steps audience members can take to support inclusive education in the current reactionary political climate where divisive books and topics are being banned. And how do we help change that climate by restoring public faith in education's, educators' judgment about what is appropriate for students to learn? It's a big one. I'm sure many of you have been hearing about this. Heated school board meetings, um, banned books, um, topics of governors telling teachers what they can teach and what they can't teach. Uh, does anyone have any immediate thoughts on that that would like to answer that question? or immediate experience in dealing with it? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to touch it? I, I can say a, a sort of small piece, which is um, I, I really value opportunities like this and, and something I think many initiatives at, at Stanford are doing, which is to bring together the different voices to be able to have some kinds of conversations about this. I would see part of the, the problem as, as being unable to sort of incorporate discussion across the different viewpoints in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a, a punting answer, but um, it, it is a belief I hold about it. So I wanted to echo what Tricia said in her main talk, and that is that many educational decisions have nothing to do with outcomes in the students. True. And so we have these debates that are about other things, about politics and other things, and we don't focus on what I think schools should be doing, and that's whether the kids are learning basic skills and, and the things they're supposed to be learning. So it's a distraction. Carol. I just want to express my brokenheartedness over the divide. Um, shortly before the pandemic, we asked, um, 7,000 students in a nationally representative sample. Um, what is the problem that they see in the world that they would like to address or solve? And how could they use their education? How could they th use the stronger brain they're growing in high school to address these problems? Well, the answers were amazing one after another, 
problems of poverty, joblessness, homelessness, climate, bullying, uh, veterans not being treated well. One after another, they just, all of these ninth graders poured out um, the goals that they would like to pursue. And it was so transcending of partisan politics. So I feel like, yes, we want to reach these kids. We want to help them become these contributors that they can become. So that's not the solution, but, but there's so much there to work with. Yeah, um, I just want to build on that. I was going to say this is outside of my context. I'm from Africa. But <laughs> I, I just want to be able to point out that there's something about accounting to the child, and I think that's what you're yeah. talking about. There is, by the end of the day, you know, where is the child in, in all of this? What is it that they need? What is, it, uh, what is their own growth mindset, their belief about their capabilities and how are we leveraging and, and building on that. I think for me that it's always critical to be able to remember that it's about the child. Where do they stand within this? How do we become more accountable to, to that particular child? But also I think one thing that I've learned that's really helpful is issues around proximate leadership. Making sure that local, there is thinking globally and everything, but local action is defined by those that are living and experiencing it and closest to the issue. We can't always be parachuting solutions into contexts and communities. I think that's where some of the overreaction comes from. And Jonathan, did you want to touch this one? Okay, so <laughs> I'll say just a couple of things. Before we take one is that tonight. this is not a new challenge. When we're talking about societies that have been organized in relation to the dispossession and the marginalization of specific populations, we should not be surprised that their histories, their cultures, their practices, their knowledges would be marginalized in those societies. That's just self-evident, or it should be self-evident on some level. So that, that battle is built into the architecture of, of various societal contexts. Now, that said, I think it can be really troublesome in terms of kind of trying to figure out how to respond to cultural wars, because often the response is, okay, we should assert the value of multiculturalism and diversity as an end in itself in response to those who would oppose those perspectives. And I, on, on, in some ways, I want to affirm the support for, for diversity and inclusion and multiculturalism, but I worry about the ways that diversity can be a very shallow, superficial orientation to the culture wars. And that, you know, if we look at the election in Italy recently and, and in various situations throughout the world, there's often the championing of diversity without an interrogation of the ways that diversity can be used to reproduce dominant norms. And so we have to be very careful about how we orient to the, the culture wars and how we respond to, to these kinds of discussions. I, I agree that it can often be a, a distraction. Oh, often. And it's not new. Politics and education have been intertwined for, for more years than most of us can remember. We're going to take some questions from the audience right now. I have one right here. Please. Um, yes. I think she's organizing. Okay. Do I have a question here? Oh, okay. In that case, would anybody like to ask a question? We are welcome to take them. Please. Did you want some? Did you want them to come to the mic? Could would you mind walking to the mic to answer your question? To ask your question, anyone? Unless you have a mic in the audience to pass around. Thank you. Morning, uh, David Johnson, the University of Oxford. I was looking forward to a, a panel with both Hanishek and Dweck <laughs> uh, in conversation, and I really. Um, was um, was quite struck by by, uh, by Eric's reference to uh, you know just the vast number of uh, children in Africa who might not be able to answer the exchange rate um, problem in mathematics if that were put to them, and I wondered if Carol was going to respond to that. I was just really uh, so quite struck really by the uh, um, perhaps imprecise data we have on learning. A lot of what we have is, of course, on scholastic uh, tests and the outcomes are unfavorable. Uh, but there is, of course, a small, at the moment, anthropological studies that show that human intellectual functioning isn't as impaired as we might think in Africa and there are different ways of making meaning. So does our panel on inclusion drive us or gear us towards 
an increase in the kind of scholastic knowledge that we talk about, or more towards uh, finding ways to accommodate uh, the sorts of knowledge we don't know enough about. Thanks. Did anyone want to take that? It sounded not exactly like a question, but I think there was a question in, <laughs> inherent in that as well. So I have a very narrow view of the world, and that is that we're trying to develop the people around the country, and I place it in terms of economics, but that's very narrow. I would, in fact, broaden that out. But what we do know is that we um, put $200 billion in foreign aid into trying to develop countries around the world, and we've done a miserable job at that. And that's because we try to come in from outside and, and add uh, parachute in plans and, and solutions without getting the fundamentals right of what is being learned, what are, what are the girls learning in Africa, as opposed to here's the best way we know how to do it. And so I freely admit that I, taking a fairly narrow view of this world, but um, on a very major international basis, we try, we're trying often to develop other parts of the world, and we haven't done it. Carol. Dwight will respond to Hamish. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he means that we should take the equation and drum it into the students year after no. year until when it shows up on the PISA test, they can solve it, right? That, thank you, thank you, Carol. <laughs> no, I meant, uh, did not mean that I at all. I think he's just saying he, he's kind of not an expert in what else should be done. And for that, we look to people like Vicki Colbert, also at any Dan Laureate, who, and Angie, and many others who create environments of engaged learning, exciting learners, um, meaningful learning, collaborative learning, in which these concepts arise and, be, and are, are mastered. Uh, environments where the instructors are looking at the kids and saying, not only can you learn everything I have to teach you, but every single one of you has a substantial contribution to make to your community or the society as a whole. So I think we're just all in different parts of the puzzle. None of us would say that what we study is the whole, whole thing. So I, I'm not really advocating teaching to test. What I'm advocating, what I'm saying, and tests have a bad name today, that they're too narrow and, and uh, they don't measure the right things and the full range of things. But it turns out that at least as we look at the outcomes, people that know more as measured by these tests do better in the economy, economies that, where the people know more do better. And so it's the, a set of skills that are measured in fairly crude ways. It's not that they can solve the exchange rate problems, it's that they have the analytical skills that go along with being able to solve those problems. Yeah, I also just want, I think, to reiterate what uh, I think I'm also hearing, that by the end of the day, it also you know, matters who defines success, who defines what is measured, who defines what is learned, who defines what mm -hmm. is important for me to understand and learn. I just talked to you about the three pin plug. I didn't know what it was, what it works. I had to understand it for me to be able to pass my ordinary level exams. But you know, I didn't get to use it until much later. And please don't say to me you turned out fine because as you heard earlier in the day, I could have turned out better. <laughs> so so I, I think we, we cannot uh, overlook the whole issue around who is defining what needs to be learned and what is important and what matters and what signals success. In other words, who is the expert here? Mm -hmm. And for what? For who? To do what? 
fascinating. And it kind of ties into this next question, which is one that I think that um, came from an audience member who's watching online and one I think many teachers and parents would appreciate. And this is somebody who wants to know why, um, what, how can we make our curricula more interesting for our students, especially at a time when um, we're trying to balance their attention to, to technology-assisted entertainments and curriculum-based learning. Um, since most students enjoy entertainment-based learning, what do we do to make it more interesting? And I think we're also in competition with so much technology right now cell phones and, and everything else. Um, so I think that question, I think, asks how to make education more fun and interesting. Does anyone want to weigh in on that? We have to remember we're not in competition with technology. So I'm, I'm looking at Victor Lee in our audience right now, a colleague <laughs> in the Graduate School of Education, our colleague Ontario Garcia in the Graduate School of Education who have demonstrated that technologies that in, in some contexts are positioned as problems or as challenges that need to be avoided in the classroom, prohibited from the classroom, are tremendous learning opportunities, are places where precisely people are developing skills and knowledge, emergent forms of skill, emergent forms of literacy, literacies, plural, languages, plural, that they're developing across the if lifespan. If they have access to it, which we learned during the pandemic that many don't. Absolutely. So uh, ac technological access is, is a, an important part of, of, of the discussion as well. So it's that co combination of attention to equity and attention to redefining what count as skills and, and, and demanding systems change. So in terms of, of really trying to, to engage learners, I think what so many scholars in, in education have been advocating for for decades at this point are approaches that draw on the lived experiences of students that honor their knowledges, that define skills on their own terms based on the communities of which they're a part and the forms of sustainability that have emerged within those communities. Instead, what we have are often deeply normative curricula that are defined in relation to <laughs> normative approaches to reproducing a society as it, as it stands today. A and I think that there's tremendous opportunity across context to reimagine. I think this is part of what, what um, Dean Schwartz was pointing out in his opening yeah. comments, that Absolutely. we previously thought about curricular subject areas, but there are many different ways that we could be organizing curricula at this point in relation to the, the challenges with which we're faced in the contemporary moment. That's great. I know we could all speak on this one, but we have another question, and I'd like to give an audience member another chance, and we can go back to that. Hi, thank you so much. A wonderful panel. I'm Vic Vucic, uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Digital Promise, and it kind of builds on this a little bit. I wanted, uh, I haven't heard much conversation about a place where I'm seeing an explosion of learning, and that's actually in informal learning environments. Kids are learning unbelievable amounts uh, through YouTube, through TikTok, through through all these environments by the millions. It's incredible. And so uh, I'd love your thoughts in terms of how can we harness that to, to push for transformation on the formal system? Um, and any thoughts, and particularly with equity uh, at the center. So any thoughts around that, I'd love to hear. Patricia, you want to tackle that one? Um, I, I guess I would approach it more cautiously, to be honest. Um, maybe this is because I have a 15-year-old who spends a lot of time on TikTok and YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube. Um, I, I think um, in, the, in some of this rhetoric around harnessing these kinds of technologies, um, I, I would always want to just stop for a second and, and reflect on the pros and cons that might be involved because the, the flip side of that is the, the kind of things we are now learning about effects on girls' self-esteem, for example. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to dive right into, look at all this potential, we should harness it and get it into the school system. So it, it's not a, an answer to your question, it's, but it's how I would come at thinking about it. Did anyone Maybe else you know. like to respond to that? I come from a context where the where we distrust new and different and alien and are quick to often label it as bad. If we can't afford it, the more demonizing we do of it. So I, I just wanted to, to point out that I think it's, it's important to keep it in mind. For me, I like the point that you said explosion and a lot of young people are excited about it because I think it's related to the point around how do we make sure that learners are engaged and excited. By the end of the day, we evolve or we dissolve. We cannot ignore the very fact that learners today are not 
from our generation or the generation before. We need to listen and engage, not to impose, but to really make sure that we are responsive and we are making sense and we are meeting them where they are. The problem is we have lived like this, we have known this, this is how it should be. And I feel that that is some of the, the glitches that we continue to face. But I also agree with you that we need to think about equity issues and others that could be left behind as we do this. I believe in if there's anything new, can we engage with it, look at the risks and mitigate it. What we can't do is bury our heads in the sand and think that it will go away. It doesn't work. Let's engage with it and see opportunities that are in there. Okay, it looks like I have another audience question. Hi, my name is Sheree Chen, and I founded a family well-being company called Springspot. And this has been an amazing um, panel. So the question I have is actually relating to a stakeholder that hasn't been touched upon in the conversation about learners, which are parents. And a lot of what we've seen through COVID, especially through all the distance learning, that parents have assumed kind of the role of helping educate sometimes the kids in the, the home setting. So with growth mindset and some of the opportunities, are there ways of empowering or equipping the parents to be allies to help um, with some of these ways of helping learners um, and the home? So we'd love to hear your, yes. Yes, we, we think so. Um, but we're also a little bit alarmed at the intrusive or helicopter parenting that we see <laughs> in the US. And it turns out when you read the research and Yelena Obradovich at the Ed School here is doing sure. some of this. Taking on challenges is what feeds the growth of the brain. If I can just directly respond, it isn't necessarily the helicopter parenting, but almost the education of parents so that they can be partners with the educators in the classroom yes. to better equip them because- Yes, yes, but many parents are interpreting collaboration as doing it for them or never letting them struggle, paving the way. Um, and so, yes, we would love to work with parents on how to create a growth mindset culture in the home, but in those cultures, the learner takes the lead, the learner is attracted to challenges, takes them on, the parent can scaffold or support or say, oh, what would it look like if we tried it this way? Or do you have another idea of how you could do this? Teaching this persistence rather than being afraid it will impair the child's self-esteem to struggle. So this kind of, um, I, I'm even concerned that COVID has exacerbated that because sitting right on top of them. <laughs> yeah, they're sitting oh. like on top of them. So yes, I think parents have a tremendous role to play. Um, I have a quick question that somebody wants to ask about another entity that has a big role to play or what that role is. I'm gonna direct this one to Eric and that is the, what role do governments play in managing student learning outcomes? Maybe it should be what role should they play? What role? Um, well, we've gone through uh, various cycles here. Um, my own opinion is that um, the, an appropriate role for government is to uh, establish the standards or goals of what the school system is supposed to do and to assess whether, in fact, the students in schools are meeting those goals. But I'm an unabashed accountability person, as you can tell. Um, but after that, I think that we've gotten uh, into a lot of problems in schools when we try to be prescriptive from uh, the state capital or, or the national capital, even worse, of what should be done in the schools. I think that we've found that um, it's really important to empower the local schools uh, as long as they have the goal of, of what they're supposed to be accomplishing, to let them uh, really be the leaders in how it's done as opposed to what is done. Did you want to add to that, Jonathan? <laughs> uh, I, I guess for me, um, what's dangerous, of course, is 
deferring to any given governmental administration's priorities in, in terms of envisioning one's educational goals. So um, I, I think it, it, I, I tend to, to work with local communities in terms of asserting their knowledges and ensuring making demands um, for the curriculum to reflect their students' experiences and needs. And this connects to the conversation about parents from Absolutely. the previous question as well. So it's one thing to kind of try to develop strategies for engaging parents, but we have to think about the economic circumstances that many parents are facing where they don't have access to a living wage, they don't have access to stable housing in many situations or a whole range. There's very little societal safety net in a context like the United States. And so we can't just keep making these educational demands of parents which then let the state off the hook. And so in terms of our, our, our vision of educational change, I think we have to, to combine our attention to parent engagement with demands for resourcing these institutions and, and, and making a, a safety net a, a priority. Fascinating. Hey Liz, I think it, it would be good just to put on the table um, as a kind of array of responses to that. One of um, a former colleagues, Linda Darlene Hammond's work has, has shown a lot um, about the importance of public systems in, um, even in test scores and, and some of the um, outcomes. So, so some of what we heard in, the, in, in Rick's response and even in Jonathan's was, it, it is often kind of linked to a lot of privatization of schooling. So I just wanna put on the table that there's also evidence out there that strong public systems being the responsibility of government is also often successful. I have one recommendation, and, and you know this is born from issues around equity. I think it would make a huge difference if government organize or design for the most marginalized child mm -hmm. within that system, not just for the average learner, not just for the well provided, but if they could think about the one that the system is currently not saving, mm -hmm. because when they do that, the system would work for every other child. So let's not go for safe programming or safe designing. Let's think actually who is the one that we are not saving mm -hmm. today. And then we solve all the other issues. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have an audience question over here. Um, over here. Hi, this is Emma Dawn. I lead our K-12 uh, education practice at McKinsey and the research that we've been doing on the impact of the pandemic on student learning and as we've been talking with folks about how to address this huge challenge of global learning poverty, uh, especially in the light of COVID where kids are maybe over a year behind where they would have been, one of the things we've been finding is it's maybe not so much the what interventions in a single classroom, but it's how to scale those across the thousands and thousands of classrooms across Africa. And I'm curious with all of your work, um, that especially in this intervention database of policies, whether you have clues not only as to the what works, but how is it scaling effectively and what is the secret to systems who've been able to scale effective interventions to improve learning outcomes for all kids? Thank you. Anyone want to tackle that? We won't have time for all of us to, so. <laughs> mm. I'll just say that with our interventions, we try to um, have as much of it uh, computer-based as possible, so it's easily um, d dispersible. And also to uh, create um, teacher groups that meet with each other on some regular basis to exchange what, what they tried and what worked and how it could work better. Could I just add a little bit? The, um, there's been a lot of attention to learning losses th through COVID, and the standard US solution is something like intensive tutoring or lengthening the school day. Um, and we have a lot of research on that that suggests that those interventions will never solve this problem. They can solve a portion of this problem, but that if we just pursue those as the ways to intervene, we are going to have a cohort of students that is harmed for life. And the only research-based uh, component of solving this problem that I know of is uh, relying on our highly effective teachers, of which we have a large number of them, 
And we right now um, have school systems that are awash in money because the federal government has in three different time period, three different um, tranches put a lot of money into local school districts. Local school districts have not spent this money. Um, if you wanted to get out of COVID, my solution is pretty simple. You take that money and uh, provide, pay the highly effective teachers to take on a larger number of students. Um, and that, by that way, change the average quality of schools. The other half of it that I don't know if I'm allowed to mention it in this audience is that you can take part of that ESSA money and buy out the contracts of our ineffective teachers, of which there are a few that are very harmful to our system. And if you did those two things, the research evidence suggests that we could in fact deal with the COVID problem. The current solutions that are being talked about have no chance by historical measure of dealing with this problem. It's not just a scale problem that they, even if you scaled the current uh, programs, they would not solve the problem. We could spend a couple of hours talking about how controversial that solution would be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to do this at lunchtime when we could all run out. <laughs> so I think <laughs> instead I'll take another question from the audience from someone who's been waiting. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you guys so much for having this panel. My name is Khadija. I am a um, student of international comparative education. And my question is geared towards um, Angeline, but I invite everyone to answer as well. Um, what do you think the role of African indigenous knowledge um, is in formal education? And how do you think it can be used to boost local economies and as well as a country's economy? Thank you so much for your question, Khadija. That's a very loaded question and one that can take forever. And particularly from somebody who struggled to learn in, in English. Because you know, when, when we're in the village in my home, we spoke my local language, Shona. As soon as I sat in the classroom, I was not just trying to understand what the word is saying, but also to grasp and understand concepts. And you know, the teachers in an attempt to help would, would use Shonglish. And Shonglish is a combination of my indigenous language and English. But when it came to the exam time, it was difficult to transcribe what they had said. In, yeah, so to, to your point, I, I do think it's important to start with learners where they are. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we need to also get over the notion that, which is to be honest, common across Africa, that actually knowing how to speak in English signals that you have learned, it doesn't. Yeah. It, and and it's, it, it doesn't mean that you are more intelligent. It allows you to engage and interface, and I'm grateful for that. But it also slows down your learning and results in very low self-esteem around your sense of what you can or cannot do or your sense of your capabilities, especially if you can't express yourself in that language. Um, I'm this old, but I still struggle because I do feel that my indigenous language is way richer than English. There are so many things that I could have said today that I didn't get to say because I have not learned the language yet. I don't know the English to use. So there is a restriction that comes with that. And, and I do feel that that spills over into post school, into livelihoods, into how we participate and engage with the economy. It's as foreign as is the actual learning in the classroom. That question is so important as well because it broadens our understanding of what indigeneity is. Often in the US context, we think of indigeneity demographically in, in relation to, to Native American populations. But of course, there are many indigeneities throughout the world. And I think the potential for indigenous knowledges to, to push back against and to, to make new demands on how we, again, define skills, achievement, progress, development, success. There are so many different ways we could be uh, or orienting to these questions. And so even, the, I, I was just back in Chicago this past weekend organizing a, a Spencer uh, Foundation sponsored conference titled Community is Intellectual Space, which was working with a, a Puerto Rican community and its local indigenous knowledges that have emerged out of responding to state abandonment. So you had a situation where we were commemorating the, the 50th anniversary, the founding anniversary of a, 
a Puerto Rican focused high school in Chicago where I actually was a civics teacher once upon a time. And um, you know, th this school had to be created because it, in the mid 1970s, 75% of Puerto Rican students in Chicago were being pushed out of Chicago public schools. Note we say push out, not drop out because this isn't simply a decision that individuals are making, this is a systematic process. And so out of necessity, this community has drawn on its indigenous knowledges to develop alternative schools, alternative healthcare provision systems, alternative childcare uh, systems, provision systems, alternative food cultivation and distribution systems, alternative housing systems. Mm -hmm. All of these indigenous knowledges create a different orientation to community social ecologies and to sustainability. And I think this exists all over the world. And what would it look like if we were to organize our vision for education and for a sustainable world in relation to these knowledges? That's great. And we have only time for one more question. So somebody who's been waiting the longest is my pick. <laughs> Who's been waiting Thank long? you very much. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm Manzur Ahmed from uh, Bangladesh. Uh, we have heard that uh, half of the children or more are not ready with their skills for 21st century, as Eric Hanushek pointed out. Uh, but if we look back 10 years or 20 years, I guess we are better off somewhat than in the past. So we are making some progress, but maybe not enough. And then the uh, speakers here presented some of their work and strategies. And each one, I think, is uh, making important points which are helping, but these are all, are they sort of partial solutions? And so we only had an hour and a half. Technical <laughs> solutions, okay. So, so the point is, how do we uh, bring these things together in a more, uh, somewhat more strategic kind of comprehensive approach and addressing a couple of overarching challenges, existential challenges that we are facing arising from the climate change effects which we are facing every day in Bangladesh and in Florida today and so on. And then the other overarching challenge is the kind of divisive exclusionary values, culture wars, in its different variations all over the world, in all countries, in its different forms. So how do we address these? I mean, aren't these, these the critical existential challenges? And are we addressing these? And uh, how do we do is there kind of social compact that the Futures Education Report talks about. Is there, uh, can we move towards that, so sort of political settlement in each country? I mean, these are probably the questions. I think you have alluded to these, but okay. can we focus on these more? Thank you. Carol. <laughs> Angie said to me last night, what would you consider to be a success of our panel? And I said, you know, we all have a little piece of the puzzle. And for me, a successful panel would be if we start getting ideas about how it could all fit together. So I think we're all stimulated. I think we're all starting to get the ideas. Um, maybe next year we'll present them to you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's, so, that so seems like a great, go ahead. I, I, I think I, I would say concretely, um, we can even pin down some, some specific things that, that I might think about as success would be if, if every intervention or reform policy that was being considered, there was a set of questions that got asked that encompassed all our views. What are the, so how do we scale? Okay, mm -hmm. what are the values? beliefs, who's being represented, mm -hmm. these questions that were raised earlier. Mm. What are the economic implications? What are the social? So, so a broader set of questions applied to each education effort that we're trying to make would be my. <laughs> Eric? Could I just wanted to add one uh, thought that came up when you discussed um, how do we pull everything together. And one of the things we haven't talked about is political leadership that in fact has a huge impact. Today we tend, with lots of things going on in, in various countries of the world, to bemoan politics and the, the 
bad sort of emphasize politics that we don't like. But in, if you look around the United States, and I think in other countries, you find when they tend to start moving forward into succeeding, there's a political leadership that's positive, a positive force that is bringing it together. And it's not that there's a specific answer, it's that leaders are committed to making lives better in their state in the US or in their country in the world. And unfortunately, we don't see that um, out of the 200 countries in the UN. We don't see 200 leaders that are doing that, but we do see some that are doing it, and we shouldn't discount the fact, the importance of having positive political leadership. Did you want to add to that anybody else? This seems like a good, please. Yeah. I, I just want to say as we draw on the success stories and celebrate how far we have come and how much we have done, I just want to stress that we need to remember the children that we're leaving behind, those that are currently not being saved. We need to keep in mind the agency of that. And talking indigenous languages, I would want to see some Swahili here which says pamoja tunaweza, which means together we can. The fact that we're talking about this means we care and we can solve it. So pamoja tunaweza, together we can. Thank you. Well, that seemed like a, a great way to end a terrific panel. I wish we had a couple more hours, but this helps me with our theory of change at the Heckinger Report, that nobody is going to solve these major problems if we're not talking about them. Thinking, them, thinking about them, researching them, debating them, discussing them. Um, and so I appreciate the opportunity to hear from all of you. And I think this has been a terrific panel. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you so much uh, for the extraordinary discussion and for all the pieces of the puzzle that you all brought. Um, just would love to um, point out that on the webpage for our uh, event here, acceleratelearning.stanford.edu, under the resources are all sorts of papers and some of the things that Carol had mentioned. All are totally available to everyone, both online and here to look at now or later. So feel free to dive in and to continue to explore these themes. Um, so knowing that everyone here has had now so much new things to think about and talk about. Uh, I invite you to join us for lunch outside and enjoy our California sunshine um, in our courtyard. So thank you all very much and we'll see you after lunch. Hello. Welcome back. Everyone could please take their seats. We will get started here. We want to try to run on time. Please join us. Should I use one of those teacher tricks where you like go boop, 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 boop? There you go. A student was paying attention. Excellent. All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, both new and sustaining conversations over lunch. Um, and uh, very excited uh, to move forward today. What, I mean, just crackling morning already. Um, so please note one quick thing. Uh, you all are the ones who make this conference so great. And I think everyone could feel that this morning with the questions, how it just really started popping with the, the exchanges with the panel, et cetera. So we're going to run it the exact same way. And all the panels this afternoon will do this, is that the presentation uh, initially, just to kind of set the stage, bring those, those pieces that Carol DeWick described so nicely uh, for about a half an hour. And then there'll be 45 minutes of questions. So please do think about your questions. And if you have something, there are four microphones. Please uh, go ahead and queue up at those microphones uh, when you have a clear question uh, that you can bring to the panel, and then we will start to spark off one another. All right, so that's a little housekeeping. Um, just wanted also to note about this panel, uh, we learned yesterday that Dr. Uh, Stipix, who is the Dean Emerita of the GSE, was called out of town unexpectedly yesterday and is unable to join us. Uh, I know we will miss her thoughtful expertise around early childhood policy. I know I was really looking forward to that. Uh, so she sends her warm wishes to all of us and uh, we regret her um, absence. 
So I, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Patricia Kuhl to moderate our session here on early childhood learning and development. Right here to my right. Pat is one of the world's leading experts on early childhood. She directs the National Science Foundation funded Science of Early Learning, is the Bezos Family Foundation Endowed Chair for Early Learning, and the co-director of the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington. Her TED Talks on the linguistic genius of babies has been viewed by millions, and if you haven't uh, watched that, please do. Who doesn't love a TED Talk? I mean, so fun. Um, she has done more than almost anyone I know to transform our understanding of how young children learn, and I'm honored to be a part of this panel, um, uh, this worldwide panel of scholars in her company for this session. So please welcome our panel. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, and thank you for coming back in from the California sunshine to learn more about the exciting challenges in, in the field of education. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to focus on a younger period of time and development before children get to school. You know, there was a time when we thought that that period <clears throat> before children got to kindergarten and first grade was not that interesting. There was nothing special about the brain of the young child. But what we're all going to tell you today is that the magic of early learning and brain development is the new rocket science. It's a frontier with excitement and challenges equal to climate change, medicine and health, and the mysteries of the universe that the new Webb telescope is revealing to us. <laughs> like the Webb telescope, new studies are showing us stunning changes that take place in the young brain that are produced by experience. And these changes help explain why young children are the best learners on the planet and how early learning builds a foundation for lifelong learning. So I want to start giving you a couple of examples before we get started with the panels of you know, what is it looking like in the brain? What are the new studies showing? And I'll give you two examples from my lab. In a study we published this year, we coached parents by telling them about brain development and encouraging them to speak to and engage their children with a, a speech, a, a style of speech that parents all over the world use when talking to their children called parentese. And we did this when the parents were six, uh, when the kids of the parents were six, 10, and 14 months of age. A control group um, matched, uh, got no coaching, but they were all measured in the same way. What we saw is that the amount of parentese affected the growth of myelin in the fiber tracks that connect the listening and speaking areas of the brain. Those tracks got longer, stronger, and faster by two years of age, and the kids' language skills, especially conversational turns, that back and forth that's the magic of communication, were significantly better. These children are now age five. It's three and a half years since we talked to the parents and coached them about children's brains. And these kids are still on a totally different trajectory than the controls. Their language skills are significantly better, remain so, and their reading readiness skills far exceed controls. So this is the kind of foundational change. The experience that children had is changing the structure of their brains to enhance learning. What does it tell us? First, that parents can change when you give them information. Second, that infants' language skills are malleable, as Carol said this morning. These skills are not fixed and predetermined, they're malleable. And third, we begin to see the mechanisms by which experience shapes and sculpts the structure of connections in the brain. Again, lifelong effect of that early uh, experience. The second study is one we just published last week with Taiwanese and Japanese collaborators. We're very interested in the magic of the social brain. Everything we know about children is affected by their social context. You'll hear a lot about that today. In this special laboratory, we have two very powerful MEG machines, and we put mom in one and the five-year-old child in another, and we let them interact. And what we see is that during positive social interaction, the neurons in their brains fire in synchrony. This neural synchrony that we see ends when the social interaction ends. And neural synchrony has now been associated with better parent-child attachment and accelerated learning. We're now doing this with five-month-old babies and their parents, and we're seeing similar results. 
Neural synchrony may be what binds us to each other and helps us learn from others our whole lives. You've all read probably the National Academy of Sciences study on the benefits of early childhood education. It produces job growth, better life satisfaction, and healthier people. All over the world, as you're going to hear today, early childhood programs are helping children become more independent, more empathic, more flexible learners who contend with the change and so show resilience in the face of life's difficulties. You'll hear so much more about that from today's panelists. It boils down to such a simple truth. The engine driving a child's future lies in the child's brain and its potential for learning. Science has shown children's vast and unparalleled learning potential. All children possess this inherent ability at birth. We are the activators of that potential. Early childhood builds a foundation for learning that lasts a childhood. So now let's turn to our panelists. Mm -hmm. Today we'll hear from four stellar scientists who each have brought their expertise to early childhood learning programs. A neuroscientist, a pediatrician, and two educators. Each of them will share a critical piece of their work and show how it can move us forward. And then we'll take your questions at one of the four microphones. We start with Bruce McCandless, the Piggott Family Graduate School of Education professor at Stanford's Graduate School of Education. Bruce is doing groundbreaking work on how education shapes the neural circuitry, why individual differences matter, and how neuroscience can enhance education. So Bruce, hmm. can you tell us about the child's early emergent skills and how they affect the abilities of children that the children need for school? What's happening in the brain, for example, as children learn to read? So um, I think this is a really rich question, and it doesn't necessarily have a trivial answer, but the fact that we're posing that question here today I think is really, really important and embodies everything that we're trying to do in this meeting. What does, it, what does all of these insights that you're gonna hear about from these panel members about early childhood development and early childhood learning have to do with what you heard about in this first panel about schooling and kids acquiring these new kind of like cultural, culturally uh, invented skills that they come to master and possess. And what on earth does this have to do with neuroscience? I mean, our, the president of Stanford is a neuroscientist kicking this whole thing off. We got one of the most premier neuroscientists who flew down from Washington and you've got me talking about some of my work with neuroscience. It's like a neuroscientist and an early childhood specialist and a reading specialist walk into a bar? <laughs> what do they have to talk about, especially if it's trivia night? And the question is, why is education poised to be one of the most transformative forces that's gonna impact the future of our species? If it was 20 years ago, you'd say nothing except a, a really dedicated difference of opinion, <laughs> right? But we're not, you know, it's not 1980, it's 1922, or eight, no, it's 2022, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and we live now in an age where we've got unprecedented insights into what binds us all together as human beings. We are all the recipients of this amazing biological endowment. We're all billionaires, 80 billion neurons inside your very own cranium that you own and that are you. And they can learn anything. It's like one of the most amazing interconnected entities in the entire universe inside the head of every single child. But then we're faced with these amazing questions about, well, why is the world so awful, Bruce? That sounds miraculous. Why is it that, you know, we have, you know, look at Eric Hanacek's map. Why is it all blue? Like, what is going on here? And I think that Pat's introduction, I don't, you, you may have missed it. It was very subtle, but it was very powerful. I bet she spent hours on this, because it was a piece of art. I think you should publish it. Um, what she said was this amazing human endowment that we have of not just 80 billion neurons, but 80 million dollars, 80 million, 80 billion neurons connected by the unique architecture, the unique learning architecture of the human mind is not in and of itself enough to create a modern thinking pro-social human being. These are profoundly mediated by social interactions and by educational opportunities. And I think this marks, I love that Dan brought up uh, Copernicus and Ptolemy 
because I think this really marks, and I, I, I don't think it's easy enough to appreciate this. Most people might have an idea about neuroscience, which comes from 1980. Was that three left or three so far? I guess it's the halfway point. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I think most of us have this idea of neuroscience, which comes from 1980, but it's, it's 2022. And the big Copernicus shift in human neuroscience, what makes human neuroscience so special is that another thing that Pat mentioned that I'd like to underscore. She said something that would be hypocritical in 1980. She said social interactions are having a causal force on the development of the human nervous system. That is remarkable. This is a profound shift. We are actually studying how is it that the way a child is interacting with their caregivers has a causal impact on the way the neurons are forming and rewiring and building circuits that they're going to use as their true enculturated endowment the rest of their life. I think this Copernicus shift in what is neuro human neuroscience is now starting to realize that Vygotsky was right. The creation of the educated human mind is really comes as a causal output through these social interactions. This binds together human development. You've got this amazing endowment inside of the context of a family, inside of the context of caregiving, inside of the context of extended caregiving, which is what this whole early childhood development panel is about. But then you also have it extended into enculturation in these skills that Eric was talking about. And we're starting to learn a new science of this. The other thing is that we've learned from educational neuroscience that the cultural endowments of education, becoming fluent in literacy, being able to access the exact thoughts of any author that's ever lived, that skill is supported by a very specific neural mechanism, a circuit in your brain that you've built through tens of thousands of hours of practice, and it's built on the back of these more fundamental circuits that you built in your early language experiences, in the give and take between a parent and a child. And I'll stop there, but during discussion, I'm gonna weave in two other points that I think are a really big change, is that neuroscience is no longer in a laboratory. So if anybody wants to go over to East Menlo Park, into the Fairbanks neighborhood, you might be a little bit nervous, you might have heard that this is a high crime area or something, but in the middle of that is a school K through eight school where every single kid, most every single kid who's decided to join us is getting a brain scan from kindergarten all the way through eighth grade and they're participating in this discovery of how their brains are changing and unfolding and enriching as they engage in this very, very powerful educational journey. And at the same time, there are 10,000 kids across the United States who have committed to get a brain scan in fourth grade and then come back every single two years until high school graduation, which is going to let us see for the first time how the savage inequities of access to educational opportunity have an impact, a causal impact, on the fabric of the human mind and the fabric of the human brain that <clears throat> my students are measuring every day. Thank you, Bruce. So let's move now to a pediatrician. Uh, you met her this morning, Dr. Lisa Chamberlain. She's founder of the Office for Child Health Equity at Stanford's Department of Pediatrics. Lisa realized that as a pediatrician, she had both this setting, the access, and the trust of parents and families. She spent a lifetime eliminating child health disparities. So Lisa, what are the components of good environments for young children? And how can the physician's voice become a game changer with regard to early learning? Thank you, Pat, and just really want to acknowledge I feel so honored to be a part of this panel. Um, thank yes, you for you inviting me. Um, I'm going to start with a case. I'm going to start with uh, a bit of a story. I'm coming to this as a pediatrician, so feeling incredibly intimidated by uh, all of the, the, the basic science. Um, yesterday I was in clinic in the neighborhood you mentioned. And I've been a pediatrician and uh, primary care pediatrician for 18 years in East Palo Alto and the Redwood City area of, of um, <clears throat> North Fair Oaks area of Redwood City. And it does have high crime rates if you look at those statistics. It is the richest, most resilient, hardworking, loving, mm -hmm. uh, resilient community, both East Palo Alto and Redwood City. I feel incredibly safe there. 
I feel uh, connected and welcomed. And so um, it's, it's, I think one of the themes we heard this morning is to kind of switch from a deficit-based model to a kind of resiliency-based view of these communities. Um, most of the families that I work with are two adults working three jobs, uh, trading off childcare as they go through their days, working nights, working all sorts of shifts, often doubling up in their lodging to be able to afford the crazy rent here. Um, incredibly family focused and uh, connected to one another. <clears throat> so yesterday, uh, I was thinking of the kids that I saw. Um, uh, you know, you walk into a room and you can see a mom and a six month old and a, we saw a one month old and lots of different ages and uh, just the warmth and connection, you can feel it, you can see it, uh, the interaction, the, the way they hold themselves, yeah. the way they hold the baby. They, they say that pediatricians, um, first like five to 10 seconds, you can assess so much. It's this mm -hmm. thing, it's hard to measure, but a pediatrician knows, is that child sick or not? Yes, no, sick or not sick? Like panic or everything's gonna be okay. You know that in like three seconds, just looking. And you have the same sense about a family. Um, you know, what, what am I walking into here? And uh, one of the rooms I went into, uh, that child was about nine months old, big curly hair, big dark eyes, um, absolutely precious. And uh, the mom and baby were sitting together. They were not, you know, facing each other, but kind of side to side and uh, quietly talking. And I walked in, they both looked up and smiled. And I just went, oh, I can see how bonded you are. That's lovely. Um, and so you can just see that. And, and I share that to, to say that, and then we went on and addressed the questions that they had, um, but then our clinic is full of all sorts of opportunities to strengthen the, the language and the learning for that child. And, and I hope to get to some of that in the question and answer because I think that um, uh, the transdisciplinary work we could do with uh, neuroscience, with early childhood educators um, is, is a real opportunity that we have not yet tapped. Um, so I will briefly answer the question of what is a, a good environment. We, uh, I also have a public health background um, as well as, as my medical background, so I'll draw on both to answer the question. Um, it's, we use a socio-ecological model mostly when we think about context, and so in the middle of the circle is the child in the family. And so the social constructs there that are so critical are predictability, predictability mm -hmm. of the adults, mm -hmm. um, consistent, you can anticipate what that adult is gonna do. Um, that, that's absolutely central. That plays out in daily routines, so that there's some consistency in routines. Um, that is all really dependent on having stable housing. That's dependent on having enough food. These are policy questions. Um, you know, the way we structure uh, the costs of things. And, and I, I know the child trends report that came out that showed poverty was, was reduced in children uh, last week in the New York Times. I, I cannot disagree more. All I hear from my families in the last two months, mm -hmm. los precios, los precios, the prices, mm -hmm. they cannot absorb uh, inflation right now. They are not able to afford the cost of gas. They cannot afford the increasing cost of food. Um, it, they are very price sensitive and really living on the edge. So I would love to think more about how we can get that message out there, that this is co increasingly causing strain in that inner, inner circle. Um, so policies that support food security, both our formal food safety net and our informal food safety net are critical. And then housing policy that guarantees safe and secure housing is, is absolutely central to that being a stable place. Those are the structural pieces. Uh, beyond that, then you look at the child's neighborhood. Is it a predictable neighborhood? Is it safe? Um, is, uh, what about noise levels, noise pollution, air ambient um, air pollution? Are you living right next to the 101? It's not an accident. Uh, where Section 8 housing is, uh, zoning laws, et cetera. Um, so what is the uh, environmental health of the neighborhood? Um, uh, moving up, what is the neighborhood is in what kind of community? What kind of resources are there, faith-based groups, um, recreational spaces, green spaces? Um, shopping centers, like, and that again is also policy sensitive. Right. None of these things are accidents, right? How we build and zone our cities are highly politically influenced. And so really thinking about this in terms of systems, I just couldn't agree with Jonathan from the previous panel more. Looking at those systems is where the power is and what's driving the disparities. 
So we've gone from the child to the neighborhood to the community to the political context. Um, I, I think the political context absolutely can drive down and influence that, that family unit. And um, so I think of those as kind of the critical components yeah. for a child yeah. and a political community where they right. value supporting schools and housing and right. food. All right, thank you, Lisa. So speaking of systems, our third panelist is Susan Bipa, uh, country director at Brock in Tanzania. Susan worked with the Tanzanian government to develop a play curriculum for three to five-year-olds. Susan's work produced a national document to ensure the use of play curricula for all Tanzanian children. So Susan, what elements of early learning are universal, and how do you incorporate local culture and practices into your programs? Yes, thank you so much, Patricia, for that introduction, and I just want to take this opportunity also to thank the former speakers who have actually given great insights uh, to the topic that we are discussing this afternoon. Uh, to, in responding to Patricia's question regarding what elements um, of early childhood learning and development are universal, I just want to say one of the elements is the right of the child to actually play. It mm -hmm. is universal, regardless of whether the child is coming from the US, is coming from Africa, from Asia, regardless of the uh, ethnicity or mm -hmm. social strata, every child has the right to play. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to re relate mostly to uh, BRAC's ECD programming, the iterations that we have. We have several iterations when it comes to BRAC ECD program, being uh, the play lab. I know some of you have heard about the play lab, and even in the int introduction uh, of Charles Che, he talked a little bit about BRAC's ECD programming. We have also the humanitarian uh, play labs that are in Uganda, in Bangladesh, we have the social enterprise play labs that are in Tanzania, and we also have radio play labs adaptations in Uganda, Tanzania, and Bangladesh. And uh, as an organization, we have developed a curriculum which is cost, I would say it's a low cost, it uses a low cost model, but it is of high quality. And one of the central or key focus is the universal right of a child to play. And uh, this curriculum, actually, uh, it is facilitated through child-led activities, which of course support the cognitive, social, uh, language uh, and development. And uh, in terms of uh, the curriculum, it relates very much to the cultural context. It has been developed through different iterative processes in all the three countries of Bangladesh, Tanzania, and Uganda, but each has its own cultural adaptation has its own cultural context. Just to give you an example, uh, when we have our play leaders delivering sessions in the ECD centers or in our play labs, for example, when it comes to children being stimulated to learn about vowels, A, E, I, O, U, uh, children uh, would actually use songs, they would use rhymes, they would use games, they would use poems. But in Bangladesh, they use uh, cultural uh, practices that relates to all these songs and practices. In Tanzania also we do the same. Whatever we develop uh, the child-led activities, they actually reflect the culture of Tanzania and Uganda as well. So I would say in the curriculum, we have incorporated all elements of cultural practices uh, that suit the context of a particular uh, country. And we have been advocating and we have been champions uh, as BRAC in trying to actually help governments to adopt the learning through play approach. Mm -hmm. As Patricia has just said, like uh, recently, uh, the government of Tanzania, where I'm coming from, uh, through the support of BRAC's uh, ECD work, we've been able to develop this uh, curriculum for children below the, five, the age of five years. And this curriculum has actually been adopted by the government. It's now a national uh, document. So whoever is going to open an ECD center, whoever is going to run an ECD center will in fact be required, will be obliged to use this child-focused uh, curriculum. That is one, the early uh, learning or playful learning is one of the universal components of early childhood education. Another is on the physical environment. When we talk about physical environment, physical environment is universal and uh, Physical environment refers to a space, safe space. 
This is a space where children actually learn. This is where children uh, get their learning activities and it is inclusive for every uh, child. And these physical spaces, uh, they have to be secure, they have to be safe, they have to be free from all forms of hazard. In whatever physical space that we see in all countries, they are universal and the element of them being safe, free from hazard, is one of the key universal elements. And uh, when we look at our uh, spaces, like in Bangladesh, Uganda, Tanzania, Sierra Leone, where we have the ECD centers, um, they're of different forms, they're not the same. In other countries, they are co-located with the government, they're within the government premises. Others are just standalone uh, safe spaces, like in the humanitarian settings. You have others that have been sustained and they're being run by our play leaders, and the play leaders have become macro entrepreneurs, and they're running them. But in terms of incorporation of cultural uh, practices, for example, uh, in Tanzania, we have a lot of coconut trees. The learning materials that you see there, they're made of the coconut, they come from the coconut plant. But in Bangladesh, there's a lot of bamboo also. Mm -hmm. Most of the learning uh, materials, learning and play materials actually come um, from the bamboo tree, as well as in Uganda, they have a lot of banana uh, uh, trees, so most of the learning materials come from uh, the, 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 the banana trees. And a third component that I would just say is the uh, physical interaction uh, and relationship, which is very key uh, as a universal component for in early childhood development and learning. And in terms of physical interaction, uh, it is key for parents to relate with children, it is key for caregivers to relate with children. And in all this, there is a saying uh, in an African proverb that it takes a, ch a village to raise a child. So you have young women who are being trained uh, in our ECD programming and they actually facilitate and lead these sessions uh, in our play labs. So in a nutshell, I would say that we have many elements that are actually universal when it comes to early childhood development, including the brain itself. But these are just, in a nutshell, some of the features that I've mentioned. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. You inspire us all. The fact mm -hmm. that you can establish for the government a, a playbook for play and all the children is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Our fourth panelist is Rukmini Banerjee, Banerjee the CEO of Profum Education Foundation. Rukmini works with families and communities. Her work illustrates that while the learning potential of young children is universal, their cultures differ in important ways. Rukmini's work shows how we capitalize on cultural differences when working with families and communities. Rukmini, how do you help families and communities understand the importance of early childhood learning? And how do you help them deal with the challenges of providing children with the learning opportunities that they need? Um, Patricia, I have to do something which is culturally very specific to India. Mm. On TV, when the interviewers ask questions, the panelists answer whatever they want and ignore the question. You go right <laughs> ahead. <laughs> you go right ahead. I give you permission. <laughs> but, but since I'm here and we are supposed to listen to some guidelines, and I will come back to your question. Break out. Just. Uh, <clears throat> but I have to say that listening to everyone from the morning, this phrase has come up that I turned out okay, but I could have been better. I could have been better. And I think that from the morning I've been feeling, geez, you know, <laughs> why didn't I learn something about neuroscience or about <laughs> pediatrics? <laughs> At least play, we know a little bit how to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if we had to start all over again, maybe I should return the Edan Prize and say that <laughs> curriculum <laughs> starts again. <laughs> um, see, I think that early childhood education is a fairly foreign concept. Yeah. Early childhood care, early childhood development, you know, these things at least can be understood. And the word education carries some weight, especially in countries where access to schooling has happened in recent years. So aspirations of parents and of families and of communities to say, I didn't get a chance to get schooled, so let me give my mm. children as much schooling as possible, mm. Mm. because more is clearly better, is a, I would say, a, a challenge. Yeah. Because this has led in India to children being enrolled in formal school earlier and earlier, mm. because the middle class or the upper income families 
put their kids into what is called school, but could be play school or whatever, preschool. The word school, I think, is a little bit of a problem because everybody feels that if you know somebody that I know who's well off has their child in something called something school at age two, mm -hmm. then I'm being left out because my children are not getting an advantage. Okay. So in this context, I think there is a great need to really think about what should children be doing uh, you know, in the years before formal school, what is the age at which, or the stage at which actually, mm -hmm. that you should come into formal school. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's been a lot of debate about that in India. And of course, anytime there's an, any educational debate, everybody wants to know what is happening in Finland. The number of people in Finland is equal to the number of people in my neighborhood, but we still look at Finland. And apparently in Finland, children don't do formal schooling for a long time or something. But anyway, so uh, we are at this moment in India, there's a new education policy, and uh, the best thing about the new education policy, which is only 56 pages long, <laughs> is on page seven, it says in a box, which should be translated into every Indian language and put on billboards, it says that if children don't reach a foundational, mm. they say literacy and numeracy, but we'll extend the definition to say, mm. if you don't have strong foundation, by the time you're in grade three, then the rest of the policy is irrelevant. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we feel, you must clap. Yeah, this is fantastic. <laughs> this is fantastic. Because this is now written in policy. Now the question is, when will this policy become practice? And that's why I think the, the, the big opportunity in front of everybody in India, that the age three to eight should be seen as a continuum mm. and not broken by when are you in formal school and when are you in, mm. you know, before. And in this continuum, we need to think hard about a breadth of skills. So prevent the schoolification of the early years and the preschoolification of all education, <laughs> including some of the things that uh, yeah. Susan has been talking about. Mm -hmm. And in that sort of you know, breadth and continuum, bring in the fact that you have a lot of resources in our communities, in our families, in our world to actually help these children grow. Uh, and so much of the work that we've been doing, we work with our early childhood centers. We have that as well as we have pre-primary pre grades in school. But we feel that the mothers of the young children who are in these early age today have been the beneficiaries of the universalization of elementary schooling over the last 10, 15 years. They are no longer the mothers who are completely uneducated or unexposed. Mm -hmm. And therefore, especially after these last couple of years, where the world was turned upside down, and we saw that in families and in communities, a lot of people took charge of what should happen in terms of the education of children. So we are working, wherever we work, we feel that mothers need to be included mm -hmm. as a central part of the child's mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy to hear that even at Stanford, everybody's saying the same thing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> all we need to do is what's happening to the brain of all these people, and then it'll all be fine. Um, and not just mothers and children as you know pairs, but we find a great deal of strength coming from groups mm -hmm. of these. So in, during COVID, we learned a lot during COVID when movement was difficult, that in your immediate neighborhood, moms and children and each other, they're all friends, mm -hmm. or at least they are together. And therefore, how can you organize these groups on a regular basis Almost, I would say, not as institutional as going to school at a certain time and coming out, but how do you get groups of mothers mm -hmm. to actually interact with each other mm -hmm. and with each other's children on a regular basis, doing activities which include play, mm -hmm. which include uh, physical activity, which include doing a lot of different cognitive activities, but with like, you know, vegetables around you or the materials that you see right. and so on. And a little, small little, studies that we've done, even calling it a study may be going too far, is we find that some of the inequalities of lack of, let's say, cell phone, lack of um, uh, you know, other kinds of economic uh, assets, lack of education seems to be ameliorated in right. when you're part of a group. Yes. Mm. And therefore, we believe strongly that this, and for many reasons, yeah, knowing how to work as a group mm -hmm. is advantages as you go forward in life. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. So I'm wonderful. not sure I answered what you asked, but you, you did a wonderful job. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, we want to energize this panel and mm -hmm. our discussion by having you weigh in and ask your questions. There are four microphones, and I'll keep an eye on them to uh, introduce you and allow you to ask questions. And while you get your thoughts together and get to the microphone, so it looks like we've got people already. Let's start with something from the audience. I'll start over here. Uh, go ahead with your. Oh, you don't have one. All right. <laughs> How about, are we over here? Do we, are we ready over there? Not yet. All right. Here? OK. Uh, let me start with something that's come from online. This is from Brent. What role does teacher education play in disability inclusive sustainable development? And how can we be more intentional about infusing disability studies and social justice into this work? Anyone? grab hold of that one? I mean, I can start by saying one of the things that the early brain science is showing us is how malleable, how plastic the child's brain is. I mean, it does tell us that no matter how children come into this world, this phenomenal learning that we see in all children gives you the hope that even with disabilities, that uh, environmental um, interventions that are research-based can do a lot to change that construction of the brain, which is so rapidly um, happening in that early period. It gives you much more of a feeling of flexibility with regard to, uh, can everyone improve? Everyone can improve. You don't ever give up on, on children with disabilities. I mean, the science is demonstrating that every day. Lisa, do you have yeah, something? Yeah, I would just jump in. I think he's really going to enjoy the next panel, the, the, where yes. the focus is on learning differences. Um, I would say that we have, uh, over time, really changed how we look at learning differences and even shifting some of our language around disabilities versus things mm -hmm. living on spectrums and things like that. Um, so I think there's a, an evolving perspective on that and coming from the field of pediatrics. Um, overall, though, we would say that it's important to advocate uh, for all kids, regardless of their diversity and learning, so that they have equal opportunity. Um, but I mean, that's kind of mother pie, <laughs> mother, you know, apple pie. Um, but I, overall, I think it is definitely a moving, moving field, and something that the next panel is going to dive a lot more into. Agree. Uh, do we have someone at the microphones? Yeah. Two. Two. Where are they? Okay, here we go. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Devin McClorg, and I'm with BRAC. Thank you, Susan, for <laughs> your remarks. Um, I wanted to ask a question about financing, because you know we know that the neuroscience is there. We know that there are economic cases to be made for the importance of early childhood development in terms of the return on investment. But government commitments, whether it's here in the United States or in Tanzania or, or Bangladesh, where we also work, are the, the budgets are so um, constrained in terms of what they can actually put in um, to be able to invest widely in early childhood development. So what can you know the leading minds on the stage right now um, offer the rest of us to be thinking about about how to influence policymakers to really put the money behind this important area of work? Yeah. I can take Go that. Uh, Devon, thank you so much for that question. And I'll just give an example of Tanzania. Basically, um, we have developed a national multi-sectoral ECD plan that runs for five years. In fact, it's one of its kind, uh, apart from South Africa and Tanzania and Africa. Those are only the two countries that have that uh, plan. And what we are doing through our Tanzania Early Childhood Development Network is trying um, to ask the government to at least uh, invest 10% of their budgets we are pushing, we are advocating for that to support early childhood development activities. I know with governments, their priorities are in other sectors and they've forgotten everything about early childhood development. So we as uh, practitioners, as educators, we have joined forces and we are pushing the government to invest at least 10% of their budgets in uh, early childhood development. Mm -hmm. uh, Minute, go ahead. So if I can add, it's not just how much money, but how you spend it. Yes. And where this money comes from and who owns it. I think all of these things are important if we are going to really put the, you know, the bang behind the buck. Um, if you think about it, uh, you know, while these policies and budgets, and especially now when maybe a recession is coming, 
um, you know, in many cases, I think the financial climate is also a shock to the, to, to, to the system. We have to really rev up what are the kinds of resources and know-how that are available in local communities that can at least, you know, ensure that this basic foundation gets built. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that money is not important. Money is important. But I think that if this is not done well, any money spent later is a waste. Right. And I think this is a message that needs to go out very loud and strong. You know, the first thousand days, the next thousand days, and I think there is research from around the world, but sometimes you also need that kind of research in the local community. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's not enough for me to say there are many Head Start studies. Mm -hmm. I know oh, that's America. Yeah. You know, there's not enough to say in my own country, Kerala has studied, oh, well, that's Kerala. You need, I think, pieces of evidence that can be produced in a systematic way, but also make this case. Mm -hmm. And who asks for this budget increase? My big hope for India is that these groups of mothers are going to demand mm -hmm. more and more. Exactly. And mm -hmm. therefore, if you have that, because they've been part of the journey, mm -hmm. not because they've been outside it. Right. So I think this right. question of how much money and how we spend it, who asks for it, is really important and needs mm -hmm. to be looked at at every level. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I think that's an excellent point. This Go also ahead, reminds me of a question or a discussion I had with Dan Schwartz when I first came to Stanford about like what we're trying to put together education and neuroscience. Can you tell me exactly how that's going to lead to like an improvement for either one? And I'm like, yeah, no, not really. I, but I, I have a sense that, and Dan and I both shared the sense that there's going to be some surprising things that come out of this. And I think that one of the most surprising things that might come out of this that might speak right to this question about economics and how do, how do we as a people you know, provide funding for high quality early childhood that builds resistance in children, high quality education that builds these foundational skills that if not reached by a certain age is likely to have you know, catastrophic effects. And being here at Stanford, there's a lot of crosstalk across different uh, schools and disciplines, and one very powerful idea has kind of grabbed me recently. Early childhood support and early childhood education are actually a foundational public health issue. They are tremendous mediators and moderators of public health. We're starting to see in many, many ways the, the education level that somebody obtains has a huge impact on how they can advocate for themselves being a healthy person, how long they live, we're seeing surprising things that like, wow, your years of successful education are a neuroprotective factor as you enter the, the scary years beyond 70, right? When the human brain starts to come unraveled, well, the way you put it together and support it, it has a huge impact on how it unravels and anybody who's remodeled a house knows that. <laughs> and I, I just, I really think that as we start to really think about the most powerful modulators, we can come back to this question that we started with. How is education a force that can be transformative for the things that humans care most about? We all care about human health. Everybody, every child, every aging grandparent, everybody in between trying to take care of both of them. We all care deeply about human health. It's a fundamental human preoccupation, which is pro-social and great and everything. We're now starting to realize the evidence when you connect these two things powerfully with the brain science, you get to see if we look at the impact that you're having, it's great, you got happy kids, what's the big deal? If we do a brain scan on these happy kids two to three decades later, some of the new evidence that's coming out from small samples is suggesting that there's a profound impact on the cortical thickness in the frontal areas and in the regions of the brain that control fundamental conflict and decision making, like executive function. So I think that connecting this issue not beyond like what do mothers advocate for and how, or how do we spend our education dollars more wisely or more effectively, mm -hmm. we really need to start to produce the most profound evidence that early childhood care and early childhood education are profound modulators on what we care about most, including human health. Okay, let's move on to another question. Go ahead. Maria Brendelmeyer with uh, Building Evidence in Education and the GIP panel. Uh, so my question is, uh, we've heard a lot of kind of small pieces of evidence that we have. How can we encourage more evidence uh, that look at the long-term effect of ECD and kind of longitudinal studies or whatever that is, but also how can we encourage 
more collaboration between the different ministries that are responsible mm -hmm. throughout the life of a child since you know that sometimes changes you know when the child is in early childhood development versus uh, school mm -hmm. mm. I can just start with that one. I mean, I think that there has been a disconnect between the early period and the school age years, and it would be so much better if we thought of it being a seamless mm -hmm. pipeline mm -hmm. like from primarily <coughs> informal learning. I mean, all of child, early childhood is informal learning into the more informal and formal learning that is presented by school. Mm -hmm. And this disconnect doesn't do anyone, the parents no. nor the children, uh, any good. Um, I think that the more we can present the evidence that comes for, not only from brain studies, behavioral studies, from communities all mm -hmm. over the world, I think the evidence that's being produced mm -hmm. in countries, in Bangladesh, in Tanzania, is very powerful to people because they see it as almost the same things that we're talking about in the United States are taking place there, the same issues, the same mm. mother-father concerns about their children and their involvement in the solutions to those problems. I think it's very convincing. And I think, Rukmini, what you said about, you know, it's gonna be the mothers demanding. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked at three White Houses, the Clintons, the Bushes, and, and the Obamas. And in every case, the presidents and their wives, the first ladies, were totally convinced about the power of early learning. Mm -hmm. And I was convinced, leaving those White Houses, that it was mm -hmm. solved. <laughs> it, it, we weren't close. <laughs> that was my naivete. Mm -hmm. and, but in each case, Congress couldn't be moved, even though there was a lot of head nodding at all the research and science as early as 1997. And so what is going to move the needle? We can all debate that. But I think the parents. Once they understand the power they have and their children have, if we are helping them, um, providing them with these experiences, are going to be the ones moving the needle. Can I, can I um, yeah. take, because I know a little bit about where Maria is also coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, the, one is that the really what is considered to be research is often, uh, you yeah. know, rightly uh, determined by standards of the Western university and publishing world. And so, you know, to be considered a piece of evidence that can go into mm -hmm. the kinds of reports that, uh, you know, are being put together, the global evidence. Uh, firstly, you need a lot of more cross-fertilization of the rigorous researchers based on whatever definition of research and people who are in uh, doing interesting work around the world. And I think one of the outstanding things about the Yidan Prize yes. is that you value them both. Mm -hmm. And hopefully some of that will you know, right. connect to each other. But I also think that studies which are being done in multiple contexts also add value to these kinds of um, you know, points. We've been involved with a long series uh, with Esther Duflo and Liz Pelke, mm -hmm. uh, where they're looking at what is the uh, you know, pre-math uh, right. kinds of abilities that children mm. have. And one of the most shocking things that, shock, like shocking is a bad word. You know, what is surprising. a good shock? Yes, surprising, surprising things, surprising. promising things that we found is uh, they did a study in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I don't know with what kind of population, but whatever it is, is vastly different from the rural, from the urban slum population in Delhi. And they found that the, uh, the distribution of innate ability of various kinds of pre-math stuff was very it's similar. Exactly. But when they go to school, our kids seem to get left behind in yeah. some way, which points to the fact that it is what the school does to this innate ability. Mm -hmm. Rather than build on it, we are sort of sidetracking it and going into something else. So I think these multi-context mm. studies, I think also add a great deal, both to researchers you know, doing this kind of research in multiple places, but also challenging some of the, you know, that if you come from a uh, low resourced environment, mm -hmm. you're going to have deep disadvantage, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I do believe is true. But here comes a study which says the innate ability distribution is not different. Mm -hmm. So I think that these are the kinds of things which right. are, you know, but if, I, if we all had to wait for Esther Duflo to come and do the study, it would take a long time. <laughs> well, so. <laughs> so we have to do it always and yeah. everywhere in every community. Let's, let's go back here. Uh, hi, my name is Aman. I have a question for Dr. Banerjee. So um, I was wondering if you think uh, getting groups of teachers to share their knowledge and ideas with each other could have similar effects to the ones you described of getting uh, 
groups of parents together in a community? I mean, I can only speak for India. Uh, maybe the others can speak for other places. So I think our teachers, especially the teachers of first grade, are really important mm. because that is the often for children the first time you've been in a institutional learning environment. Now, most schools, at least the government schools in India, nobody wants to teach first grade because it's like the toughest grade to teach. Mm. So usually the most junior teachers are there. Now, if it's so, and you have a curriculum that has been famously described as over ambitious right from the beginning. So therefore, I think that you know, there is a lot of scope for sharing good practices across the board. But I think in many cases, except for very outstanding teachers, the first grade teachers, at least in India, sharing practices, I think they'll share a lot of challenges and a lot of frustrations about how this needs to be opened up. Very often, we have a whole system in India for early childhood. Uh, it's called the Integrated Child Development Scheme, which does health, nutrition, and early childhood education. Hmm. Often, the main worker there, who may not be highly trained or educated, but is very connected to the community, can offer um, you know, insights. But the formally trained teacher and this in, you know, less trained sort of community worker don't have a place to meet. Mm -hmm. So sharing is a good idea. Who and where and how I think needs to be worked on probably varied across uh, the different contexts even in which we work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the extent to which the grassroots, you know, the people in the community have to partner mm -hmm. with the teachers too and the parents to help bring this about. And because this common understanding of what yeah. the potential is and the joy in, in learning that children have is, is something that people can get behind, understand, and then demand. See, that's what children deserve. So here's a question online before we get another person lined up uh, that I think will sort of, it, it brings out an essential tension. How do we balance a student's attraction to technology and entertainment and curricular-based learning? Uh, most students enjoy entertainment-based learning. Can we make our curriculum more interesting for our students? Sort of underscoring the importance of motivation, motivation as a driver of learning. What do we think about that, that tension between those two? I mean, not, uh, technology isn't, isn't everything that motivates. Te children are motivated by being with each other. We can see during the pandemic that children missed being with each other and playing and interacting and feeding off of each other. And so it isn't just technology that excites them. Kids are excited by being with each other. But I do agree that this push and pull about technology is there in the early period as well. It wasn't maybe, it certainly wasn't a decade ago, mm -hmm. but it is mm -hmm. now. The number of parents, at least in America, and I don't know if that's true across the world, the number of parents who take a device and shove it in front of their children, when you see American restaurants with parents and a couple of kids and everybody's got a device, yes. and instead of talking mm -hmm. to one another, they're all working their devices, it's pretty shocking to see that. Do, any, any thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, this is where I really appreciate the contribution of, of the neuroscientists. Um, back when I started, there was a, a lot of push around baby Einstein and yes. some of these um, kind of video enhanced uh, ways to interact with kids. And um, some studies pretty quickly came out. They had put you know, EEG wires on kids' heads. You can really watch their brain waves. And um, they could see that when a child was interacting with a parent, the thing was going crazy because the child's brain was really firing. And when you put it in front of a screen, it just went, <laughs> it just flattened out. <laughs> and it would move again if something on the screen moved. So it was visual cues that the brain would track. But other than that, it wasn't getting language, it wasn't anything. And so that data was so important for us to say what your child needs is blank, uh, which is you know, interaction, shared reading, things like this. And um, our American Academy of Pediatrics has come out with guidelines about limiting screens um, yes. to zero uh, before the age of two, um, and then you know, only in shared situations above that. Um, as, as this came up a little bit in our last panel, I think that uh, technology is one of the four components uh, Dan alluded to as an opportunity for disruption, is that it's not all bad. And I think that while right. we have to let the science guide us and set some guidelines, I think it opens incredible connectivity opportunities for us. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're really interested in is disrupting in pediatrics and becoming a part of your early childhood mm -hmm. system. 
because we see all the children zero to five. We see them repeatedly over and over again. The kids who aren't necessarily in a play group or is, aren't getting into the, the head starts and other settings. Um, they are coming to the pediatrician, so how can we leverage that connectivity to the caregiver through technology mm -hmm. to promote more interaction? And I've uh, really enjoyed collaborating in the GSC with Dr. Susanna Loeb, who uh, was also mentioned this morning in a texting intervention that, that she has deployed to parents to help caregivers um, promote interaction with their children, and she's shown incredible promise with that. And, so I met with her and said, hey, I'm interested in this and doing this in, in our clinic. And, and she said, oh, your clinic, it's, you know, I said, yeah, it's a you know, Medicaid public clinic. And she said, I've already shown that it works. I've shown that it works in those kids. And I said, yeah, but you're looking at kids who are in preschool. I'm worried about the kids who never get to preschool. Mm -hmm. And she yeah. said, we have a really hard time finding them. Mm -hmm. And I said, Suze, that's all I bring to this party. They come in to me over and over and over <laughs> they again. Are. They trust me. I have their real phone number. They give me their real phone yeah. number. Yeah. We're texting them. <laughs> Don't forget your appointment. Don't forget to pick up your prescription. I could be texting them, talk about the color red today. Point yeah. out in the grocery store the letter, your child's, the letter of your child's first name, right? Yeah. So, so good. we've been able to do this. And so to me, the texting, instead of seeing a child at three and three and a half and four, instead now my parents can hear from me Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, yeah. Friday, for weeks between our appointments. And that's yeah. something that we've done and shown a huge jump in literacy gains for the children. So I think we need to be really careful with technology and I think it offers us incredible opportunities uh, to reach some of the most difficult to reach folks. Right. Yeah. I just Susan, yeah, I just want to contribute also. I know we have to be very careful with uh, technology but during the pandemic, um, like schools in Tanzania were closed for almost four or five months, and the only way that we could actually continue, uh, you know, sim to stimulating the children was through the radio play labs. So we worked uh, with the radio play labs whereby uh, the curriculum could be delivered uh, with our play leaders to the, the radio, and the something. children and parents could sit together and be able to follow up with the, social, uh, with, with, with the radio play labs. So this is, was one way of interaction. So technology really, even though it's disruptive, but in other contexts, especially in the context of the African you know, culture, in rural settings, it is important right. through the radio play labs. Rukmini, go ahead. So I wish we could have a place where all these different uh, interesting ideas could be uh, seen together. We've been sending out uh, uh, audio little stories, like a one minute story that can then be discussed. and. Uh, you know, somewhat open-ended story. Just recently, there was a little story about your first tooth falling, which is a universal experience if you have teeth, which <laughs> most people have. And then that's always also a very exciting experience because, you know, although you know it's happened to others, when it happens to you, it's signaling that you're of a certain age. So it was a little story about this. And we encouraged uh, children to say, get back to us. And the technology that we were using, which was sending the story out did not have a way for the stories to come back. Right. But kids found ways to send audio, video, mm. little pictures of what they did when their tooth fell out and who said what. And I'm sure in that sending, there was a lot of activity around them that made them you know, kind of formulate yeah. what they were going okay. to say. So what are technologies that can encourage these yeah. kinds yes. of things, right. I think is... Right, you know, right, and, yeah. and arm the parents with mm. information yes. that yes. Yes. is yeah. at their fingertips. Let's go to the person over here at the microphone. Thank you. My name's Dorothy Gordon, and I think you've just put it correctly. How do we get the information out to parents? Everything you're saying here is very interesting. If you're in the field, and you've been following, you're aware of it, but there's this huge gap between that and the knowledge mm -hmm. of parents. And what do we do as a society? Is this something we should be teaching people at the high school level, mm. that they have to prepare to be able to do this for their children? Mm. And I'm a little bit alarmed by the conversation which seems to be leaving men out. Mm. You know, Rukmini, you talk about mothers. Are there no fathers? <laughs> is there a difference in the kind of pattern you see when a man interacts with a child as mm. opposed to a woman? Yeah. Uh, do share and tell us. But I think that we've been trying to move from a situation where 
women are seen as the exclusive caregivers right. to having a more inclusive kind of approach. Mm. And I'm not seeing that happen here. Mm. <laughs> well, these four powerful Very good women, point. world changers allowed me to join them, so I feel honored by that <laughs> as a man. <laughs> I think, let me address your last point first. The study of fathers is now finally uh, increasing, at least in, in the United States. There are quite a few studies looking at how fathers talk to their children. It's not just motheries or par it's parenties, it's fatheries. The, and in the two-person neuroscience studies we're doing, we're comparing mothers and fathers. And not only looking at their, their two brains while they interact, but looking at their parent-child interaction. And very interesting differences so far. This is a pretty small sample because we've just gotten back up after the pandemic. The, the babies are crying less when their fathers are the ones interacting with them. Now, you know, uh, wh mm. what's that about? I have not, I don't, I don't really know. Um, but I think we are going to see differences between uh, the parenting styles and practices of men versus women, and it might relate to the d amount of time the fathers are spending with the children. But you're right to mention that mm -hmm. we need to bring both parents into the equation, and also the diversity of family structure all over the world. Uh, two parents of the same gender, uh, you know, the, uh, raising children, two mm -hmm. women, two men. We need to look at how the, the practices of parenting uh, alter behavior and alter the brain, or not. And so I think that's important. And, and then I'll make one last point. We do need to start in high school. Maybe we need to start in middle school, telling people about their brains, about mm -hmm. how we, every experience we have alters our brains all our lives, and that when we raise children, we're growing those brains. I think that the populace, at least again in the United States, is very unaware of the power of we, the, meaning the collective we, mm -hmm. in raising the, the children. And when parents, regardless of social class, understand the power that they have, there's a great pleasure in understanding that everyday activities are what's building that brain and that every baby's capable and every parent is capable of those interactions. But I do agree, we need to start way in early in development to convince people that brains are plastic and at every age. And if I could just add on to that, I think you know this question about how do we get this out into the current collective understanding for, of parents about what's going on with their child, how do they conceive of these developments, how do they conceive of these causal forces that are surrounding their child and helping develop their brain, I think it's really important that we start to break down the huge division and handoff between med and ed, right? First six, five years, your major interaction as a parent is with a pediatrician who's yeah. like, is your child, how are they doing on the growth chart? You know, how's their weight? How's their blood pressure? That's great. And then there's this handoff at age five where it's like now the ed, the school. It's like, well, how are they doing in math and how are they doing in reading? And they're really kind of divorced from this notion of like, how are they developing as a thriving, flourishing human being who's engaging in their education even more and more every single year? And the pediatrician is not really engaging in the parents with like, how are things developing for the child? How is the child developing all of these precursor skills that are foundational for their future education? And as we start to collaborate, as we start to create really serious interdisciplinary work across med and ed, we can start to use the neuroscience as a kind of connective tissue to start to really understand and educate you know, our pediatricians who are like the first point of contact for most parents every single year as the child's developing and then every single crisis moment when they, you know, if the tooth doesn't just fall out but they <laughs> hit it against it as many parents know, you go to the pediatrician, they're your, the most, most trusted source of your child's health and development I think that we can combine these things. And Stanford University did something quite radical uh, just about two, three, three and a half years ago. They actually created a position for a, a very, very um, interesting and ambitious young researcher that was half in the medical school in the field of pediatrics and half in the graduate school of education. And it's actually bringing these two schools together in really novel ways and speaking to large populations of pediatricians about what we're learning about the fantastic changes that can happen in a child with dyslexia if they go and work with a really, really talented tutor who's engaging in all of these social dynamic processes with the kids and curriculum 
and watching the changes that are occurring in the brain, as well as talking to educators about, wow, we can see this. Even the children that education suggested that they had the most difficult time overcoming and reorganizing their brain for reading, they're able to see these plastic changes occurring using these techniques. So I think that coming together and not trying to silo this out where, you know, this group of people should be talking to the mothers during the first five years and mm -hmm. this group of people mm -hmm. should be just talking to everybody six and up and they shouldn't be talking to each other. I think if we work together, we can really start to drive some of these powerful great changes. Idea. I, I want to move to the last uh, question here at the microphone. I don't, yeah. But I have to answer Dorothy about why I said mothers. Okay, all right, <laughs> we will come back to you in a minute. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Allison. Um, my question is directed towards Susan and Rukmini, I think. Um, so I'm curious about, um, in the landscape of programmatic intervention, um, research priorities are often impact evaluation or process evaluation, cost-benefit analysis, scalability. Um, and I'm curious about, specifically in protracted crisis settings, how research can effectively do this when the nature of the issue is at once dynamic, but also, um, and, and ever-changing, but also um, longitudinal. Um, and furthermore, I'm curious about um, the next a separate question. Um, how can we evaluate emotional support and things that are amorphous in nature um, and what are the best data collection methods for, for doing so um, and providing immediate or ongoing feedback? Sorry, that's a lot. Don't, don't, that's a you lot. don't have to answer. <laughs> Susan, do you want to start or Rukmini? Rukmini, thank you for that. I'm still thinking about her. Go, you go <laughs> ahead and talk about <laughs> parents if you want to. No, I, I mean, I think that, you know, before getting to impact evaluation or, uh, you know, process evaluation, to me and to some of the work that we've done, uh, a lens of you know what is it that we really want to look at, and maybe the short word for that is measurement. Deciding what is important, how do we decide that, how to develop a common vocabulary for looking at something. I think these are all things that you know um, sort of step one, step two about measurement is not so much about data collection or impact evaluation as really trying to together across, you know, whatever set of people, understanding the problem in a way that I can communicate to everyone. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is an important one. And, you know, it will obviously be different in different contexts. But if a group of people, whether it's across projects, across communities, cannot come up with the same way of talking about it, then it's difficult to move, okay. you know, ahead. Um, and then I think that how do we build that into common conversations? You know, uh, how is your child doing? Now the pediatrician has a particular way of answering that. Uh, is your child happy? It means many different things to many different people. So it just seems like around some of these, having common conversations and agreeing on how to express this is the beginning point, which can then lead to more, you know, systematic stuff. Very often, impact evaluations are dropped onto a project which is just beginning where you haven't had the opportunity to develop these. I had one incident, I remember we had a McKinsey group, with no offense to any McKinsey person in this room, who said that you know, we were running 3,500 3, early childhood centers, and clearly metrics were required because how do you know, how performance evaluation and whatnot. And so they came up with a couple of you know, quite sensible metrics, and at the same time, we had about 100 instructors of those centers, and we asked them, how would, if you had to go and look at others, what would you do? And you know, 75% of these metrics were common. Mm -hmm. And yet when the group that developed these, uh, you know, took it out, they felt it was their own metrics, and they had come to it because they had discussed it. And so I think that this whole area of measurement and assessment mm -hmm. can be a great place to start to work together. Right, I agree. No, we're running out of time, and I want you to return to, to, to mothers, <laughs> yeah. and we'll end on parents. And, and there's a so, question about parents and how burdened they are with everything they are trying to do. How can we, you know, put more pressure on them by saying, you're the brain builder here. Mm -hmm. no, Go for yeah. it. I, I want to assure but, uh, Dorothy that yeah. fathers are absolutely important, equally important. 
But in our context, the young mother of one, usually not one child, but two young children, is often the lowest in the totem pole in their family. Mm. They are the main source of labor for household chores. They are not regarded as a resource other than take care of your child and you know deal with it. And therefore, these whole thing about coming together as a group, thinking that you are one of the people who are actually going to be a pillar for your child, mm. is actually very empowering. Right. And so, but it is true that this is not to leave the fathers out. But this group of women coming together to feel like we together can do a lot, I think does a lot for the hierarchy in the community and in the family. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of mother-in-laws who are very upset with me, but why are you taking <laughs> her out of the house mm -hmm. exactly at the time when lunch needs to be cooked? And the young mother saying, I have to go to a meeting. Right, right. Oh exactly. Yeah. Well, I maybe, we end, that, that, uh, maybe oh. we end on this idea <laughs> that we empower mm -hmm. the parents by respecting them more, mm -hmm. by giving them this role and helping them understand mm -hmm. in their communities the vast importance that parents, both of them, have in raising these children. And if we could do that, perhaps that would move the needle substantially. Perfect. Lisa, I will turn it to you. No, no, that <laughs> sounds, it sounds great. Well, I um, switch hats and yes. do my other role. Um, I will just say that uh, I think I'm really hearing how culturally sensitive it is, yes. and, or, or different it is uh, in a lot of, for a lot of my patients, it's grandparents uh, who play a really important role. So we tend to use the word caregiver. Um, to I, you know, really respect the, the primary people. So, um, okay. So, thank you so much, Pat, and all the panelists, and thank you to me uh, for our inspiring remarks. Uh, so, it's really exciting. Obviously, a passion of mine to think of how we can do this transdisciplinary work, how we can bring the different sectors together, how we can learn uh, from people who are clearly leading uh, in so many different ways. So, thank you very much. Um, okay, as we switch gears to our next panel, um, I know this is a scientific fact that about an hour and a half after lunch, you're feeling really kind of low. So everyone stand up. We're going to do a little, like, uh, do some stretching, wiggle around a little bit, let our panelists exit and uh, do some stage transitions here just for a minute. Okay. Dean Schwartz says now. Now is the time. Don't worry, we have a break after this, so we'll be able to uh, connect and talk more soon. Um, so it is now my pleasure to introduce to you our next panel that will be chaired by Charlotte McLean in, Cla in Claupeau, who will moderate our panel on learning differences. Very few people can claim the depth of experience and knowledge of disability inclusive development around the world that Charlotte has. She has served as a human rights commissioner in South Africa and an advisor on disability and development for the United States Agency for International Development and the World Bank. She is the go-to person for issues from healthcare to infrastructure, but has a special passion for ensuring the right to quality education. And we are very honored to have her with us today to help facilitate this critical conversation. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that warm welcome and, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Charlotte McLean in Klapo and I'm the Global Disability Advisor at the World Bank Group. And I Mark. really am truly delighted to be able to moderate the, uh, the session on learning difference, improving opportunities for children with diverse learning needs to participate fully in learning and in life. So this session will explore neurodiversity disability and human capital in the context of Charlotte speaking. learning. Judy, we can oh hear God. you. Judy, can you hear me? I don't know what she's saying. I think we might be having a technical issue with Judy. Judy, can you hear me? No. Is the captioning working? Judy, we can hear you okay, but it doesn't sound as if you can hear me. Okay, let me carry on and I'll come back to you. So this session, as I said, will explore both neurodiversity, disability, and hu human capital in the context of learning and ultimately how we build inclusive societies in which we leave no one behind. So we know that globally, 
a disproportionate number of children with disabilities, migrant children, displaced children are not in school. And we also know that even when they are in school, they're often not learning. And so today, what we will do is hear about some of the advancements that have been made in the policy sphere. We will also hear about some of the lack of support that exists, some of the necessary accommodations that are needed, the issues around policy implementation that contribute to disabling learning. We will also hear about these constraints and some of the systemic barriers that Jonathan spoke about earlier this morning that keep children with disabilities from learning alongside their non-disabled peers and, and, and understanding that it really varies across the globe. So again, I have the greatest privilege to moderate this fantastic panel of experts, and I'd like to get started with some questions. But before I do that, I would like to go, starting with Judy, and have you introduce yourself, your name, and where you come from, and just a little bit about yourself. So Judy, if you can hear me, over to you. Hello, everybody. Sorry I'm not with you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. OK. Um, so I had polio in 1949. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, at a time when there weren't any pieces of legislation. So my experiences over the course of my life have been significantly focused in education advocacy as well as disability rights advocacy in the United States and abroad. I have about 25 years of experience in nonprofits, and I worked in the Clinton and Obama administrations and also at the World Bank. Uh, thanks, Judy. That's a very modest introduction of yourself, but um, we'll let it be. Uh, um, Hello everyone, I'm Usha Goswami and I'm director of the Centre for Neuroscience in Education at the University of Cambridge in England. And I'm interested in individual differences in how children learn to read. Because when I trained as a primary school teacher, in my classroom I could see big differences in the way children approached the task of reading. And I became interested in the underlying reasons for those differences, which is why I am trying to use neuroscience to look at the basis in the brain for the individual differences in the way children both require spoken language and then they acquire language when it's written down in reading. Dennis. Hi, I'm Dennis Wall. I'm a professor of pediatrics and biomedical data science here at Stanford. I'm very interested in identifying forms of autism and developing novel technologies to enable earlier detection and earlier activation of treatment for reasons related to the fact that treatment itself can, if delivered early, make very, very strong differences that are positive in children. And today, in, in this world that we live, we're not diagnosing early enough, and most kids are not receiving that kind of therapeutic benefit. So that's been a focus. I'll get into that when we, we go into the session. Great. Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Kozlowski, and I direct the Learning Differences Initiative here in the Graduate School of Education, which is a, an investment from the Graduate School of Education in interdisciplinary research on uh, children with learning differences. And I've had the incredible good fortune to be here while we hired five new faculty, all representing different kinds of expertise from artificial intelligence to neuroscience in our own um, initiative. And it has sparked incredible um, interdisciplinary thinking and also interdisciplinary research since we've been here in a number of venues. And uh, the kinds of things that we're learning are embodied in the discussions that I've already heard today. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sheena Skelton. I'm the Director of Operations for the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. We are one of four federally funded equity assistance centers designed to work specifically with public K-12 education systems around issues of equity, uh, ensuring that the civil rights of students are protected, and inclusive practices. Um, our specific center is located in Indi uh, Indianapolis University and Purdue University, Indianapolis. We work with a 13-state region 
and we work with practitioners ranging from early childhood settings. So I was really interested in the panel uh, just before us um, to uh, post-secondary experiences. Very excited to be with you all this afternoon. Thank you. So great, an absolutely fantastic um, panel. And maybe to get started, I'll go straight to Judy. And, and Judy, if you could talk to us about, in your lifetime, how has the educational experience of children with disabilities evolved? That's the one part. And then the second part is, what are some of your hopes for the future? Looking forward, what are we looking for? What are you looking towards? Thank you very much. Um, well, it's fair to say that in my lifetime, on the one hand, we've seen some very dramatic changes. Uh, specifically that, as I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, when I had polio, there was no right to education for disabled children. So in the United States at that point, when we finally um, got two pieces of legislation, one in 1973 called Section 504, which prohibits discrimination against someone uh, who has a disability if the entity is getting money from the federal government. So that covered every aspect of education, plus many other areas. And then in 1975, with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So the passage is passage of those pieces of legislation as an example, I think uh, were very important because basically meant that the case had to be made that a discrimination did exist against disabled people we're talking right now in the area of education and b that the government under IDEA was committed to putting funding in and money into research and many other areas to help ensure that the reasons why state and local governments were saying they were not educating disabled children because of lack of funding would in part be removed. So we have seen in the US over these many decades that children are by and large in school, although I would argue that for poor and minority kids who have emotional disabilities that the suspension, expulsion, rate is disproportionate. When we look at the issue of uh, youth in juvenile facilities, a substantial number, 50 to 70% of the youth in those facilities have disabilities, have not been receiving appropriate educations. But we have parent organizations that have become much more influential and <laughs> increasing funds at the federal level. And I would say, universities do many not all doing a better job on teacher training uh, to ensure that we're producing a more qualified population of teachers to enter the classroom clearly the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities article 24 has been very very important in elevating the discussion of education um, to countries all around the world enabling the voices of disabled people who had experienced discrimination themselves and who are fighting for the right for children to receive education has very much benefited the overall discussion. But I think as you were saying briefly earlier, Charlotte, uh, for me, it is still pretty tragic that we have not seen, I think really in wealthier or poorer countries, the changes that I believe we should have been able to see at this point. And I think it's really because the commitment of education authorities to education of disabled children is still not where it needs to be. And there are too many families. I mean, there's still too much going on where there needs to be aggressive action on the part of families to be getting children the services that they have a right to. Um, my, my hope for the future is that work like Elizabeth has been doing, um, thank you Elizabeth for everything that you do, uh, which in my view is both identifying 
problems that continue to exist, as well as um, moving forward at the university level to be doing more work to prepare a more educated population of people to work in the fields of education. But I still too frequently um, am not hearing leading educators include the issue of education for disabled children right. in the same way that discussions are happening for other populations. And right. until that can really happen, we're not going to see the systemic changes that we need in any country. No, Judy, thank you very much for that. And, and we'll come back to you. Now I'd like to go to Usha. And Usha, we've heard a lot about um, neuroscience, yeah. the brain. Um, how is this really changing the way we understand? And, and, and how is it shaping responses to the variety of ways in which we can learn? If you could talk to us about that, yeah. that would be great. Well, I think where neuroscience can make a big difference is in helping us understanding how differences in children's sensory systems cause differences in their cognitive systems. Because all the information that the baby and the young child is learning is coming through their senses. And those senses are helping build cognitive systems like language or memory or attention. So to give the example of my own work in literacy, when you're reading, you're processing speech when it's written down with a visual code. And it turns out to be individual differences in those speech processing skills that determine your learning trajectory, whether you end up um, with a learning difficulty so you can't read very well or whether you don't. And the sensory patterning in the speech signal that is important is to do with rhythm. So the research I've done suggests that children who are diagnosed with dyslexia in many different languages can't hear rhythm patterns in the speech signal very well. It doesn't mean they can't hear them at all, but it means if you have some, uh, I don't know, stress patterning like in words like Aladdin, hospital, these children aren't that clear where the middle stress syllable comes in Aladdin versus hospital, where it might be on the first syllable. And this means that the speech processing system that they develop is different from that of other children. It's a bit like being colorblind. It doesn't mean that you can't see, but it means that if every day at school you had to make decisions about red versus green, you wouldn't be performing as well as other children. So the neuroscience suggests that because this speech processing um, is impaired at the level of rhythm, partly because brain rhythms aren't synchronizing in time with these rhythm structures in language, the way to help these children is not by more and more training in phonics, but to go back to the foundation. The foundation of language is rhythm Based. We know that from baby talk. We know that from the kind of um, studies that P Patricia Cool was talking about, that the more you talked with parentees, the better the learning. These kind of rhythms are harder for these children to learn, so it suggests that we need to emphasize and um, really you know, have more routines to do with rhythmic language in the very early years to make every child able to access literacy. So I think what neuroscience can do is it can show you mechanisms that you maybe weren't aware of. Once you have the mechanism, it doesn't mean you need a neuroscientist in every school, but it means you know how to address through the curriculum or through parental um, practices how to enhance that child's trajectory because that trajectory will go through the whole lifespan and enable your access to the rest of education. Well, that's actually a great segue to Dennis's question, because Dennis, your research focuses on children with autism and children with developmental disabilities. What are you, what are you learning about um, how schools are adapting to better support children to learn differently? Thank you. <clears throat> I'll, st I'll start by describing some of the, the research that I do and how it impacts that question most directly. The work that we've been focused on is leveraging technology to the extent possible to enable artificial intelligence assisted diagnosis of children with autism as early as 18 months. The reason for this, I indicated in my intro, is that the average age of diagnosis for autism today is about five. And so there's this large gap between when we can do it and when we, sh you know, when, we, when we should be doing it and when we are actually doing it. <clears throat> and that gap is important because there is this window of opportunity where educational programming, treatment programming can be very, very impactful for the children. 
to the point where 25% or more might progress to a level where they no longer qualify for an autism diagnosis. So that's motivated me um, in, in how we can move the window from where we are now to where we could be, where we potentially should be. And it turned out that the best way to do it is to try to, to capitalize on opportunities offered through ubiquitous devices, mobile phones, applications, and artificial intelligence. And, and it, it does a few things for us. It moves things outside of the clinical settings and into a more upstream location, maybe in the primary care, empowering physicians like pediatricians who don't particularly do this kind of work to be better at it, better suited for it because they're seeing children in the well-child visits and can detect these, these opportunities to di and, and act on these opportunities to diagnose the children. Diagnosis here gates access to reimbursement for, for, for behavioral therapy, and those behavioral therapies are a form of ed educational programming. A lot of that therapeutic programming takes the form of social interaction training, emotion recognition training, increased willingness to appreciate the salience of emotion and faces that children with autism tend not to have uh, or tend to appreciate. Instead, maybe gravitate towards something that's asocial, like. Uh, like, like, like the solar system with restricted and repetitive interests, it's difficult to extract them from. We figured out ways to move them from where they are after diagnosing, for example, using, again, technology, putting it in the hands of the parents and actually speaking a little bit to the, the panel previously and empowering moms and dads alike, other care providers, to participate almost un unknowingly in, in this sort of educational evolution that's necessary in the earliest windows where it's possible, as children, for example, are moving from parallel play into peer play and beginning to understand their social world, with these kinds of interventions or treatments, we can actually create uh, opportunities to teach children skills to thrive in those social environments. And again, it comes back to technology. I mean, very simple stuff. So Google Glasses, you might be familiar. Um, is, not a, is actually not, not dead. They, they still exist. They can, they, you can still purchase them. And we've experimented with this augmented reality form factor in children as young as three years old, and they will wear these glasses. It's a very lightweight kind of augmented reality form factor with a prism, and it's, it's just easy to ignore in minutes. And the outward-facing camera watches the world around them and, ha and helps them orient a face, appreciate a face, and the differences of the emotion in that, in that face. And as a consequence of that, it unlocks these layers of, of the onion that enable them to grow and, and thrive on their own. Another simple example is, you're probably familiar with the, the Heads Up game by Ellen DeGeneres. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, very, very fun. Played that with my, my own children and thought, well, why, maybe we could potentially turn, it's so fun, very pro-social. It creates this dyad between you know, me and, and my son or me and my, my, my daughter that was so enriching. And we decided we'd try to do that for children with autism, to see if parents and, and child could come together, get excuses in 90 seconds, literally, of gameplay to, to talk about uh, social emotion. And, 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 and that ultimately pays dividends. So to give you an idea of what I mean by that as a clinician, you know, as a, as a person working in the clinical world, we are, we are looking at endpoints that we must use to get things through the FDA, for example. And when we look at those endpoints using these systems, we're changing children in six weeks as much as they would realize that those changes in two years of standard behavioral therapy. Mm. Um, so really important, but what it means is that this interaction between parent and child in the home setting in a natural world might be significantly more effective for, ch for, for education here, where at this point, treatment and education are, all, are, syn are synonyms for me. They, they, they mean the same thing. Yeah, so fascinating. And I'm just, as you were talking, I was thinking, I was glad that you mentioned cell phones because in the countries in which I work, it's really important to be able to have um, low-cost technologies that can be used. So, so that's really very interesting. Um, Sina, I come to you, and I come to you with three questions, or a three-fold question. Um, how do research and policy meet practice? And, and I think that's something that's come up from many of the discussions earlier today. If you could talk a bit about what are the barriers, you know, what are the barriers that you've encountered in promoting change and, and how you've addressed them? Thank you. 
And speaking of cell phones, I'm going to use mine. I have my notes on mine. Use your cell phone. In a way to make sure I want to stay on target. So when we talk about policy, research, and practice, for me, these are the three legs of a stool that really holds up our education system and can drive and sustain inclusive, effective education for all learners. The relationship is reciprocal. These three arenas, research is often used to inform policy, as we know, and we've discussed in earlier panels, and to justify policy decisions. Research also informs our educational practices that are promoted in our schools. Policy provides a parameter, the guardrails, if you will, for our practice, guiding how and what we do. And it is through practice, more specifically the research on those practices, that often ultimately makes its way into policy. It is cyclical and it's mutually influencing cycle. I'm gonna to move to talking a little bit more about the barriers. When it comes to supporting inclusive practices, and centering equity in education systems, we must critically examine what is informing the research that is being conducted and taken up in our policies and informing our practices. Scholars such as Mary Pastis and Lee Patel discuss how today in schools, much of the information used to inform education discourse, priorities, policies and practices is born out of a history of colonization and specifically research originally designed and used to subjugate people from across the world. We must acknowledge this history and be aware of the legacy and the effects on research and educational improvement efforts today. For example, When we engage in research, edu educational research, that stratify and segment students by characteristics or differences, and then deem some of them as normal, quote unquote, and some of them as at risk, and this usually happens along racialized lines and the notions of what is normal or the notions of normalcy, and then design and test interventions to fix them. We are upholding systems built on the notion of white superiority and able-bodiedness. When we promote education research policies and practices that isolates on students' characteristics of differences without examining the marginalizing conditions in which minoritized youth are educated, we are consuming and applying research to leave the system uninterrogated and thus limiting our focus on transformative change towards equity and inclusive practices. These are the barriers that we have to overcome, I think, when we think about policy, practices, and research. Mm -hmm. In my role at the Equity Center, we work with educators as partners and try to interrupt the traditional notion of technical assistance and work with practitioners to examine how we consume and engage research, practice, and policy. We blur the lines between policy and research and practice. We know, and as described by Sutton and Levinson's work, that often policy may not always reflect what is written in policy documents. But instead, policy is what is practiced. It's everyday, moment-to-moment -moment interactions in our classrooms, in our schools, in our districts. We work to involve most, those who are most proximal to the implementation of research and policy, to be a part of the meeting-making process of research and making those policies a contextual fit. I can go on, but I see my time is up, so hopefully during the question, no, we'll but come back. Some, some really important points there, Sina, and I think um, it, you, you kind of amplify um, the mantra of the disability movement that is nothing about us without us. And that really is uh, important in terms of thinking about who's doing the research. And, and, and so that's a really important point that I think came through. So Elizabeth, if you could talk to us about how do schools, which, which are inclusive, benefit all children with learning differences? We've talked a lot today about universality, but how, how does it really, how does it benefit all kids? So um, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2018, I finished, I wrapped up a research project in three states, 
um, where we looked at a set of students with autism and other developmental disabilities um, who were put into two groups. One group was um, a group that received a very high quality literacy program taught in general education classrooms with typical kids. And the other group of students did business as usual as they had done in the previous three years of their schooling experience. And we assessed both sets of kids five times during the course of, an, of a school year on their literacy um, competence and their development. And we found that the group of students that was in general education classrooms with typical peers learning alongside them in literacy practices far outperformed um, the students who were in the business as usual um, setting in self-contained classrooms with, with only with their own peers um, together. And uh, that, that um, RCT experimental design that was funded by the US Department of Ed was one of the first big RCT um, studies that had been done with kids with really significant needs, kids that many of um, that many people um, would say couldn't learn were able to learn and learn fluently. Um, we had a second component to this project, and that was to talk to the students who learned alongside of them, and to talk to the teachers who were in the classrooms where we did this work, to find out what they felt about the experience of being there. Um, and what they learned from that experience. And we came away with some really big ideas about how important it is to create inclusive settings. The students, the typical peers that had welcomed the, the students with disabilities into their classroom said, so-and-so can learn. I just saw him learn. And when I did this, he even learned more, and there was a reciprocity and a relationship that was being developed between the typical kids and the kids that had had up to that point not had those opportunities to be in that classroom. The teachers told us the same thing. They did not believe that these children could learn, and they thought that they were in a place where um, they were best positioned up to that point in a, in a different classroom. What became clear in talking to so many people about what was going on is that um, the opportunity to, to see learning from the point of view of different people helps kids themselves understand their own learning better. They have definitions of learning. They can talk to their teachers about how learning might be set up, not only not only for the students that they, were, that they were being asked about, but also for themselves. And the teachers themselves began to ask questions about what kinds of learning designs they might use in their classrooms to facilitate better and better instruction. The idea that, that Dan introduced at the beginning of this, of, of the, of this day is that when we move from a curriculum focus to a learning focus in classrooms, we expand the opportunity for everybody that's in that classroom to really gr learn and grow in profound ways. And that enhances our capacity as we move into adulthood to be much more accepting of the diversity of, of um, kids and adults who could learn and work side by side in communities. So that is a very profound and important, I think, learning that comes out of understanding and working with learning differences in classrooms. Yeah, and perhaps it's not, um, it doesn't find itself enough in, in policy and research, that precise point, and I think that needs certainly to be amplified. Yeah. Uh, Judy, I wanna come back to you. And if you, you know, you mentioned um, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but generally, how do you think momentum is building in policy, advocacy, and educational um, circles? I mean, as I was saying earlier, I think it goes without saying that the issue of educating children with disability is on most people's plate. And uh, the CRPD, Article 24, certainly has been one of the major driving forces. 
I do believe, as I was saying earlier, that one of the big issues, and in some way Elizabeth was just uh, discussing this, uh, in what you were explaining, Elizabeth, you were saying that the teachers didn't believe these children could learn. And that to me is the fundamental problem. If we believe that a group of people, in this case disabled people, are unable to learn for whatever the reason, then having to convince people that they must bring these children into the classroom and that appropriate instructional training needs to occur, not just for the disabled children, but for the non-disabled children also, that we need to make that leap. And taking policy and putting into practice is what I see as many of our challenges. So the research that Elizabeth is discussing was funded by the Office of Special Education Programs. The question now is, how is that research being disseminated around the country? What is being done to help ensure that what we see clearly through this project is that children learn more effectively, their outcomes are uh, significantly improved. And when you looked at their peer group that was in a different educational setting, their outcomes, I presume, Elizabeth, did not advance. They stayed stagnant like they had previously. How do we take the knowledge that we are gaining and apply it in countries around the world? Right. Because I think the research that you're discussing, Elizabeth, is really applicable in any country. Um, so for me, it's not only the development of good policy, but how do we implement policy? How do we put appropriate funding to ensure that our teacher training schools are in fact ensuring that we are talking about all children. Because the data is out there. Disabled children in regular classes improve learning, non-disabled children benefit. There have been numerous different studies in this regard. But we still have not convinced people that this is the way it should be administrators at state and local levels, whether it's in the U.S. or in another country, local school boards who in many cases are resisting this. And we can see in countries like the U.S. and others where some form of discussion is going on between family and educator about placement of children and services that children need to have that still too frequently the intent of the policy is not being implemented. So, you know, my words on this is that we need to really be insisting, not just in the disability community, but in the field of research and education in general, that when we talk about education, we're talking about all children in education. We're not talking about waiting until non-disabled children succeed in learning and then we'll dip our toe into meaningfully including disabled kids. And we are still too much in the area where we are not requiring that all children are in the least restrictive environment. Judy, thank you for that. I'm now going to open up for questions and please come to the mic if you have any questions. I see a couple of people coming forward. Well. So a lot of the people coming forward are people that are the volunteers, but please, audience, come to the mic. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Karen Wang. I'm a student at the Graduate School of Education. Thank you for a very thought-provoking discussion. Um, my question for our panelists is that the traditional special ed paradigm has viewed neurodiversity students as being this group that needs extra support and help. Um, I want to go back t to a point that made by Jonathan Rosa uh, earlier this morning about the agency of this group of students and uh, the point made by Dr. Carol Dweck about how um, children's own beliefs about, about their ability matters in facilitating their learning. So my question is, how might we help these students understand their unique ability, their unique strengths and assets? And then how do we, through doing this, make them better advocates for their own needs? Great question. Um, I'm looking at the panel. 
can you I can take answer. yours? Sure. Dennis, go for it. I'll give you one example from our own experience in leveraging the Google Glass system with teenagers, not maybe the age demographic you're looking at, but a good one in, in the sense that this, this individual um, would wear the, the, the system. It's a very simple system that teaches emotion, Ekman emotions. She already really knew them, but she didn't have a great deal of confidence that she was reading them right in her friends. And the glasses gave her that confidence, and very shortly she took them off, and that was it. So the point there is simply that this ephemeral education that she received gave her this incredible confidence that the intuition she possessed was correct. And that was a great learning experience for her. Someone answering your question. Another part to the, to the answer is just about uh, the work that we do in the very early levels of developmental learning, especially in social peer interaction groups. Children are collaborative learners and can be collaborative learners, and they, they can do so with neurodiversity without labels. And it's that, it's that collaborative, label-free environment that if we can encourage and foster more, will in the future create adults who already possess those skills. I, yeah, I think another important aspect, so in terms of the brain sciences, is that some of these processes that we're discovering are automatic processes that the brain engages. There's nothing to do with how hard the child is trying. So often when children struggle with literacy, there's this um, idea that they're just not trying hard enough, they need to do more drilling and so on. But actually it's quite empowering for the children in our studies to discover that this is just something your brain is doing a bit differently from everyone else's. So it's nothing intrinsic to your learning abilities, it's to do with how your brain is, is working. So from the point of view of the child then, they feel in, a, in some sense better about themselves because it's not their fault. So the, it's down then to the curriculum and to the teachers to be bringing forward that child in the right ways rather than that it's the child's you know, lack of application. Yeah, I'll yeah, um, add to that, um, and connecting to what you just said in terms of understanding and recognizing that people are different, their brains can function differently, um, and it's not so much so that how we can support students in understanding that, but it's really how can we support the educators in understanding that, right? And then creating learning environments and spaces that acknowledge that, that validates that, that was responsive to, to those differences. Um, and seeing difference is not something to be remediated or something to be cured or something to be, um, uh, uh, you know, worked out of, but really acknowledging that it's different and we can create curricula that is responsive to those differences, that appreciates those differences, and continue to validate and support and empower our students to be themselves and to, and to navigate the world in the way that they navigate the world. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a really important is point. It? Judy, I, I know that you want to come in on this one, please. Yeah, I want to say that, I, I want to continue on what you were just saying. And that is that a disabled child from the age of three, four, and five, who is in a segregated class and being taught on a day-to-day -day basis that they are not equal, it's not their responsibility. Right. Um, they are learning that they are different and they are learning that they are negatively different. That paradigm has got to change so that those children see themselves as equal students with others. Then like other students, they're learning about who they are, respecting their differences and being able to advocate for themselves. But programs where children are either not in school or are in segregated classes or minimally um, in regular classes, it is very difficult for those children to be able to develop the self-esteem that they need because they're likewise being treated this way in the broader community. So the burden should not be put on the students. The burden needs to be put on the educational system. Yeah, point well taken, Judy, on that. And I'd like to go to a question that's come, um, that's come virtually. And the question is, are there effective strategies for getting research into the hands of policymakers 
to create more effective policies. Now, many of you on the panel work in the sphere of research. Any ideas around that? I'm looking at you, Elizabeth. Well, there, you know, a lot of there are a lot of uh, things that we need to do. One of them is to believe in the power of education for policymakers. Um, that these dialogues about um, the structures that exist, the data that we already have about the um, effects of the, the system of education that we have that was born out of people trying to fit the model of education that they understood when 94-142, the um, original uh, disabilities, in, individual with Disabilities Education Act was passed, school districts created structures in order to get to actually install the things they needed to install to be in compliance with the law. The, the name of the game continues to be in compliance with the law. Um, a huge percentage of funding here in California goes to le the legal costs of families having to advocate for services for their students through the legal system um, in order to, to basically ask for accommodations and modifications to the structures that we have when what we could do is to learn what we know, to use what we know from the learning sciences about design, to design schools that actually fit the paradigms that we've been talking about on this on the stage. And in order to do that, we need to have active, engaged dialogue with policymakers. We need lots more opportunity for pilot programs to be set up so we can demonstrate the efficacy at scale of the kinds of things that we're uh, talking about. California has 43 million people in it. It's a huge economic power in the world. Um, it has the capacity to do some of these kinds of things. And for us to learn with them, us meaning researchers, to learn with practitioners and policymakers about how to build schools that actually work for the students that we have now. Um, and I think it's time for us to do that. Can I say, I, I also think it, some of the points were made this morning are very relevant to this question Indeed. because policymakers need to take account of the data. It's often yeah. very hard to get the policymakers to look at the data because I think it was Tricia this morning said they already know what they think should be taught or they already know what they think should be learned. But we need to um, have an evidence-based education system where data counts when you're making policy. I think that's a really important point. I mean, I think it is a really important point, but I feel like um, very often data on children with disabilities is not being collected, right? Uh -huh. um, at least in, in many of the countries in which I work. And so there needs to be an emphasis on collecting that, that data. Judy, just hold on a second. I want to come to Dennis and I'll come back to UNICEF. I'll try to answer this question from the medical perspective and, and from my own experiences. We constructed this artificial intelligence system for um, aiding diagnosis of autism and, and actually have been testing it in Bangladesh. It's, a, it's a, a system that actually has great promise to be equitable across diversity um, of, all, of all kinds. And we have generated the data. In fact, we decided we'd go through the FDA <clears throat> for regulatory approval. It's the first ever of any kind, any, any autism diagnostic of any kind, to, to go through that FDA approval path, not, let alone the fact that it's software as a medical device. And, and we thought, OK, this is important because it passes the medal of peer review that will make it possible for policymakers to adopt and for insurance, Medicaid, to adopt it and pay for it because it's so important that it's available to everyone. <clears throat> but that's really hard. And we're fighting with it right now. Getting state Medicaid to cover this has been uh, amazingly and for me, eye-openingly challenging. There is a, a hope that, of course, we'll get there, but it's, it's an education on our part and on the part of the Medicaid programs to become comfortable with this kind of approach to diagnostic assessments of children with autism. And so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that that's, that's an evolution, and it's, I think, a, a education, again, about what this means and what technology can do, affordable technology here, and why it's worth supporting on Medicaid. That's the point that I have. 
going That's on. Right. Judy, you've worked on policy a lot. Do you want to come in on this? Well, I wanted to ask Elizabeth a question. Elizabeth, with um, the research that you were just discussing, as well as other research, um, are you are you able to use the university and their education program uh, to work actually in schools in your area to take what you've uh, researched and put it into practice? Yes. Um, earlier today, we learned about research practice partnerships that are being used at Stanford in, in relationship with local school districts to um, build communities of practice around research and to use that evidence base to inform practice in, in those spaces. Um, we have a partnership that's emerging in a school district now where we'll have a, a full campus um, preschool through 12th grade, three different schools on the same campus where we can do a lot of this innovation and bring our Stanford teacher education program, teacher candidates there to engage in this kind of practice. It will be very powerful, I think. But I think that these, these efforts are, are not unique to Stanford. We have examples of this around the country where people have done these um, very well articulated high quality evidence-based interventions and they don't really sustain, I don't think we have the scaling up um, strategies in place that feed all of the policymakers along the way and also connect the various systems together to actually make the cultural shift that we're talking about um, in our education system. I think we're on the cusp of that, but I think that's something that that um, we're particularly well po poised to do, but I don't think we've cracked the, I don't think we've cracked that problem yet. Right, but at least you're on the road for this. And I yeah. think this level of discussion is very important for the future because it's really taking research, which has been proven uh, to produce certain outcomes and looking at it as Elizabeth is saying, with an objective of scaling up, moving it from a good practice to a best practice, just scaling up. And if you're able to apply something like this, again, right now for a minute, we can talk about the US. The diversity of learning in the United States is such that if something like this can be applied in multiple school districts, then I think this is essential to being able to convince not just policymakers but uh, legislators who are going to be allocating the money to do the research, take the research to practice, et cetera. Yeah. So we have um, somebody in the audience who'd like to ask a question. Please come to the mic. Hi, my name is Jenna Ellis. First of all, thank you so much for putting this panel together. We have learned so much from you already, and I just wanted to say thank you. Um, we, our disability advocates have done a lot to get our um, kids with learning differences in the gen ed classrooms, and they've done a really good job of that. Um, and now, thanks to research like yours, we know that it's beneficial to include those children in the classroom and beneficial for all of the students in the classroom. Um, with that in the back of your mind, what could we do to better support or prepare our gen ed teachers to make these inclusive efforts more successful? That's a great, that, that is a great question. Um, anybody wants to start? You know? Sure, I'll take, I'll take that. Um, I'll kick it off anyway. I look to my uh, final panelist to uh, build on. Um, so I, I would think about going back to the question of research. What counts as research? And who are we looking to as sort of experts about learning, about supporting students with disabilities? I would suggest that we change our shift from the idea of research on students, research on communities, to research with, with our educators, with our students, to engage um, you know, participatory action research paradigms and methodologies 
to blur the lines between research and practice so that we're actually engaging in both at the same time. And when you have those who are more proximal to actually implementing the research, right? Actually implementing policy as the designer of the research, as the co-creators of the research questions or inquiry process, um, then they're more likely, I think, to engage in research that's really reflective of their context, and educators will create learning environments that's inclusive for students. I think we, we, we face challenges when we try to sort of replicate and duplicate a intervention uh, study that was done in one, one area and try to wholesale place it in another context without engaging those educators in that context. Um, that's when we went into trouble. And so there's this tension between sort of the fidelity and contextual fit, but we won't have to really worry about trying to make that contextual fit if we are engaging with our teachers, with our educators on ideas, innovations, interventions that are contextually based, that they are a part of design and engaging in the research study themselves. And so I will offer that um, rather than how do we help educators become more inclusive, our general educators to become more inclusive, I would suggest that we engage our general educators in the process of looking at this system, their systems, their classrooms, their schools, along with and collaborating with their special education partners and students to figure out together how do we make our learning spaces more inclusive, more responsive, uh, more reflective of the, day, of the differences that are, that's within our schools, our schoolhouses and classrooms. So, you know, I would add to, add to that, Sina, that I think it's really important to not only work with communities, but also ensure that persons with disabilities are also educators, researchers, policy makers. I think that Absolutely. that lived experience becomes re an important asset in addressing this issue. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, I think we have a couple more hands up in the audience. Please come to the mic. And I see Brett over there. So. Yeah, thanks. I, um, uh, you know, fantastic uh, insights from the panel. I mean, the, uh, invariably, the question about how we, um, you know, the discussion, uh, the, the debate between uh, research and, and policy uh, seems to uh, shift always to uh, the idea that uh, policymakers either, as uh, some of the panelists uh, were saying, need more data now, you know, policymakers don't often read data, they depend on advisors to mediate uh, data, and they will take what uh, is necessary for the political climate at the time, and, and, and they can actually read data in different ways depending on the uh, regime, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the government uh, uh, in, in, in power at the time. So I don't think, um, you, you know, more data is uh, necessarily the question. Uh, but really, my question is, um, you know, are we really uh, arguing for a better dialogue between research and policymakers, where policymakers make policy in order to enable us to do what we want to do? Or is the argument really uh, an insistence that policymakers uh, enable us uh, and, uh, you know, fund the space? in which more innovation in what we do, and the fantastic innovations from all the panelists I've heard, and it seems to me that a space, an environment that enables innovation uh, is more important than the idea that research might somehow encourage policymakers to make a policy uh, of, some dis uh, of, of, of some description. And I just wanted some clarity, really, about uh, you know, some sort of refinement of what it is we are really asking for. If we are asking for policymakers to lead by making policy on questions that we are not entirely always uh, you know, sure of, depending on a political climate, or are we asking for more space for innovation, a better environment to enable us to do more research and actually to drive what we do know uh, by innovations and uh, more discussion? But in, well, innovation has to be based on expertise, doesn't it? So what I meant about data is 
We have knowledge. We've acquired a lot of knowledge as a discipline. This knowledge means that the way you want to innovate might change. So from the case of my dyslexia work, it would mean that you don't just drill synthetic phonics day after day for a child who hasn't got that foundation of their speech rhythms. And so to me, the answer is that knowledge always matters and expertise always matters. And even for the previous question, if teachers understand the basics of how the brain learns, for example, language, then in their own space, in their own classroom, when they see a child not performing as they might expect, they have tools, they have knowledge that can help them to innovate because they know what the possible mechanisms that are going wrong might be. So I think the issue for policymakers is that we do have expertise and it's relevant to them making policy. Research isn't something separate that just has got nothing to do with policy. The whole point of doing education research is to try to improve the end state for these children in these classrooms who aren't necessarily getting what they need. I think someone said this morning that if we just made policy to, sit, to, to pick up that child who is never responding, is never being helped, all children would benefit, and I think that's really true. I, I do think expertise matters. That's what the research is trying to deliver. I, you yeah. know, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, I just want I just, I love what you're saying. Teachers need knowledge, but then they have to practice with that knowledge. Mm. The knowledge itself is the kernel of an idea that has to be acted out and engaged in with students yep. to hone and refine that knowledge base for a particular kid or group of kids. And if we have the innovation space that um, policymakers could help us create, we would, cr we would be able to cre create schools that are true learning organizations in which teachers themselves are participants in the way that Sina is talking about as co-researchers to refine and develop a practice that we can actually have time to talk about together when we're in practice settings so that teachers could learn from one another and from their students and from the families that are there to support it. But the innovation zones that we have right now um, actually make it very difficult to innovate outside the sleeve of the curriculum that is informing what teachers are asked to do. Teachers could be agents in a very powerful way, and, and I think we need some support to um, reframe the sphere of practice and to elevate what it means to be a teacher and a learner at the same time. I mean, that's the joy of teaching, is when you take all the tools that you have and you are with some learners and you go, what do they really need and what do I know that could help them learn? And how can I facilitate that and how can they help me understand it better? Judy and Nadine, do you want to come in on this? You're mute. No, I was agreeing with what Elizabeth was saying. <laughs> Learning environments are critically important. And I mean, I believe that policy is not intended to say what you have to do from one minute to the next. Policy, in many ways, is really in the area of education for disabled kids, is you're wanting to look at outcomes. Are kids in school? Are they in the least restrictive environment? Are they performing like other children? Are they getting the supports that they need, et cetera? Um, so if we're showing, like in the study, this one study that Elizabeth was discussing, improved outcomes as a result of children be in classrooms, I presume, Elizabeth, that in selecting, did you randomly select the classes or the classrooms, or did teachers have to agree with that they would participate? Well, Teachers did have to agree to participate, but we randomly selected the schools. Right. Yeah. Right. So you had you had a willing audience, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Um, and when we look at issues around policy and education for disabled children, we are looking for outcomes, and I think that's in part what we're saying more broadly: the outcomes for disabled children are still not where they need to be. And in my view, they're not where they need to be yet because 
of a lack of commitment on the part of the educational structures that all children, including disabled children, have a right to quality, equal education. And so a lot of what we're still doing is fighting to get kids in a regular lunchroom because they're in segregated classes, even though research like Elizabeth and others are doing clearly shows that this is not the way for these children to learn. And probably is also showing that teachers are not gratified by the work that they're doing also, because in one set of classes, kids are learning, in the other set, they're not. So Dennis, do you wanna um, opine on this? And then I, we'll go for the last um, I'll question. be really quick, Please. I think. I just really love the question, because I think the levels of data necessary for the different tiers of, let's say, approval and bringing something into a scalable level of impact vary. So the, the lobbyist for Medicaid needs something different from the director of Medicaid needs something different from the FDA. So, so coming back to the looking through the lens of one part of the continuum of neurodiversity, autism, we know, and this is somewhat unfortunate, that the diagnosis gates access to, to reimbursement for the treatment. The treatment is, consist, is, is tantamount to education. We want to we wanna get through that, and we need Medicaid to get through, through that. Um, and so, so there is, there is a HICS-PICS code, an HCPCS code, a CMS code, for digital therapies, uh, pioneered and, and now available and potentially an opportunity for, if it's accepted, innovations to come quickly on the heels of what we're trying to do, to get this covered under this code by Medicaid so that all kids can have access to this you know, affordably. And if that happens, if we can learn how to speak the language at the level and with the data that they need, we can set the stage for innovations like ours to come quickly on the heels and really change the ability to leverage these new ideas. Great. I think we have a, a last question from the audience. Hello, Leonard Medlock with the uh, Stanford Graduate School of Education Alumni Board. And um, my question is straightforward around how should we be talking about learning differences? In other words, what's the common definition if I wanted to have a conversation with my coworkers, my colleagues, with funders, venture capitalists, philanthropists, policymakers, researchers? What is the language, um, seeing as we've expanded from learning disabilities, which I think is less broad and less inclusive, like how do we talk about it in everyday conversation? And the underlying tension, of course, is I think in practice, what I've heard a lot of and what I agree with is we want to treat all students as unique but equally capable. But when it comes to advocating for support or resources, we have to figure out the right box to check in order to get that advocacy or those resources. So like, what is the common language we use just to have more discussions around this? Okay, some ideas around what, common language. And what, then what about personalized learning? Because really, these learning differences mean every child needs personalized learning in some sense. That could be uh, something you say to the equity capitalists. And <laughs> <laughs> Great, I know we're running out of time, so unfortunately we're not going to be able to take any more questions from the audience, but I did have a question to the panelists to wrap up. Um, one thing you'd like to see happening to build an inclusive um, learning future, just very briefly, I'll start with Judy. Briefly, Judy. You're on mute. Commitment and belief that it's possible. Perfect. Usha. Yeah, I think learning environments are the key. The more we understand about the brain and what it needs to learn well, the better learning environments we can create. Dennis. Uh, collaboration. I think collaborative learning and the really building off of what I already said, inspiration that the innovations you make will will scale, can, can reach the population. And I'll say, just from my own experience, when you use digital, you can reach more people. And so embracing technology and, and games, 
again, for children, they want to play games. You can, you can make a very big difference, and it can create incredible innovations that are very empathic, very diversity aware. And, and, and so I'm, I'm trying to encourage more students to do that. Wonderful. Elizabeth, what would you look for? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we need education leaders in every school that embrace this vision and we need to help them um, shift how teachers think of themselves and the work that they do from being conveyors of a, of a curriculum and, and um, seeing themselves as, something that, as folks that deliver something to people who are themselves engaged in the process of learning about learning with every single group of students that shows up in front of them. We need that. Great. Dana. An appreciation, valuing, and honoring of difference. Right? And then our education system responding to that. That, that we're throwing away this idea of the normal child, the normal body, the normal way of being and doing, and instead embracing that there's the only thing that's normal is that we're all different. Mm -hmm. And if we create environments that's acknowledging of that, that's responsive to that, that values and appreciate that, I think then everything that we've been talking about can come to fruition. But as long as we're trying to make children, families, people fit in this narrow idea of what's normal, then we're not gonna realize the vision that we've been articulating throughout this conference here. And And I think if I was to say, I would say that inclusive education, a recognition that inclusive education benefits everyone. And I think that's a really important shift that we need to move towards. Um, so I think you'll all agree this has been an amazing panel. We haven't answered all the questions, uh, but we, you know, we'll, we'll find a way to do that. So thank you all very much, and thank you to an amazing thank panel. You. Thanks, Judy, for joining. Add my thanks. I feel like you really embodied the core concept here, which is to accelerate learning for all students. And it was it was just really embodied with all that you've done. So thank you. A uh, couple quick shout outs. Great questions from the students. Thank you. Um, terrific questioning and, and from all of the audience. So keep those coming. Um, we are headed out for a break. I promise there are snacks. Uh, so please take a quick 15 minute stretch. And uh, trust me, you're not going to want to miss the end. We're going to come home strong. So see you in a few minutes. Okay, I think we're gonna try to get going here again. Don't make me do my clapping. I'll do my clapping. Dean Schwartz. All right. I think we're gonna get started here uh, for our last speaker and panel. And as I said, uh, you are in for a treat. Dean Schwartz really teed this up so beautifully for all of the panels today in his description of the components of a scientific revolution, the need and the opportunity with new data, new technology, new empiricism, and a, a new, uh, new demands, new challenges. And you've really heard through the different lenses of our panels how they are anchored across those themes. And um, it is really that which our next and second keynote speaker is going to help us reflect on and uh, kind of bring home. So I am so thrilled to be able to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is a brilliant neuroscientist. Uh, as I'm learning to know him, he's really an incredible human being and someone who we're 
very excited to call now one of Stanford's own, uh, Phil Fisher. We are lucky that he has recently relocated to Stanford to build out our new center on early childhood. Nothing could make this pediatrician's heart happier. His work on uh, advancing impact for young children and families is anchored in equity and in uh, developing partnerships with the communities, which again, as someone who's out there a lot, I couldn't be more excited about. His work to develop and launch the rapid assessment of the pandemic's impact on development and early childhood survey was unbelievably timely, responsive, and incredibly illuminating. You probably read about it multiple times in the New York Times. Um, quite simply, this survey has changed the way we garner and act on data from children and families. Just one example of his brilliance. Please join me in welcoming D Bill Fisher. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for sticking around through this last panel. Um, I'm going to begin with just some reflections on some of what I've heard today. I have some prepared remarks that I'll get to following that. I, I think first, one of the themes that's come through so much of what we heard today is that learning occurs in an environment of relationships. I think historically we've thought about education as focusing on the child or the, the person who's engaged in the education environment. But so much of what we're seeing, not just through the science, but also through the programs that have been highlighted, is the extent to which relationships are really where that learning is cultivated. The interactions between adults and children, between children and other children, are really where that happens. The second reflection that I have is really about how systems, if we zoom out further, systems are really critical to understand how we can promote optimal learning. Systems are important because systems are where many of the inequities lie structurally. Um, and so if we want to make progress, we really need to think about these systemic inequalities and how to address them. But also, as we heard from Lisa and many others, it's really in the alignment of different systems in which learners are engaged that we can see some of the most transformative work happening. I think the examples of healthcare and education and how we're starting to see models of how Healthcare can be th thought of as a place where learning is promoted, but also where we can think more holistically about things like housing and legal services, all of these things coming together to really provide the support that learners need. And, and then third, I think one of the things that's come through so clearly is that if we're really centering on learning, then moving away from the idea of curriculum as the way in which we learn and really thinking much more about individuals and about variation is really where we should be headed in terms of the sort of where the field is going. So that's sort of sum, summing up some of what we've heard today. I also, I keep thinking about Bruce McCandless' statement that we're all billionaires, which I thought was, was lovely. And at the same time, I was also thinking in part because of some of the survey work that we've done during the pandemic, that I wish we could spend our neurons on things like food and housing and things like that. Because we know that, uh, that, again, not being able to access basic needs and basic resources is a huge potential impediment to learning. So I just want, want to start with that. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, by, by talking a little bit about just circling back to what Dean Schwartz began the day with, which is this idea that we're really on the cusp of a, of a new scientific revolution, and that that's not just impacting things like how we treat and identify the causes of diseases or being able to look far out into space to, to understand the origins of the universe and our, our solar system and our planet, but it's really also having an impact on the very broad and diverse discipline of education. Uh, I, I think really simply in the past several decades, we've really uh, gotten to a place where science can allow us to understand how learning occurs across the lifespan, that the very early learning that occurs in the context of families is one place that we should be thinking about. Uh, but as children enter preschool and school uh, and, and enter higher education, and even adults and into old age, that learning is something that occurs across, across the lifespan, and that really all of the knowledge that's coming uh, to us really needs to be extended across that entire continuum. I think what this means is that where education has ex historically kind of been a black box, where we kind of made our best efforts uh, to kind of put 
uh, resources into things that facilitated children's ability to learn to read, to do math, and to become productive members of society, uh, that we can now be much more precise. You heard about this from Pat Cool's comments, from Bruce McCandless's comments and others, about how the brain develops in ways that can really understand how learning occurs across the lifespan. And so we're really kind of getting beyond these black box models to understand what's inside them. This is important because it's not just simply good enough for science to, to be able to document how things work, uh, but then that knowledge can be deployed for us to be able to design strategies, and you heard about some of these today, that have the greatest potential to really promote outcomes, positive outcomes, uh, for all individuals across all kinds of income levels and circumstances, and in all countries around the world. I think also such knowledge, and we heard about this uh, sort of consistently across the day, really the knowledge also holds the promise of allowing us to mitigate uh, some of the risks to optimal development that occur because of things like gender inequity, lack of resources, other kinds of social factors. Uh, and really, in this way, we can begin to narrow achievement gaps that have been well documented. Sean Reardon here at the GSE has done a tremendous amount of work on this. Uh, achievement gaps that exist because of structural and systemic inequalities that have only been growing in many places in recent years. I think this is especially important right now as we, hopefully I'm gonna knock wood here, emerge from the, from the global pandemic uh, because we are coming out of a time when there have been tremendous disruptions to early learning and learning environments in general. Uh, we've also been facing time, a time of, of tremendous unpredictability and uncertainty. And there is a great deal of science, neuroscience and uh, developmental psychology that shows that uncertainty is not, especially when it's, it's consistent and long-term chronic unpredictability, does not create optimal developmental conditions. And so uh, we can see in some of the data that's starting to emerge that there has been among some individuals tremendous learning loss that's occurred over this time in ways that some of the progress that we were starting to see coming out of, of the, the science of education has really been eroded. I think uh, we're not just talking about, however, kind of the period that we're coming out of because the world continues to be facing conditions of uncertainty that are due to things like geopolitical conflicts and climate. And so we really need to continue to think about how the, the, this revolution that's occurring can really uh, come to address what we're coming to see as more of the new normal that children and families are facing. Just one example from our own work of how science can be applied, and I think this relates again to some of, the, some of what we heard about today. Uh, so my, my colleagues and I have for many years studied children reared in very neglectful environments that include families involved in the foster care system, children reared in institutional settings in other countries. And one of the things that we found when we bring these children into the laboratory is that when they're completing tasks and they make mistakes, when, when we give them feedback that they've made those mistakes, we actually see quite limited neural response to the mistakes that they're making. It's almost as if the information is just simply not getting through. I wanna be clear that probably in the context of very unpredictable and non-responsive environments, that's a very healthy and adaptive response. If the world isn't kind of giving much to you, then it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to pay attention to the information that's coming in. But it also creates tr tremendous challenges as we see when these children enter the formal school system and struggle not only academically, but in terms of social emotional learning. Understanding that this might be tied to a diminished neural response to information coming in has allowed us to very specifically design programs that target those exact mechanisms. And it's not rocket science, just like Dennis Wall was talking about in terms of the Google Glass approach. Sometimes very straightforward strategies like making signals much more clear to children are enough to activate the brain's plasticity and to really turn things around. So when we have kids in these kinds of contexts where there is this kind of information that's much more readily available, not only do we see them perform better in terms of their social and academic achievement, but we actually see much more typical brain response than occurring, an indication of the brain's plasticity uh, in response to kind of these changes in their environmental context. 
So I think the potential is great, but as we've heard repeatedly today, there's also tremendous variation in our genetic makeup. Uh, that means that there is vast difference in how learning and knowledge is acquired that's built into our very genetic blueprints and then is further kind of made variable by the experiences that we have over the course of the lifespan, what people talk about in terms of ep epigenetics. And I think one of the reasons that this is important is that the science really needs to increasingly move, not just from a perspective of what works, but what works for whom, to be able to really incorporate the kind of variation that we might see uh, in typical learning environments. And I think one example of this uh, that we talked about was the Google, Google Glass kind of approach. But I also think it's not just about helping children adapt uh, based on their variation, but also things like helping teachers become more able to deal with learning difficult, difficulties through, or different differences through things like virtual reality, being able to see the world through, a child, through the eyes of a child who might have divergent kind of approaches to learning. And of course, we're not just talking about learning occurring in academic settings, in schools and, and preschools and higher education. We know that learning occurs uh, in all environments, that learning can occur in built environments and the natural environment. It's also possible to leverage places like laundromats and, and doctor's offices and create ample experiences for kids to gain learning in those kinds of contexts. Uh, I also want to emphasize, and you'll hear some of this on this next panel, I think this has not come out enough today, that we're not just talking about learning that begins very early in life and ends when children complete or adults complete their higher education or graduate degrees. Learning is a lifelong process, and we can think about learning in terms of workforce, in terms of older adults, and the strategies that are most effective there, and I think that's super critical. But I want to circle back to some of the, the sort of the, the opportunities and the challenges that Dean Schwartz alluded to in his opening comments. I think that science has tremendous potential, and Lisa alluded to some of the areas where we're seeing some of that potential really occur. At the same time, I think one of the things that science has really struggled with is great in understanding sort of what the underlying mechanisms are and potentially in using research to design effective strategies. But where we've really not, not done nearly as well is in the dissemination of knowledge and ideas in contexts where it can really be most useful. So the idea of how do ideas get that out there is a recurring theme that's come out today. And I see it as something that really is part of this next revolution is how we're going to get there. I don't think it's, as people have alluded to, just good ideas parachuting or helicoptering in I think there are other approaches that are really critical uh, to employ in order to make sure that ideas get out there. And I want to note, as somebody said earlier today, scale is not just about ideas going big. If the ideas don't make a difference, then scaling is not, is not going to be as effective. The other thing is scale doesn't have to mean global. Scale could mean that everybody in a particular context, whether it's a community or a county or a state or a country, uh, is, is not deprived of access to the most optimal kinds of learning environments. I think uh, where researchers maybe have struggled in getting their ideas out there, given that we're in the heart of Silicon Valley, I can say that there's sort of, an, an, in some of the innovation sector, some equal challenges on the opposite side, which is a lot of innovators are great at thinking about how ideas can scale, but don't have the, the tools necessary to think about how to have the greatest impact. And I think we need to stop thinking about research as just a tool for proving that something works, but rather take our nod from industry and think about how research can allow for continuous improvement idea, of ideas and of technology so that we can continue to be much more personalized in our approaches. Where should we look to for in inspiration? I think this very conference tells us where we should be looking. First of all, in numerous place-based initiatives around the world, there are a number of individuals and organizations who are really reinventing the way education occurs in order to more adequately meet the needs of all children. And I think the Edan Prize Foundation um, has celebrated through their laureates a number of such individuals and organizations. We've heard about Brock and how starting in Bangladesh and then expanding further into Asia and Africa, that right now there are over 100,000 children who are enrolled in play labs and over 14 million students who've, who've been engaged in the, the kinds of classrooms uh, that Brock supports. 
Uh, we know from Vicky Colbert's uh, work, and, and her organization is, is uh, Escuela Nueva, uh, that we can bring education uh, to contexts very broadly that have not had access to quality education. And I think we can see this happening in numerous other instances where we're helping to address gender inequities through education and so forth. Taking all of these examples to heart, which I think are in extremely important to do, I think we really need to imagine a world in which science and innovation are really coming together to produce unprecedented impacts uh, and scale that we have not seen before. And I think in order to achieve this, and this is one of the things that I think a gathering like this can do uh, today, is to really create spaces in which science and the ideas that it brings with us and uh, innovation can really flow together in order to accelerate the transformation in education. I also think, and we heard this theme consistently, that this isn't just about governments, it's not just about researchers, and it's not just about organizations. That key in the design process is the very people who are the recipients, the end users, and the practitioners of education. And that if we simply keep thinking about how to put things in place rather than how to engage communities, that we'll really end up feeling like we're depriving ourselves of the full potential. So I think, put simply, the revolution in science will have greatly diminished impact uh, especially at a time when it's most needed if we don't develop tools that allow us to work together synergistically and effectively. And I really hope that everybody here will kind of take that challenge seriously and move forward together so that we're, we're really creating a new theory of change. And that theory of change is really about how all of these different pieces come together. I think we're on the cusp of being able to do that and I think we need to go forth from here and really make it happen. Thank you so much, as good as we had anticipated. Um, all right, so please help me welcome someone who does not need any introduction. Uh, the director of the Hoover Institution here at Stanford and the 66th United States Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice. We are fortunate uh, that the panelists who will be joining uh, Dr. Rice on stage represent a tremendous cross-sector uh, expertise. We have higher education, people from the nonprofit, technology, philanthropy, and policy backgrounds. This group is intentionally diverse. As you heard President Tessier Levine and Dean Schwartz share earlier today, it is incumbent upon us to energize collaborations that span both disciplines and industries if we are truly to energize the potential of all learners. And these are indisputably the individuals whose work exemplifies the potential for our path ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you to uh, the School of Education and Dean Schwartz. Thank you very much for having us all here. Uh, the way that we're going to proceed is that um, we have some questions for my fellow panelists. Um, at some point, I am going to turn to some questions from those who are streaming, but also there are microphones uh, in the uh, aisles for those of you who wish to have a question. And remember, I'm a professor. If nobody raises their hand, I will call on somebody. I do cold call in my classes. Um, I'm delighted to be joined uh, on the stage by uh, Vicki Colbert, the founder and director of New School Foundation, Columbia. Uh, John Hennessy, Stanford's 10th president, um, the chairman of Alphabet Incorporated, and also the director of our Innovative Knight Hennessy Fellowship Program. Uh, Saul Khan, the founder and CEO of Khan Academies. Brooke Stafford Broussard, the vice president for research to practice uh, of Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And Candace Till, the director of learning science Amazon. And so this is a great panel. And I'm going to start by reflecting uh, on something that Phil said and, and using that to, to get our panel started. Uh, it was a, a very striking comment uh, that we're on the cusp of a new scientific revolution, uh, that we are perhaps at a moment where science can really make a difference in how we think about learning, how we think about restructuring uh, the process of learning. And so I'm gonna be a bit provocative and I'm gonna ask uh, John and then Candace. Uh, we have long thought that technology might be uh, an answer to our uh, concerns about education. Uh, we appreciate the need for an interdisciplinary approach. Why haven't we made more progress? Mm. John, why don't you start? 
Well, I think because it's a much harder problem than we understood in the beginning. I still remember when we put the first MOOC up from my colleagues in computer science. But by the way, first they put it up and they said anybody in the world can register for this course. And then they told the provost and president they were doing this. <laughs> but we made it all work. Uh, but what we discovered when we had 10,000 people taking a machine learning course designed for Stanford students is that eight or 9,000 of them couldn't keep up with the pace, didn't have the prerequisites. So that was the first thing. The second thing we discovered was people learn in different ways. And in fact, it was Dean Schwartz who I asked about this who told me not all learners learned the same way. And just putting material up, putting content up wasn't enough. The third challenge we've had, I think, is that it's really hard to do experiments in the education sector. You know, Google experiments with how search works and how they place ads every single day. But doing an experiment with somebody else's children, first of all, that creates a certain hurdle you have to overcome. And then you do the experiment and then wait five years to see whether or not they really, you really taught them new material and they succeeded and things. So though all those things have, have made it harder than we thought. Although I think, as Phil said in his talk, as we understand more about neuroscience, more about the process of learning and how different people learn, we can reflect that back and build systems that are more adaptive rather than the initial cut. Yeah. Candice, you want to add on to that? Sure. Um, so uh, your question was, why hasn't technology solved the problem for us? Well, um, in a, in a in something, something like that. Word, something yeah. like yeah. that. Yes, yeah. right. And I think uh, John made some great comments about how we've used technology to help make traction on solving the problem. Most people thought the big power of technology in solving the problem was access. That the real problem was, and this is what MOOCs really attempted to solve, the real problem is the education's fine, just it's unequal access. Uh, so the idea behind MOOCs was we create the access, the problem will be solved. Uh, obviously that didn't work for the reasons that John uh, listed, but we forgot some of the other real powers of the technology. One of the ones uh, that Dan mentioned this morning that makes this revolution possible is data. Mm -hmm. The power of this technology is not just pushing it out, but pushing it to an interface where we can observe the learner. And in this case, it means collecting the data from the learner's actions so we can get better insight into what are the mechanisms of human learning. And I would say the third thing that people don't talk enough about is that uh, to really understand human learning, we need to understand features about the learner, features about the thing being learned, and features about the context in which that learning is occurring. And to be able to look at each of those features and how they interact, to be able to support an instructional differentiation decision at the time scale we need to do that, that's beyond human cognition. But it's not beyond the power of our algorithms to help support us in making those decisions. So it hasn't done it yet, but by leveraging the things that Dean Schwartz spoke to this morning, it is the only thing that will enable us to make these changes. So we're, we're getting there? We are definitely getting there. All right, All right. I'll, I'll take that. We'll come back in 10 years and ask the question again. <laughs> so uh, let, let me turn uh, for a moment on this question of access. And uh, people talk a lot about access. They also talk about the need uh, to scale in order to create access. But I thought it was very interesting that uh, Phil warned us about this concept of scale as not being uh, the panacea. So uh, let me ask um, uh, Vicki and Saul. Vicki, uh, we have an uneven an distribution of uh, educational benefits in the U.S. Uh, and across the world. 85% uh, of young people in the world are going to be in Africa and Asia in the next 20 years. The question is how is the system reaching them? Uh, we have a lot of experiments. Are they adding up to much? How do we scale? And I think that uh, both of you have dealt with this issue of scale. So Vicki, can I turn to you first? Well, first of all, uh, I have to say something about Escuela Nueva because it was a local innovation that started in Colombia and it became a national policy impacting more than 20,000 schools. Uh, and um, it has inspired many educational reforms worldwide. Uh, going up, not only Latin American and, and Caribbean, but mainly to 
Vietnam and getting in places where they have implemented it. Uh, it's one of the longest bottom-up innovation, bottom-up innovations of the developing world that's still being sustained. Despite that innovations are very vulnerable to political and administrative changes. We'll talk at the end about the role of public, private, and civil society. But it's an example of how innovations, you know, for us, necessity was the mother of innovation. And Escuela Nueva is not new in the philosophy of education. It just puts in practice what we know 100 years ago, what John Dewey, what Maria Montessori, what Vygotsky, you know, nothing new in the philosophy of education. So what does it do? It promotes child-centered, nothing new in the philosophy, child-centered, active participatory, uh, per active participation, uh, a new role of the teacher for the 21st century and the participation of parents. We had to think systemically from the beginning. That's important because we want, because the school and rise became a local innovation, then it became a national policy. So definitely, by the way, necessity is the mother of innovation. You know? And Charles Peter in, in the UK, he talks about innovations coming from the margins of society. So every, nothing worked, uh, so we just had to rethink everything. We started with those invisible rural multi-grade schools, but that's the beauty of it, because precisely in these schools, you, teachers have to handle heter heterogeneity, how, how do you say it in English? Heterogeneidad, <laughs> no? Because they're different children, different learning rhythms in the classroom. So it promotes self-paced learning. We have to incorporate personalized learning. We had to start cooperative learning because we have learned that children learn through dialogue and interaction. Nothing new in the philosophy of education. A new role of the teacher for, you know, for the future instead of a, a, a transmitter of facts and information. So uh, I think for the, we, we concentrated more on the house, you know, on the house, uh, because we had to think that anything we did was feasibly uh, politically Technically speaking, that any teacher could do it because you cannot find a PhD in the middle of the jungle of Colombia. <laughs> no? So we had to think of all these things that was feasible. Technically, politically, we have strong unions in Latin America. So you have to make sure that the teachers are the agents of change. No? So technical, political, and financially, cost effectiveness. We, if you want to impact national policy, you have to be cost effective. <laughs> no? So we had to think it very systemically from the, from the beginning. Yeah. And uh, just a question on uh, the political side of it. You said you, you had to have it adopted. When did you feel that you had a breakthrough? Was there a moment at which you thought, well, this is actually going to be national policy now? Is this going to scale? Was it legislation? Was it uh, the rising up of groups who were uh, prepared to support it? Uh, I sometimes think that the politics is the hardest part of <laughs> education. Yeah, that's the hardest part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had to transform all this complexity into simple, manageable action. We had to concentrate on the house, you know, because we know the, 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 the what, but more, not so much the house. Uh, so we really had to think that anything we did was really could impact national policy. And of course, we started as a local innovation, became a national policy. And um, so I think one of the most, let's say, I ended up, as a local innovator, I ended up being a Biden Minister of Education in Colombia in some moment, and uh, we took it to scale. I had already done all the work bottom up, <laughs> but I had this possibility. So I think this was very important because then we, we, we took it to scale and, uh, and definitely, we, we, we started learning after I became vice minister. I said, no, this is not going to be sustained. You have to work with the private sector and with civil society. So, you know, I, I learned the hard way. But that's something that has been so important for us because you have to work with governments if you want to have impact and coverage, and that's tough. But you need the role of public-private partnerships and the role of civil society for two words, <laughs> quality and sustainability. That's why it's one of the longest bottom-up innovations that's still being sustained. Mm -hmm. So you need that. But uh, I, I can talk forever, so you, I'm, a, I'm a Latin, so you also have to tell me. <laughs> okay. That's great. We've learned a lot. So Saul, you, you took on the issue of scale in a different way. Uh, talk about your uh, initial experiment and then how it really has become a, a go-to for so many 
many people. Oh, yeah, um, you know, folks are probably reasonably uh, familiar with Khan Academy. It all started as a tutoring project with my cousins. I started writing software for them, made videos for them, took on a life of its own, quit my day job uh, mm -hmm. in, in finance at the time, and then, you know, been on a journey ever since. We have, I think, 140 million registered users. The, the um, you know, I think the, the interesting question here is, if you think about the whole pipeline, first you have to have some type of thing that's accessible, then people have to be aware of it, then they have to engage in it, and then that engagement has to actually be efficacious. And to your first question, I actually think there's a ton of efficacious interventions that exist. Um, and we're not the only one. I think we have certain scale properties to your question that, that, that may, maybe are, are, are interesting. But we just had, you know, we've had 50 plus efficacy studies. And I know we're not the only thing like this, but we just had one. If students are able to put in 30 minutes a week over a school year, they're growing 50% more than the students who aren't doing it. And it, it might <laughs> seem kind of magical. 30 minutes a week in, in math, and your students are spending roughly five to 10 hours in math. How does that make such a big difference? Well, it's exactly what Vicky was saying. Most students in most math classes, but it happens in every math, in, in every classroom, they are disengaged. They're not learning something in their learning edge, their zone of proximal development. It's, it's not mastery-based. You have a gap in something, you move on to the next thing, and no one addresses that last one. It's not personalized. It might take some of us a little bit more time to learn one thing or another. So even just 30 minutes a week, dramatically accelerate students, and it actually keeps going. If you do an hour a week, it, it takes two hours a week. The reason why we don't, I don't even talk about an hour a week is that uh, the question is, it's, why haven't we been able to get more people to engage at even the 30 minutes a week? Mm -hmm. The tools like MOOCs or Khan Academy, there's others, they're, they're incredibly accessible. Um, awareness, I think, is part of the problem. Uh, even though we exist to, uh, to address inequity, to reach the kids who have nothing, to be kind of a, a strategic education reserve, to be a safety net, it, it's adopted in many cases by you know, all of us and, 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 and all of our families. So we, we have to think about how do we actually get awareness to the folks. In, in a lot of the world, they have devices, they have ways of, uh, and there is still a digital divide, but that's changing fast. But I think the engagement is the ultimate question. And there's things that we do on our side, on let's say the technology and the tool side of it. Can we make it more gamified? Can we make it so that kids really want to do it? Uh, you know, we're, we just introduced a free tutoring aspect on schoolhouse.world, and the way we mm -hmm. scale tutoring is by leveraging peer-based tutoring, mm -hmm. but we vet the students, at the, the tutors, in a really scalable uh, and we think rigorous way. But the, the real key is how do we, uh, you know, we, we talk about politics, there is just an inertia in a school system. The reason why I don't say even an hour or two hours where we could grow the students 200% or, or something is it, it's just a different mindset. Even getting that 30 minutes of a five hours of a, of a school week it's taking a little bit of time. And you know, the results we're seeing, they, they don't, some people, and I was originally skeptical, I was like, oh, well, that must correlate with just the kids who want to do it. But it's actually not correlating with kid performance in terms of dosage. It's correlating with what the school decides to do. Mm -hmm. And even though schools don't correlate with income or anything else, it's really, is there the will? And can we simplify the implementation model enough? So you know, I think the name of the game for the next 10 years, obviously we'll improve, everyone will improve things that are efficacious, we'll have more things that scale and are accessible, but how do you get people to really engage? Yeah, very interesting. Um, a lot of what we've talked about is uh, taking experiments, uh, trying to, to push them forward, but we're also sitting here in a great research university and there are many great places for research. Um, Sometimes, at least I feel, that there's a gap between what the researchers are doing and what practitioners uh, have uh, access to, uh, understand, the, the interaction between researchers and practitioners. And I think uh, if anyone knows that well, Brooke, you know it well, because you've uh, spent a lot of time trying to think about get, uh, closing that gap between researchers and practitioners so that they work more effectively together and I would say that the synergies between them should then push things forward more quickly than if they worked in silos. So can you talk about that sure, uh, perspective? Sure. And Saul set, set me up very well because it's really all about implementation, right? And exactly. um, I mean, mm -hmm. I'll reinforce so much of what we've heard today that um, education is human development. Human development is multidisciplinary because exactly. it all converges in us, right? Um, but our education system is not multidisciplinary uh, because it was designed and um, 
has been delivered uh, over many, many years. And these, these fields of science have emerged since. And um, because of that, we have really problematic contradictions to what many of the scholars and researchers have shared with us today. You know, discipline is an example. Um, we know that if a child demonstrates a behavior, whether in childhood or adolescence, it's often, often kind of signification of, of a developmental need. Um, but in our education system, we exclude, we isolate, uh, we remove. Um, when people like Pat Cool will teach us that it's about co-regulation, it's about connecting. Um, and so if we want to bring uh, all of these sciences into um, effective, feasible, scalable, sustainable practice, we really do have to move to bridge that gap and uh, design deep and, and balanced uh, research practice partnerships. And I say balanced because um, I think Carol Dweck, with beautiful humility, named it this morning. Like, we are all pieces of a puzzle in these partnerships, right? Um, and deep expertise is required from every individual in the partnership. Um, and so we cannot move this work into practice without the expertise of the researcher and their knowledge base, without the expertise of the school teacher, school leader, school superintendent, and their expertise around the complex environment that we're trying to implement this work in, and without the expertise of, of community and family and students uh, who, are, who we're working to serve. Um, and so uh, I think, again, Carol kind of really gave us a great example. Like the, what we're learning um, in, in the, these fields um, is not going to be implemented with a simple intervention, right? It's one thing to support a child to understand that uh, they get smarter with effort, but if they move back into an, a school where smart kids are celebrated on the walls and a teacher through kind of just implicit behaviors is reinforcing a fixed mindset, then that impact of the intervention isn't sustained. And so researchers working with school practitioners who deeply understand how to design those complex environments is what is going to get us to a uh, broader scale of, of these evidence-based practices, whether it's through technology or, or policy. Do you, do you ever find that uh, practitioners, <coughs> teachers, principals, simply say, I, enough, I, I have so much on my plate. Uh, don't tell me to change the way that I was taught to do this. I'm just trying to keep my head above water here. And I wonder sometimes if that's one of the problems with, uh, with implementation. Vicki, I think you had your finger up. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, yes, please, yes. I was saying that's the point. That's yeah. a very yes, clear yeah. point. Why interdisciplinary in a way? We had to think systemically from the beginning. And uh, you know, academic and non-academic dimensions. Uh, and, uh, and we had to think of systemically it meant four components. Curriculum, mm. child-centered, teacher training, uh, relationship, relationships between the school and the community and the parents. So we have all these four components, and necessarily you uh, you have to have be inspired in 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 previous research, but it's just putting research into yeah. practice. And so it is that, not that, that was one of the things for us was so important to have decades of research behind. Um, and you know, not only an academic achievement, you know, when UNESCO did the first study, comparative international study in Latin America, Colombia and Cuba were the only two countries where rural schools outperformed urban schools, except for the mega cities, compensated for social inequality. So we had to focus on quality, inequality, <laughs> and, and, uh, and this was the future of learning because in a way it's like the story of Cinderella, you know, because education systems, are slower than the rest of society. Mm -hmm. And in Latin America, everybody's just learning administrative issues, how to manage educational systems and learn how to decentralize. And they forgot the pedagogy. Mm -hmm. you know? So for us, it was so crucial to take the school as the unit of change. You know? And that was mm -hmm. bottom up, or bottom up. Yes. to demonstrate that, yes, it can be done. Yeah. And, but always research behind. I'm originally a sociologist, so yes. I know that uh, I'm not a researcher, but I know that you have to have research behind and uh, if you want to reach national policy yeah. and to survive because, you know, innovations are very vulnerable to political and administrative changes. So, yeah. fix that. Yes. A long time. Gonna ask, yeah, I, I would also note, and we've heard it through the day, that we, we shouldn't put the, the challenges of a system 
on the shoulders of a student or a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. and, and teachers, uh, we don't train teachers through the lens of human development uh, across, you know, teacher preparation at scale. Um, you know, schools like Stanford will lead the way in kind of making that uh, that shift, but we have to um, design like, intentional, structured, scaled opportunities for teachers to learn. Again, many of the the um, learnings and, and findings from the sciences that we heard today and. If we do put it on the shoulders of the individual, it can it can be very dangerous and it can create spaces of, of harm. You know, if you take an example of, of what Phil shared, for example, um, incredibly compelling research on the impact of neglect. But if you, without like deep understanding of all the nuances that that are part of that research, kind of leave that space, um, and we've heard the the threats and, and dangers of a deficit mindset today, you might hear. You know, a student who is neglected is going to show up this way in the classroom, and it can translate, again, in the most dangerous spaces to, like, broken brain, broken kid, right? Instead of understanding that the context of neglect created that space, the brain is responding, and Phil named this, in a way that is protecting that child, that the brain is malleable, and through the environments that we build that are consistent and predictable and loving, you can address the needs of that child. Um, and even if the teacher has that knowledge base and is handed an, an evidence-based practice, um, school leadership, system leadership, has to create the organizational supports to be able to implement that practice and to get the coaching and the feedback that, that is necessary to develop expertise. And so that's, that's on the system, not the teacher. Yeah. I, I'm going to close with a question to our panel, and then I have a few questions from the live stream. But also, if there are those of you who wish to ask questions at the microphone, you might prepare to do that. So I think one thing that's gotten everybody's attention about uh, education is what's happened to us over the last couple of years with the global pan pandemic. Uh, you hear about learning loss. You uh, hear about the strains and stresses, uh, not just on families, but on the children, not to mention on systems. Talk a little bit about uh, what we've seen and how we, how we right the ship, because there's a sense that uh, with all that education was going through, this was the last thing we needed. Uh, it's, it's all, maybe you want to start that comment. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not telling anyone anything they don't know. The pandemic was hard, not just academically, but socially, emotionally on everyone, but especially kids in, the, you know, historically under-resourced communities globally. Uh, I, I think what's interesting is that everyone is now talking about learning loss and unfinished learning, but it's not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, before the pandemic, depending on how you look at it, 40, 50% of kids going to four-year colleges, when they, when they go and they take the placement test at the, at the college, these are the top half of kids who actually graduate from high school, decide to go to college, either a two-year or four-year college. The colleges are saying, it's the first time that mastery learning is being enforced in their life. Mm -hmm. And the colleges are saying, hey, wait, you're not even ready to learn college algebra, which honestly should be a remedial class. You're not even ready to learn college algebra. We're gonna take you back to essentially seventh grade math. So the whole system is just going through the motion, seventh grade, eighth grade, algebra one, algebra two, and it's happening in other subjects too, it's just, it's just most pronounced there. That was pre-pandemic, it's just gotten uh, that much worse. The silver lining is people are actually talking about it now. I don't think they're, they're completely clear on what to do, but the solutions are there. People are, are now, they're almost going from everyone learn at the same pace in a kind of traditional industrial model to, oh, maybe everyone needs tutoring now because there was all of these mm -hmm. federal dollars and once again, with the tutoring, and if you, if you ask any district official now, uh, even when there's free tutoring available, there's, it's an engagement problem. People aren't actually showing up for the free tutoring. That's, that's kind of the dirty secret that's been going on right now. And so like, well, how, do, how do we do this? And the solution is there's many tools, interventions, obviously we're one of them, where you can allow students to learn at their own time and pace, master concepts, get that mastery, Credit recovery, this is something, you know, uh, uh, Lisa was uh, talking to me earlier about how we experienced the pandemic. We, we did see an uh, immediate spike. We went from about 30 million learning minutes a day to about 90 minute, million learning minutes a day. But I think the most significant thing for us is it was a bit of a kick in the pants that we can't wait a decade or two decades to start seeing if we can create a, a safety net for the world. In some ways, we, we played some of that role in certain subjects. So, you know, for us, is how do we cover more subjects and grades faster? How can we give high school and college credit for work on Khan Academy? That will be coming soon. We're already doing a pilot with Howard University where college algebra, kids in Title I schools get mastery on Khan Academy, they get transferable college algebra credit from Howard University. 
But if it works for, col for, for college algebra, why can't it work for pre-calculus, calculus, biology, chemistry, physics, I can keep going, history. Um, to a world where why can't we in the next five or 10 years give anyone on the planet a free college education and then have that place into apprenticeships at uh, employers or internships at employers and just make it a really clear, accessible and affordable uh, pathway to, to whatever uh, li life folks want. So I think the pandemic, a lot of problems, but it's also been a good kick in the pants. And I know we're not the only one. I think it, probably everyone in this room, it, it gave us a little bit of, little bit of energy. Great. Any other comments on pandemic? Well, I think Saul yeah. said the key word. Yeah. It's engagement, right? It's yeah. not just technology. It's not just video. It's not just something you watch on your screen. And the pandemic really caused us to realize how much that engagement in the classroom, students learning from other students, really matters. So that whole process, whether it's tutoring otherwise, and I think, I think Saul's right. We should be better prepared next time because we should have learned from this lesson the loss that we've incurred. And just as we need to prepare ourselves in public health, we need to prepare ourselves in the rest of the public infrastructure that supports young people. And, and I would just note, it's not just K-12. This, no. this is an issue for higher education exactly. as well, uh, exactly. because we had to turn on a dime in higher education, and I don't know that we did it all that well. Uh, it's, a little e it's a little easier when you're talking to Stanford students. They have a slightly higher motivation level, I think. Uh, but well, even the maybe. That we lost, we lost, yeah, we something. lost something. We lost something. We lost something. There's no yeah. doubt about yeah. it. Right. Uh, also, I just yes. want to say yes. um, engagement is important, but not just any engagement. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think right. this was the mistake we made when we went from don't be a sage on a stage, learn by doing. Then everyone started saying, okay, let's make the students do stuff. Uh, but learn by doing isn't the answer either because you're always learning. It's are you learning what it is that we want you to learn or that you want to learn. So really thinking about not just engagement or just doing, but getting really at the mechanisms of what kind of engagement or what kind of doing will stimulate yeah. the learning processes we're yeah. trying to stimulate to help you build the knowledge and capabilities you're building. And that's where we, we really need to bring much more of the science in uh, to really understand what are the mechanisms so that we are designing and doing science at the same time. Yes. We don't have connectivity in the rural areas right. of Colombia like the rest of Latin America. But I think the COVID situation, I think it was good for us because it forced us first child-centered, <laughs> what we've been saying for so many years, mm -hmm. and it forced, to be, you know, it forced the child to be the center of learning. It forced the parents to come into the picture. It forced the change of the role of the teacher that we're talking about, not as a transmitter of instruction, uh, as a, a facilitator, uh, you know, a mentor, a more profound dimension of the teacher. So in a way, it was good for us. Now, um, the interesting thing is in, there are no rural, uh, in rural, uh, we don't have connectivity. The teachers do live in the smaller towns, and there there is connectivity. And we had uh, something that we call Renueva as a virtual campus. We started some uh, years ago. But then uh, with the pandemic, it was amazing to see, we're reaching thousands of teachers in the most remote areas of Colombia through our virtual campus. And here we need a lot of technological help, you know? mm -hmm. but, uh, but, I, I, but you could do it. And, and the teachers went to the schools and they looked for their uh, printed learning materials, learn, learning guides, because the, our learning guides have a little, a little special thing. You know, We wanted to incorporate higher level thinking skills and application of knowledge in family and in community. So, this was, this was important. And as it's good pedagogy, we also right now, we adapted it to urban marginal and to migrant populations. So for example, we're working in six cities of Colombia right now with Venezuelans because we have two million migrants in Colombia. So we have to handle, you know, how can we bridge and bring them into the education system? So we created the concept of a school of learning circles, you know, which, uh, uh, are community-based, and there's a teacher or a tutor working with maximum 12, 15 children, giving them love, personalized attention, you know, strengthening their self-esteem. By the way, we have measured all these dimensions of social and emotional aspects, mm -hmm. which are so important. So I think we, I mean, necessity is the mother of innovation, yeah. so we were first sure. to do it. <laughs> and we were first to think systemically from the beginning. I'm, I'm very glad you mentioned uh, the Venezuelan migrant kids um, are, and uh, kids in refugee circumstances are 
some of the most difficult circumstances for learning. And um, it's something uh, I would love to see us pay more attention to. I've watched it in many places. Uh, we're going to turn to some questions uh, that are on the live stream, and then we'll go to uh, some from the audience. But I'm going to get to get one here that's a pretty basic. It says, uh, academic excellence is often measured by Samarit, uh, summative assessment. Rote learning is much encouraged. Students come out with first class honors, but cannot solve <laughs> basic societal problems. We produce mechanical engineers who can't fix a basic automobile. So the, I think the question is about um, the, what is it that we're actually teaching? And maybe since you look at data, uh, and there is a question for you about data, can you give us some examples? So I'll merge those two questions and turn to you. Um, so some examples. Well, I'll, I'll first start off by saying I think Dean Schwartz made the point this morning that uh, with the explosion of knowledge and how it's being created constantly, that mastery can't be the goal of education anymore. Uh, what we really have to do is support people to learn how to continuously learn and upskill. And now I'll connect it to my current role, which is that's the problem we have at Amazon. Uh, we have 1.6 million employees, I think of them as 1.6 million research subjects, um, but uh, that are trying to, uh, they're cr creating new knowledge all the time and trying to keep upskilled with that knowledge. So the uh, traditional mechanisms of how you continuously upskill and build knowledge that's distributed across multiple people. It's not like there's a single expert and everybody has to just learn at the foot of that expert. That's not how knowledge is constructed anymore. So the old mechanisms don't work. So this is where the data collection uh, becomes really important because you can have uh, people doing essentially, I wouldn't call them experiments because they're not structured in that way, but maybe we could say structured observations. You create a context where people can engage in systematic, structured observation, where every time I try and design something or someone else tries to design something, we can collect the evidence about what worked and didn't work for that learner, learning that thing in that context. And we just keep building up that knowledge base and start looking for patterns that then we can do structured experimentation to test. So that, I think, gets at your uh, question. Yes. And, and John, uh, there was actually a question that went to both of you about lifelong learning and yeah. adult learning. So Well, so I, I think we try to teach problem solving skills. We try to teach skills where students will be able to master, as Candace said, new information, especially in my field, in computer science. Yeah. What you learned 10 years ago is obsolete. It's obsolete. And if we trained you to be the best web programmer you could be today, five years from now, you couldn't learn something new, you wouldn't have a job. You'd be stuck, right? So we need to teach students so that they can master new things. They have some basic skills, they have some basic knowledge, but they can build on that, they can build on that, they can build on that. And they can do it in a way that's fearless, right? Because if they're afraid to go into a new field, they're going to be paralyzed in their careers. We tell our students now, your life is not one career anymore. It's going to be more than one career. You're going to be doing different things, not just different jobs, but different kinds of work over time. And we need to prepare you for that kind of learning. Great. I have a question uh, in the back here. And then, sir, you'll be next. So, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Glenn Fajardo. I teach at the Stanford D School. Uh, my question is a personal reflection question for the panel. Uh, what is one unexpected lesson you learned about learning during the pandemic? Maybe something that you hadn't fully totally considered, something that you hadn't thought about before. Oh, you'd like to take that personal lesson? I, I think large lectures actually online can work better in some strange ways. One of the things we discovered was that students were a lot more willing to ask questions. And sometimes in engineering classes where women are often outnumbered, they were more comfortable in an online setting asking questions and speaking up. Mm -hmm. So there was, a, there was a positive thing about mm -hmm. that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sal, what did you learn? No, I'll, I'll double down on that. Obviously, it's been really hard. You know, I, a, a lot of the shift from physical, we, we took a very passive seat time based system and then we just transplanted that to Zoom and then people were surprised that it was even less engaging uh, for, <laughs> for a lot of folks. Uh, but what, what, what John is referring to is, is, is exactly right, that when it has been done well, it's actually been incredibly powerful 
uh, there's this notion of, yeah, you see all the faces, et cetera. Uh, you know, there's tools that we're starting to use inside of Khan Academy where you can actually see how much different people are speaking, uh, which is good feedback for you know, myself or others. If we're speaking too much or too little, who do you call on? Uh, on schoolhouse.world, we're starting to look at artificial intelligence that can actually look at the transcript as it's happening and help get coach the tutor to say, hey, you haven't called on this person. Here's an interesting example for you to work on. Um, we all saw the use of breakouts, which makes mm -hmm. the activity much more interactive, which is very hard to do in a, in a physical mm -hmm. environment. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think, I think it, it, once again, it's never about technology, not technology. It's all about what's the use case, what's the pedagogy, what's the human interaction. Mm -hmm. And there were some that were, uh, that were strangely better. And, and you, what you, I, I would guess that there's more teachers trying to do physical breakouts now than there were pre-pandemic because they got used to it because of uh, the ability yeah. to do it. Yeah, I would add, you know, in the, like, in the smaller settings where we're working to kind of apply the principles of learning science, doing that on Zoom just kind of emphasized how easy it is to disengage. Someone goes off camera um, and also reinforced <laughs> how important trust and vulnerability and community is to learning. We also discovered students can multitask just as well <laughs> yes. online as they can in the classroom. That they can. Just as well. <laughs> Facebook they is there. <laughs> that they can. Yes, we did. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go I was ahead. just to say yes. we, um, we uh, at Amazon still did a lot of classroom-based uh, training uh, before the pandemic. And one of them was a, a course that everybody at the company was required to take on how to do interviewing. And one of the pieces of that was they would break people into triads to just practice interviewing and then someone observe and give feedback. Of course, the problem with that is you've got kind of someone who giving feedback who doesn't necessarily understand what it is that dyad practice is supposed to support. Mm -hmm. So in moving it to a completely uh, distributed remote learning experience, we had to think about how do we give that practice. And so one of the things we did, obviously because we're Amazon, was uh, create an Alexa skill where, where Alexa became the person being interviewed. So then um, when you were practicing, the learner was asking Alexa a question. Alexa could process the question and answer and then ask and then give another response. And we could collect all of those data and from those data infer what the uh, <laughs> learner was saying. And then we could, uh, we, we got a lot more insight into uh, where students uh, struggle in learning that particular skill and how to give feedback uh, to it. Interesting. So it's another example of the use of the technology allowing us to sort of diagnose and do research in a way we couldn't do before. Yes, yes sir, if you'll, if you'll um, identify yourself, please, yes. Um, Fred Singer, um, and thank you for the comments. You know, we're talking about a theory of change, but there's really this tension that we're not always bringing about, which is on one hand you have the systems approach using technology scale. John, you talked about it, the Google loop every day, you've got to, you, you gather data, you make changes. And then on the other half, there's the craft of teaching. The, the teachers want to control the classroom because they want to be at the center of it. And, and those two are in conflict in, in reality. And how do you think about bridging those two where you get systems and real data every day in the classroom. We really don't have that much data nationally on what goes on in classroom, with also allowing teachers to be teachers, build that learning environment we've talked about all day. So look, interest on how you bridge that, that gap. I'm not owning all the gaps. So all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say uh, you shift the role of the teacher, but not in the way that you're expecting, I'm going to say. Uh, we always talk about the gap between research and practice, and mostly what we mean by that is we researchers know a lot that those practitioners just aren't doing. Um, but the gap is broken in the other direction. There are, we heard a lot of talk today about excellent teachers. Those are people who've built up practices and wisdom that don't find its way back into informing the research. So I make the argument that the research practice gap is broken in both directions. Mm -hmm. And the way you change that is you to engage the teachers as practitioners collaborating with us in building the expertise and knowledge we need to move everything forward. I think if you go to teachers and say, You're, you've been doing it wrong, you need to do it differently, do it this way, that's a losing, a losing, no matter how much evidence you bring, it's a losing argument. And I, 
I, I fully agree. Anne would add our, our dear friends in policy making are a huge piece of the puzzle too, because you know, Dean Schwartz put this incredible framework up this morning uh, around really what we're talking about is ter in terms of whole child development um, and you know, poli like accountability systems just haven't gotten that memo, right? So you know, money flows uh, into areas that are incentivized by policy and accountability. And if test scores in math and literacy are what are named as success for a school, that's gonna be reinforced. And so, um, and I, I'm very optimistic. I think we are moving in a direction around states in particular, in particular embracing a broader definition of success and kind of expanding what we even think of when we think of the diploma. Um, but they are the piece of the puzzle that kind of is going to help us um, kind of move to kind of a systems level of change. Yes, right here. Um, I'm Beth King. Um, I like very much and I agree very much with a point that was made that the pandemic is not the only disruption we're going to be experiencing. And what was mentioned was, you know, armed conflicts, um, natural disasters and so forth. So, so the pandemic is really a wake up call mm -hmm. to the, the fact that there are many uh, instances when uh, schools are, uh, 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 school, schools are, dis are, are, are discontinued or, or disrupted. And uh, maybe not in the US, but certainly in the rest of the world, in many places in the world that suffer from these things. So you also mentioned that then, I think it was uh, Mr. Hennessy who mentioned that we should be prepared for these kinds of disruptions. So what are a few things that, we, that school systems need to do to be prepared for such disruptions so that when those disruptions happen, there's something, you know, the school systems go into gear to, to, to respond. And you mentioned, I think, um, Ms. Tillett, that, that, you know, that the health system does that. So how can the school systems do it? And please feel free to think about not just the university level, but also the uh, before university level. Candice, do you want to start? I, I feel like I've been talking Oh, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. But John? Yeah. So I, I think if some things are crystal clear, connectivity really matters, and I think having that connectivity, we also saw things, um, some of the kids in local school districts didn't have computers at home. So we had to get computers. Then you've got to solve all the supply chain problems, which became even more difficult uh, during pandemic. I think we're going to have to prepare our things. One of the things, even at the university level, we encountered a, a problem which I wouldn't have thought of at the beginning. Namely, some of our lower income students couldn't go home. They had no interconnectivity. They had no place where they could sit quietly in a room and watch a course because there were six people living in a three-room house. And so um, we ended up with about 1,200 of our undergraduates living on campus during the pandemic so that we could support them, they could take classes, they could be engaged, and they could continue their education. They were the ones we were most worried about. We didn't have to worry about the, uh, the child who was at home with two parents who were college educated who would provide the opportunity to engage them. We had to worry about those, the kids who were more at risk in this situation. And I think it was the right thing to do and it, it worked out, but it required a real change in how the university thought about its role. Yeah. I would just say one thing that occurs to me too is uh, the role of the educator at home was highly variable. Uh, I had friends who uh, were teachers and were home with their kids. There were also parents who couldn't speak the language. And so uh, the role of that home educator probably needs to be thought through uh, more fully. Uh, I have a question all the way in the back. here. Yeah, um, my name is Rajan Sheth, and uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about the uh, impact of technology. And uh, John, you were saying about you know how at a place like Google you're able to iterate very quickly. Um, I spent a long time at Google and saw how you can do that. And now I'm in education and see how much harder it is uh, to do that. Um, a couple of questions on that. One is there are there ways to find early indicators of impact? that can let you iterate more quickly. And the second thing is you're talking about engagement and why engagement is so important. 
should we be focusing in on engagement built on strong pedagogical uh, foundations um, as opposed to uh, as opposed to the pedagogical, uh, pedagogical foundations itself? And could that give us quicker impact for technology? John, Brooke? So, uh, you know, building on what Saul said about building up tutoring services, one of the experiments we did during COVID um, was the way we teach our undergraduate programming course, which is the largest course in the university. We teach it with undergraduate tutors that lead small working groups. So there's a big lecture. There's a lecture that has a thousand people in. They go to that lecture. It's really well prepared. It's a great learning opportunity. It's online as well. Uh, but then they work in small groups. So one of the things we asked is, could we export this model for all the kids who were trapped by COVID and were not able to take these courses, a, pr a program called Code in Place? So they did this experiment. They said, can we train 1,000 tutors to be, to be effective? And lo and behold, they got 1,000 people that had basic programming skills. They could pass a course. They could pass a test and train them as tutors for students around the world. And then using Zoom, you know, here you are, here's your little group of eight students, here's your tutor. Um, it worked amazingly well. So I think we can, we can be, when we're forced to create new ways of doing things where we can get data, we can really show this works. Absolutely. And there is a better way to do education. I think data is going to help set us free. It's going to be the cornerstone on which we do education reform as opposed to anecdotal education reform. It has to be driven by data. I'll sure. just add to that. It, 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 we're at an interesting transition point because uh, everyone in, let's call it ed tech or even non ed tech, the, you know, the, the, the things that are, but what's interesting about ed tech is that you have consistent interactions with the students that are for the most part standardized. And then we, we measure the efficacy of these things based on traditional standardized assessments that you know, ask the student like 50 questions once a year. And honestly, the student has no incentive to do well on them in, in many, many cases. And it's really the cart leading the horse. Because if you have a standardized mechanism where kids are able to work on it day in, day out, it's part of their practice, it's part of their learning, you actually have better data than the people who are doing the standardized assessment. You have more rigorous, psychometric, I mean, everything, you have a, a better data. So I think in the next five years, you're going to see that these snapshot assessments that you take once or twice a year, in many cases, high stakes, they're kind of silly. Um, when, you, when you could have day in, day out interactions, potentially hours with a student, uh, that in, in many ways are low stakes because if they're not there yet, they just keep working on it, but it's going to give much more nuance. So uh, you know, to, the, to the Google point, and many people in that tech, and we've been doing it, we've always been able to do A-B tests, which essentially mm -hmm. is a controlled experiment around engagement, around w search engine optimization, all the stuff that you know, Google and other uh, internet folks would do. But what we're really focused on right now is can we build our own internal learning metric that is actually more valid than the things that you get in a snapshot from one paper test you know, once a year. And then if you have that, you can start do a, you can do A-B testing on that, on what's actually leading to, to more learning. Okay. We yeah. also become better teachers this yeah. way because we discover, you know what, all these learners out there didn't understand this core principle. Maybe there's something mm -hmm. wrong with that lecture. Maybe mm -hmm. there's something wrong with the material. And I think it, it can improve teaching. I wish well. somebody had done that for me with geometry. Uh, yes, <laughs> and, uh, I'm, we have. Three questions out there, and so I'm going to ask for brief responses to those. But uh, Candace, you wanted to—I'm sorry, uh, you wanted to say just a word, or are you going to me? Yes, didn't you? Oh, I wanted just to reinforce oh, no, the importance of having data. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, right. Well, your your and, point. And and also also it was data. And also so the yes. importance of being able to interpret, interpret that data. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things people talk about. Mm -hmm. All this exhaust we get from. Uh, technology-mediated environments, and if it's just if it's more noise than signal, it's mm. not that useful. Mm. So there's also the way that this is where design and science come together again, because we can design the learning environments so that they generate data that is actually interpretable and meaningful, and not have to spend so much time trying to try and find the signal in the noise. Okay. We're getting close to the end of our time, so what I'm going to ask is that we take your questions, and then we'll come back to the panel with the questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. My name is Dorothy Gordon, and I would like the panel to comment on the recent passing of the Age Appropriate by Design Act in California. And specifically, you know, it's addressing the fact that we have far more platforms providing education at all levels, 
platforms are collecting data on kids, selling it on to third parties, and nobody understands exactly where the data is going. So I'd like a comment on that. Right. Thank you. Yes. Hi, yes, my name is Shannon Burkibaha with the GSE Alumni Board. My question is, when thinking about how studying, how learning works, and how different learners learn best when using new technologies like big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, how do you sure ensure that knowledge, skills, dispositions, and orientations that aren't necessarily quantifiable or as easily capturable at scale or maybe as reflective of, as, uh, as deep learning, like with the multiple choice test, how do you ensure that they're not uh, lost or deprioritized? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. My name is Ruth Kagia. Uh, Secretary Rice started by saying that we are on the cusp of a major scientific uh, revolution. But listening to all of you, it seems like that revolution lies on the margin of a contradiction. Vicky saying that the sources of innovation and energy is emerging from the margins of society. The question is to what extent are we sufficiently focusing on the margins of society to look for innovation? The computer scientists talking about how what you teach today is going to be relevant five years from now. How do you ensure that what you teach is sufficiently versatile to adapt to changing realities? And then, for me, you know, something that really resonated uh, with me from the lady at the end, which is that human interaction is by nature multisectoral, but education is by definition uh, unisectoral. And that sort of brought back concerns I had about the panel before this one on early childhood development, which is of necessity multisectoral, from, pre from pregnancy right through the first 1,000 days, when it's not purely an education process, but it involves health, it involves the community, and so on. So again, to what extent, as we look at the theory of change, as we look at promoting learning, are we focusing on that multisectorality? So my question is, as we look at the theory of change, as we look at energizing uh, uh, the, the learning potential for kids, it almost seems like we need to look at that inherent tension in learning in order to see the change. And yet all the examples we've been talking about today are normative. They are looking at sort of what we have always known. So how do we manage that contradiction in order to really get to that delta that brings about a real revolution that the Secretary talked about? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so let's go to the first question. Um, this is about the uh, age-appropriate platform, California. John, I'm sure you're familiar with this, given your uh, perspective. Yeah, so California has the strongest uh, data privacy rules in the country, and particularly around children, even stronger. And I think th those are vital. And it's, it, it, the, the key challenge is going to be that ensuring that our systems can, our, our civic systems can monitor and enforce these rules. Because th there are unfortunately bad actors in the world and I think we're gonna have to be on our toes, which means parents need to be better educated too with respect to what their children are using and how they're engaging. Mm -hmm. And do you think that there's su sufficient understanding of that not in California law, but uh, in the platforms themselves. Well, there's not sufficient understanding <laughs> by the user community of the platform, for sure, right? And, um, and that, that's going to be an ongoing educational process. One of the challenges I think the tech sector has had is if I put out all the different bells and whistles you could use to control how data is used, you, you won't even finish filling in the boxes to say which ones you want and which ones you don't want. So we need to find simpler ways to deal with issues of privacy and how people, how information is used, and I think that's going to be critical going forward. Yeah, uh, before, yeah. when I was at Stanford, before I went to Amazon, we were uh, making a big push to define new standards for responsible use of mm -hmm. learner data. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that doesn't just mean privacy. It means how do you, uh, 
how do you maximize the use of the data for scientific discovery and for the benefit of society while minimizing the potential harm to any individual. And then to the second question, and, and Saul, I'm going to go back to you on this one, the question of what is quantifiable. You talked a little bit about the once a year, high stakes test, uh, multiple choice. Uh, how do we think about uh, assessment in uh, perhaps tacking on to what you said earlier? Yeah, what's interesting about where we are now, I mean, the, the question I think could be taken two ways. One is, are we going to get, you know, we, we are already had things like multiple choice exams because those were machine gradable, and so they, it, it helped us do things. Um, and, and you can actually get pretty good stuff from multiple choice data, but I think what's exciting about the world we're in now is, uh, you know, some, some, of, some of both on the artificial intelligence side or leveraging technology to actually get peer-to-peer -peer human interaction can start to standardize assessment of the things that were formerly unmeasurable. So for example, we're uh, uh, doing a, a little bit of a research project that I hope we can actually uh, bring, bring, bring to the world in, in the next six to 12 months, which is at, at Wharton University, uh, uh, Wharton School of Business, I should say, they, they had a, uh, they, they've been doing this for seven years. They have a paper, there's a rubric, the students uh, do the paper, they submit it, and they have their own homebrew system that just, the, the, the professor just grades five of the papers, and then every student there gets five random papers, they stack rank them, the mm -hmm. algorithm mm -hmm. keeps operating, students are graded not just on what their grade on their papers, but how well they grade other students. So it's an interesting iterative algorithm. Um, things like that should be mainstream. And they speak to, you know, going to the earlier question, is how do you get over the teacher inertia, which is a real thing. You have to speak to, wow, they're already spending all night grading papers, et cetera, et cetera. And every teacher who's worked with this type of a system said, wow, not only does this save me grading papers, it actually helps the kids learn to write better because they're able to look at different levels of writing, they're thinking about the rubric, they're able to iterate on it, it can help support mastery learning. That's one of the, 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 the limits is like, hey, how do you get to do something over and over where the, the teacher has to keep grading it? So I, I hope that we can uh, leverage both things like artificial intelligence, probably in conjunction with human peer-to-peer -peer systems mm -hmm. to, to actually mm -hmm. really broaden what we could, um, you know, mm -hmm. there's no standardized assessment today for how creative you are, how funny you are. I think we, we could start getting to okay. some interesting things there. I'm going to use the last question to pose a very brief question to each of you, which is, uh, as the uh, questioner asked about, you know, how do we make sure that this time we don't miss the moment um, for marginalized populations, but in general for science to really transform? If we're sitting here 10 years from now, uh, what is the one thing that you would say to people, do it tomorrow, so that 10 years from now this conversation is different? about education, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm gonna start with you, Brooke. Sure. Um, I think I would say, just ev like every single person in this room and, and online, like just reject this false dichotomy that there's academic rigor and then other parts of how we support children, whether it's relationship, uh, well-being, um, connection, uh, Again, they're integrated in the human being. And if we can uh, reframe education as holistic human development and recognize academic rigor as a piece of it, um, I think we'll, we'll move the system. Saul? Oh, I, um, we should create or uh, you know, collaboratively pre-K through career, competency-based, uh, free or near free, hyper accessible system that anyone can engage in and all of the supports you need to be able to do it and then that collapses the problem to how do we get people to engage and then we should have models for how that engagement can be done in a cost effective and uh, a reasonable way. Yeah. Vicki. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> What's the one thing one that thing you want do. us to okay. do tomorrow so Perfect. that 10 years from now we're not having the same well, conversation? Well, there has been a pedagogical uh, change in the learning paradigm. I mean, that's so important. But to do that, uh, you have to have good data. I mean, Escuela Nueva has been sustained so long because you know, here we always come and, and, and bring statistics and show results. That's crucial, that's crucial for learning. And um, technology can trigger change, but it's not enough. You need a pedagogical change. I mean, when you say all these ideas, we've known these ideas for so many years, and why? Don't education systems change? I, I, I'm going to say something that I know um, Mr. Charles Hughes likes very much is, you know, if you bring a doctor into a health system today, 
you know, that, that from, I mean, you bring a doctor from 100 years ago into hospital today or to the health sector, that doctor is lost because everything has changed. But if you bring, <laughs> if you bring, uh, uh, not, not, if, if you bring a, uh, a teacher um, from 100 years ago, you know, uh, it's totally different. It's totally different. Yeah. So, so I think that's a, that that's a, a learning that paradigm I should be Thank changed. You. Yes. John? That's a good question, Condi. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, a simple observation. There are great schools everywhere. There are great schools in rural areas. There are great schools in inner cities. There are great schools in poor neighborhoods. There are great schools in rich neighborhoods. Why can't we figure out what makes those schools successful and ensure that the best practices are in every single school? You know, the, the great challenge we have in the US is we think all citizens are entitled to certain things and a great education should be part of what every citizen in the United States gets. Yeah. So I guess I would say change the relationship between research and practice, mm -hmm. and uh, think of learning research as a design science. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, uh, since that is your writ, uh, <laughs> Dean Schwartz, mm -hmm. but thank you very much. Will you join me in thanking our panelists for a really great discussion? That was just an amazing panel. Thank you all so much. Um, and uh, now I would like to invite Dean Schwartz up uh, to join me for the finale of our day. Uh, okay, well, thank, thank you, Lisa. Uh, you've done a phenomenal job as MC today. I've been uh, negotiating your contract as a talk show host, <laughs> and I, I think we'll have that in place soon. So I, I just want to let you know how fabulously successful all these speakers were, and they all came here to talk, and it was fabulous. So just sort of a round of applause for them. <laughs> I, I do want to take the moment to say I was right. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, so now we're going to move into another exciting part of the day. I'm going to introduce you to Dorothy Gordon, who you've heard ask several very hard questions. And she's going to announce the winners of this year's Zidane Prize. Uh, so this is almost the culmination. There's one thing after that, which will also be very good. So uh, Dorothy is the head of the judging panel for the Zidane Prize for Education Development. Uh, Dorothy and I share a talent. We know how to pick the best people. <laughs> so she's worked in the field of international development and technology for over 30 years. She is recognized as a leading technology activist and specialist on policy, education, technology, and society in Africa. She is the chair of the UNESCO Information for All program and board member of the UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies and Education. Once you've had a chance to meet her, you will understand why she is such a great leader. Dorothy, thank you for being here. I invite you to the stage to do the honors. Hello again. One of the great privileges or being a Yidan Prize judge is being part of this community. It's been my honor to spend today with education innovators who embody the spirit of the prize. On behalf of all of us at the Yidan Prize Foundation, I would like to warmly thank Mark tessier Levine and Daniel L. Schwartz my comrade in leadership, for your insights, your partnership, and this space to come together. Our deep thanks also go to the panelists,
who sparked so many important discussions. Your work places our focus where it is most needed on solving the most pressing issues in education. To everyone who took part, here or virtually, thank you for bringing energy and ideas into essential talks we hope to continue long after today. And to all those who brought us here, from planning the program to looking after logistics, thank you all for your hard work. Now, we come to one of the great highlights of our year, announcing our 2022 Yidan Prize laureates. To do so, I am very pleased to introduce the chairman of our judging committee, Dr. Koichiro Matsura. Distinguished guests, the Eden Prize was founded to create a better world through education. I would like to thank Dr. Charles Chen Eden, whose vision is the guiding force behind the prize. We recognize our laureates for their commitment to this important goal. The prize champions the most innovative ideas in education and helps scale them so as many people as possible can benefit. Our laureates are therefore crucial to our aim of transforming education worldwide. Awarding a laureate is an honor. It is a privilege to review work that's changing your lives. We are always delighted to receive a diverse range of excellent nominations from every part of the world. This year, we received more than ever from Africa and Asia. So I wish to thank the judging committee for sharing their time and expertise reviewing each nomination. Their intensive discussions are a key part of the robust process for selecting the laureates. I also wish to thank the nominators and nominees and supporters for sharing such impactful and transformative work. I also thank the team and the secretariat for everything they do to support this vital mission. It is my great honor to introduce our 2022 Eden Prize laureates. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Linda Darling Hammond, Professor of Education and Education at Stanford University, President and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, and Professor Johnson Chu, founder of New Education Initiative. Shortly, the heads of our judging panels, Mr. Andreas Schlesher and Ms. Dorothy Gordon, will share more about our laureates' exceptional achievements and their plans for the future. For now, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond and Professor Yon Sin Chu, a very warm welcome to the Eden Prize community. We look forward to working with you. My heartfelt congratulations to Linda Darling Hammond for the 2022 Yidan Prize for Educational Research. Linda is the founding president of the Learning Policy Institute and an emeritus professor of education at Stanford University. With an incredible drive to see every learner reach their full potential, regardless of social background, gender, geography, she has spent her whole life building the kind of research tools and that support policy and practice to create better and fairer education opportunities. Her work reflects Linda's commitment to two broad ideas. First, you know, the design of effective policies and practice 
needs really innovative, needs actionable research. And second, researchers need to really engage with policymakers to create a better world through education. And it's a capacity to unite those two perspectives that have made her research actionable and also established its credibility with both practitioners and policymakers. And you know, having been a teacher herself, Linda really understands the transformational impact that teachers have on learners, but also the need for a transformation of the teaching profession itself. You know, if research evidence is to lead to good educational practice and ultimately for good educational practice to become embedded in educational culture. Linda is the rare researcher who has developed a deep understanding of how different children learn how they can be effectively taught and also how teaching and learning can be supported by effective organizational design, systemic designs, and also policy strategies to make excellent education equitably available. I'm Linda Darling-Hammond, Professor Emeritus at Stanford University and President of the Learning Policy Institute, an organization founded to conduct high-quality research designed to inform policy on behalf of equitable and empowering education for each and every child. I am deeply honored to be the recipient of this year's Eden Prize for Education Research. This prize is in and of itself an important and innovative change agent for leveraging educational improvement around the world. It recognizes and invests in ideas and actions that can improve learning at scale. It connects innovators and educators globally, and it enables researchers and educators to learn from one another. I'm excited to be able to learn with and from the Yidan Prize luminaries and recipients and the many other educators who are part of the community of practice the prize has created. My own research has sought to understand how schools can better support student learning, especially for those most underserved in our society, and then to create the systems that will enable transformations of practice at scale. Throughout my career, I've engaged in research seeking to understand what it takes for diverse learners to learn most effectively and how they can be most successfully taught, how teachers and school leaders can be educated to gain the necessary knowledge and skills, and how schools can be designed to offer the conditions that enable productive teaching and learning. That quest has led me to study classroom schools, school systems, and educator preparation programs throughout the United States and around the world both to understand and share best practices and to develop policies that can ensure that they become commonplace rather than exceptions to the rule. I work with policymakers and with practitioners to use that knowledge to expand educational opportunity. That mission is growing more complex in our rapidly changing world in which our children will need to work with knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet, using technologies that haven't been invented yet, solving major problems that we have not been able to solve. This will demand even more investment in expert teaching because teaching is the profession on which all other professions depend. The world needs great educators to nurture great learners, people who are empowered to be curious, to imagine and tackle enormous problems and to create new realities. This prize will provide critical support for that work by the Learning Policy Institute and its partners in universities and governments to help build and expand systems that develop deeply competent educators who are committed to equity and who can help all students grow into empowered adults equipped to build a better world. I want to thank all of my colleagues, students, educators and research collaborators over many years who have traveled with me on this quest and taught me so much, especially those at Stanford University and at LPI, the committed policymakers who are working hard to change the system we inherited, those who have supported this work with a particular shout out to Susan Sandler and her commitment to build a humane and equitable education system, my family members, Alan, Kia, Elena, Terry, Sean, Valentina, Jared, and Kofi, who are my inspiration and support system, and the Yidan Prize Foundation for making these next steps toward more equitable and empowering education possible.
Thank you. My warmest congratulations to Professor Yong Zin Zhu, 2022 Yidan Prize Laureate for Education Development and founder of the New Education Initiative. He is an inspiring innovator and change maker who has successfully addressed some of the most intractable challenges faced by educators all over the world as they strive for improved equity and inclusiveness. In the two decades since its inception, the NEI has grown from a single school to become an active network involving over 8,000 schools, more than 500,000 teachers, and 8 million children. Many of these are located in remote rural areas. The NEI methodology uses action-oriented research to continually adjust and refine its techniques, bridging the gap between education theory and practice. Its approach encourages peer learning and promotes growth for well being. NEI enables teachers, students, and their families to engage in collaborative learning around reading, writing, and communication. It changes the way students learn and the way teachers approach professional development. The results are tangible. Teachers are more motivated with stronger, more positive identities as educators, and they therefore feel more empowered. Home learning environments are more positive and enabling. NEI methodologies have the potential to influence policymakers and educators around the world. Its approach of uniting teachers, parents, and students to work towards clear learning goals encourages a deepening of education outcomes beyond a focus on teaching to test and exams. Many countries will find examples within China that can yield inspiration for similar environments in their own countries. His success in cultivating leadership qualities and fostering personal growth among teachers, students, and parents within communities will no doubt influence many. Perhaps most importantly, he reminds us of the importance of joy and well being of the individual in learning. Congratulations, Linda. You continue to make us very proud. So uh, I want to congratulate the Yidan Prize Foundation on celebrating these educational luminaries. It's really a wonderful event. It's a legacy, and, and so it's very exciting. So today's been the cake. The announcement of the prize was the icing. Now I'd like to bring the cherry on top. This is one of Stanford's most beloved student choral groups, Talisman. So Talisman, come on out. Stanford Talisman, um, oh, that just turned on. Um, <laughs> we share stories through song. This first song that we have for you is called Taiyang. It is a Taiwanese lullaby sung in Mandarin, and it's sung from the perspective of a mother who is caring for and comforting her children as the sun is setting behind the mountains. Please enjoy Taiyang.
Thank you so much. My name is Gareth. I'm a junior undergrad here. The second song we have for you all is titled Vulekile Amasango. This is a traditional South African song sung in the language of Zulu. It's most commonly sung in times of transition, such as weddings, marriages, or funerals. Some of the lyrics translate to, the gates of heaven are open and we are crossing the River Jordan. Oh, <laughs> 
art is so helpful when there aren't words. And I hope that you could feel the hope, uh, feel all that they were conveying uh, from all the, the different cultures. It really, in such a beautiful way, brings together why we're here. The hope that we have for all of the children to accelerate their learning, to exceed all of our expectations and hopes as they exceed ours. So uh, thank you so much uh, for the speakers, for everyone who participated today, for the audience you brought the questions and brought our game to a new level, and we couldn't be more appreciative. So thank you all very much for the day. Let's go have some wine and dinner. Please join me outside. <laughs>